Okay. Biochemistry, molecular, chromatin structure. Uh, DNA exists in the condensed chromatin form to fit into the nucleus. Oh, see. DNA loops twice around a histone octomer to form a nucleosome. Beats on a string. H1, this is the important one. Uh, H1 binds to the nucleosome and to linker DNA, thereby stabilizing the chromatin fiber. DNA has a negative charge from phosphate groups. Histones are large and have positive charge from lysine and arginine. This is not that important. The important thing is that H1 binds to the nucleosome and to the linker DNA. They ask about that. Uh, they might ask about uh, there's something that's binding the structure together and they'll ask what it can be. So that's what it is. In mitosis, DNA condenses to form chromosome. DNA and histone synthesis occur during S phase. Uh, S, is the, S is known for the synthesis. So that's pretty easy. Mitochondria have their own DNA, which is circular and does not utilize histones. Uh, this is pretty important as well. Mitochondria have their own DNA, which is circular and does not utilize histones. Uh, Heterochromatin condensed appears darker on electron microscope labeled H in A. So that would be your condensed form. Uh, new is the nucleolus. Uh, sterically inaccessible, thus transcriptionally inactive. Increased methylation and decreased acetylation. Uh, methylation is just, I believe uh, it makes the DNA inactive. Uh, okay, heterochromatin, highly condensed. So H. Uh, they do ask this, uh, they'll give you this image and they'll ask about it, uh, where each thing is. Uh, I think last time they asked something in electron microscope was about where the mitochondria is. Mitochondria are outside as these things, which look like a thumbprint. Right there. Uh, heterochromatin, uh, highly condensed, bar body, inactive X chromosome may be visible on the periphery of the nucleus. They do ask about bar body as well. So that would be this thing right here, I guess. Uh, Euchromatin, less condensed, appears lighter on electron microscope labeled E in A. Uh, transcriptionally active, sterically accessible, U equals true, truly transcribed. Uh, Euchromatin is expressed. So there you go. So euchromatin is uh, what's active, heterochromatin is what's uh, inactive. DNA methylation. Changes the expression of a DNA segment without changing the sequence. Involved with aging, carcinogenesis, genomic imprinting, transposable element repression, and X chromosome inactivation. Lionization. Okay. DNA is methylated in imprinting. Uh, so imprinting is also uh, one of those things where uh, it gets inactivated. Uh, methylation within gene promoter, CPG islands. It's on page 397, I think. Okay. Uh, methylation makes DNA mute. Okay. There you go. So inactive, same thing. Uh, dysregulated DNA methylation is implicated in fragile X syndrome. All of this stuff, it seems like a lot, but you will, uh, when you read about individual content about it, uh, you'll revisit this there. Like you'll see this in, I think, uh, GIT cancers, it will come there. That's where it's important, it's not important here. Histone methylation usually causes reversible transcriptional suppression, but can also cause activation depending on location of methyl groups. Histone methylation mostly makes DNA mute, M for mute. 
lysine and arginine residues of histones can be methylated. Uh, histone acetylation. Removal of histone's positive charge leads to relaxed DNA coiling, which increases transcription. Deacetylation decreases transcription. Okay. Thyroid hormone receptors alter thyroid hormone synthesis by acetylation. Histone acetylation makes DNA active. A for active. Histone deacetylation, removal of acetyl group, tightens the DNA coiling, so it decreases transcription because there was no room to uh, fit the polymerases if it's really tight. That's why you have uh, topoisomerase to split the two. I don't know where it is. Anyways, we'll do that when it comes. Histone deacetylation may be responsible for the altered gene expression in Huntington disease. Uh, that may be asked. Uh, they asked what the error, what the error is in a Huntington disease that occurs. So it would be histone deacetylation, I guess, if there's an option for that. Uh, nucleotides. Nucleosides equal base plus deoxyribose, uh, which is a sugar. Nucleotide, you have phosphate added to it. So base deoxyribose, but also phosphate uh, linked by three prime to five prime phosphodiesterase bond. Okay, so five prime end of incoming nucleotide bears the triphosphate energy source for the bond. Alpha phosphate is the target of three prime hydroxyl attack. Now this thing, um, it's, uh, they ask this a lot on UWorld, but it's not really asked that much on steps. Uh, but you should know the fact that when something is being transcribed, it's from goes from five prime to three prime. Uh, so three prime would attach to the five prime when it's making a chain. Uh, purine AG is two rings. Pyri, py, uh, primidines are is one ring. Okay. Uh, Easy way to remember is pure as gold and cut the pie. Uh, thymine has a methyl group. So that's UT. So for uridine uh, in RNA, methylation of that will make thymine. Demination uh, reaction, cytosine to uracil, adenine to hypoxanthine, guanine to xanthine, and this thing, uh, we're going to go over it again uh, in the next few pages. 5-methyl cytosine goes to thymine. CG bond, 3H bonds, stronger than AT bonds, 2H bonds. Uh, increase in CG content uh, goes to increase melting temperature of DNA. CG bonds are like crazy glue. They're the stronger bonds than AT. Uh, cell found in RNA, thymine and DNA. Methylation cell makes thymine, there you go. Uh, amino acids necessary for purine synthesis, cats per until they gag. Uh, if this helps you, do it, uh, but this is important. Uh, purine synthesis requires glycine, aspartate, and glutamine. Glutamine is the most important one. Uh, aspartic acid and glutamic acid are both uh, acidophils. Uh, and we give that to reduce acidosis, uh, metabolic acidosis, uh, uh, glutamic acid. Because, why? Uh, let me just do this. Purine, purine. Yeah, let's see. Like... 
so in glutamic acid why we use that is because uh, through this uh, glutamate uses uh, is used to make ammonia and ammonia then gets carried over same thing over here we make ammonia with glutamate glutamate uh, and that's why we give glutamate and not aspartate to bring ammonia into the urea cycle and make it soluble to NH4 and then uh, it gets secreted outward so that's how you reduce acidosis so that's why glutamate is uh, important but uh, for purine synthesis just know this that is glycine aspartate and glutamate uh, purine the structures they never test us on this so i'm not going to go over that uh, for nucleoside I uh, just know that nucleoside doesn't have phosphate group, nucleotide does. Uh, it's made up of nitrogenous bases, deoxy sugar, and phosphate, the nucleotide, and nucleoside is the yellow one. That's what the structure would look like. Uh, de novo primidine. Uh, I have one for this. Let me put I go over these for myself because uh, I did make notes on these, so it's just a way I refresh the memory. Okay, so we'll go over this and then we'll go reading into it. Uh, so pyramid base production, how it occurs, it requires aspartate. Uh, glutamine plus uh, carbon dioxide will make carbamyl phosphate in presence of 2 ATP and carbamyl phosphate synthase 2. This thing uh, is important because you will see that in this as well. You recycle right here. Uh oh, this thing showed up. Hold on. Okay. So the carbon, this is the urea cycle. And the urea cycle, uh, it, it's only important for two things. One, it takes out the urea, obviously. It has arginase, uh, arginine and that stuff. And the other thing is because uh, it has carbon monophosphate, uh, synthase one right here. This is uh, rate limiting for this here. And carbon monophosphatase two is rate limiting for primitive base production. Uh, uh, for purine, it's this one, uh, PRPP. Amino transferase, it's given here, so you don't have to worry about it. Somewhere here, probably. Uh, so, if you have a uh, deficiency of ornithine transcarbamylase, what you're going to have is buildup of ammonium or ammonia and oritic acid. Why? Because this uh, carbamyl phosphate right here will go over here. And though, since this is built up, you'll have a lot more carbamyl phosphate over here to make more oritic acid. That's why you have oritic acid in axis. If you have ornithine carbamyl trans, uh, sorry, ornithine transcarbamylase deficiency. Okay. Uh, let's keep this, okay. So then you have or oritic acid uh, in the presence of, oh, uh, aspartate. With uh, oritic acid, it goes to UMP. Uh, UMP is something. <laughs> uh, it goes to UDP. Uh, UDP goes to DUDP, which goes to DUMP to DTMP. This thing is a whole thing by itself as well. Okay. For purine, you have PRPP, uh, phosphor for ribozyl pyrophosphate synthase. Uh, it makes PRPP. It goes to IMP, uh, which gets converted to AMP and GMP. 
what do I have added here? Okay, so I have a lot in my notes though. Okay, let's read this now. So de novo primidine and purine synthesis, various immunosuppressive, antineoplastic and antibiotic drugs function by interfering with nucleotide synthesis. Nucleotide, sorry. The various immunosuppressive, antineoplastic and antibiotic drugs function by interfering with nucleotide synthesis. The most uh, common one is methotrexate right here that we use. Um, primidine synthesis. Uh, Liflunomide inhibits dihydroortate dehydrogenase. So that's right here. It inhibits dihydroortate dehydrogenase. Then we have 5-fluorouracil or 5-FU and it's prodrug. Capicitabin. Uh, forms 5-F-DUMP, which inhibits thymidylate synthase, which decreases DM DTMP, okay? Right here, uh, it goes from DUMP to DTMP, uh, and 5-F-U, uh, U-World does test you on this a lot, uh, not only for uh, biochem, but also in hemat and it's neoplastic drugs so you would be better off just memorizing this whole chart it's not that hard it's pretty easy if you just understand how it works uh d is just deoxy so that's why uh when it gets reduced it gets reduced into deoxy udp and ump and tmp uh, purine synthesis. Uh, this is easier. It's only like three things in there. Uh, six mercaptopurine, uh, six MP, and its prodrug azathioprine. It inhibits de novo purine synthesis. Azathioprine is metabolized via purine degradation pathway and can lead to immunosuppression via uh, when administered with xanthine oxidase inhibitor. Okay. Uh, we'll go over that as well, uh, but again, and it's pro-drug azathioprine. So azathioprine and 6-MP, they both inhibit de novo uh, purine synthesis. That just means inside uh, this. Uh, azathioprine is metabolized via purine degradation pathway and can lead to immunosuppression when administered with xanthine oxidase inhibitor. So when it's given along with this. Mycophenolate and ribavirine inhibit inosine monophosphate dehydroxyl, uh, dehydrogenase. So right there, ribavirine and this. On this and this, both. Both sides. Uh, purine and primidine synthesis. Hydroxyurea inhibits ribonucleotide reductase. Right there. Uh, methotrexate, uh, trimethorphine, and pyrimethamine inhibit dihydrofolate reductase, decrease deoxythymidine monophosphate DTMP in humans, methotrexate, bacteria, trimethorphine, uh, and protozoa for, we use uh, pyrimethamine for protozoa. So for bacteria, use trimethorphine. Uh, for humans, we use, uh, use methotrexate. For our protozoa use pyrimethamine, but they all do the same thing. They inhibit dihydrofolic reductase. Okay, I, let me check something. I think it's this one. Yeah, this one right here. So this is where you see this. This is a U world uh, note. Uh, we'll go over this and when we do. Uh, B12 and B6, I think, or even folate cycle. I don't know if the book has in the human cycle, but we'll see then. 
Okay. Uh, so that's carbamyl phosphate synthase one is found in mitochondria. That's important. Uh, urea cycle found in liver and kidney cell. Same thing with this uh, urea cycle. This part, uh, carbon phosphate, is in mitochondrial matrix. So if you memorize that, that's also a good way to remember it. Uh, mitochondria, urea cycle found in liver and kidney cells, CPS1. So it's found in liver and kidney cells. CPS2, cytosol, is found in cytosol. So that's the major difference. This is found in cytosol. Uh, pyrimidine synthesis, it's found in there. It's used for that. Uh, found, and it's found in most cells. Perfect. Uh, pure and salvage deficiencies. Uh, we, the deficiencies that we're going to go over are uh, adenosine deaminase uh, deficiency and lynch uh, Nehan syndrome. Lynch Nehan syndrome. This is the important one. For this one, uh, even though uh, it is autosomal recessive, hold on. So there are two reasons this happens. I don't remember, I'm skipping on it right now, but uh, the most important one is, I think it was the other one. Let me check that real quick. Okay, right here. Several types of including defective, uh, this, this. Most common is X-linked recessive. That's the most common one. They ask about this one. They don't ask about autosomal recessive. That's the one we're going over right now. Okay. Oops. Oh no, I'm sorry for that. Okay, we're back. Now, pure and salvage deficiencies. Uh, ribose five phosphate, pure PP synthase. Uh, okay, and we have two nucleic acids. We have GMP and AMP. Uh, these are the nucleotides. Their nucleosides are guanosine and adenosine and inosine. Uh, free bases that they make is guanine, uh, adenine, and here inosine goes to hypoxanthine directly. Uh, eventually everything gets turned into uh, xanthine, like it was stated previously. Uh, from there with uh, xanthine oxidase, it goes to uric acid. With uric acid, it goes to alatoin. So how does that happen? Uh, so IMP can uh, go either into AMP or GMP. So that's what's happening. It goes to AMP and GMP. GMP goes to guanosine, uh, guanosine to guanine. From here, with PRPP, that was phosphoribosyl pyrophosphate synthase, uh, it, go, it can either go back or uh, in the absence of this, it will go and become xanthine. Similarly, AMP will become adenosine. Adenosine uh, with ADA, which is adenosine deaminase, it becomes inosine. Uh, inosine becomes hypoxanthine. Okay. Uh, if, okay, so if we have adenine, it actually, uh, I was wrong. AMP doesn't go to adenine. Adenine goes to AMP. Uh, the arrows here go downwards, arrow here goes upwards. So in the presence APRT, which is adenine phosphoribosyl transferase, which is convenient. Uh, in the presence of PRPP will become EMP. So EMP doesn't make adenine, but adenine does become EMP. Uh, okay, so now the important one are 
HGPRT and ADA. So when you don't have these or deficiency of these, you have uh, Lish Nihan syndrome and endosine deaminase deficiency or which can cause skid or because of skid, you would have, it would block this, vice versa. Okay, so hypoxanthine, uh, xanthine, exo. Uh, xanthine oxidase is being inhibited by allopurinol and fibrosostat. Uh, the ADA is inhibited by cladribine and pentostatin. Uh, you should know these drugs, uh, cladribine and pentostatin. Uh, deficiency of this is lesion, yeah, so that's easy. That's the one with uh, where they self-mutilate, they eat their uh, fingers or whatever, flash eating syndrome kind of thing. Uh, uric acid, uric oxidase, uh, raspberry case. Uh, this is important as well. Uh, we give this to make uric acid into allantoin. Uh, okay, so skid is uh, severe combined immune deficiency, autosomal recessive inheritance, but they asked about uh, excellent. Uh, adenosine deaminase deficiency, ADA, is required for degradation of adenosine and deoxyadenosine. Decrease ADA will lead to increase in DATP, deoxy DATP, which leads to decreased ribonucleotide reductase activity, which leads to decreased DNA precursor in cells, which decreases lymphocytes. So if you don't remember the whole thing, just remember that when you don't have this, you have decreased lymphocytes. I don't think I've come across anything in regards to the mechanism of how this happens, but they do ask about the drugs. One of the major causes of autosomal recessive is skid. Okay. Sorry. Uh, Lish Nihan syndrome. Uh, defective purine salvage due to absent AGPRT, which converts hypoxanthine to IMP and guanine to GMP. We already saw that right here. Uh, guanine to GMP and hypoxanthine to IMP. Compensatory increase in purine synthesis uh, increases increase in pure PP amidotransferase activity will lead to excess uric acid production. Uh, this is X-link recessive. Findings are uh, so they don't really ask about any of this. This is what you're going to see in the question stem. Uh, intellectual disability, uh, self-mutilation, aggression, hyperuricemia, uh, red and orange sand, uh, sodium urate crystals in diaper, gout, dystonia, macrocytosis. If they give you self-mutilation, that's a buzzword. Uh, but if they give you that there's a uh, red orange sand in the diaper. Uh, that's also a buzzword for babies. Uh, sometimes they just give you hyperuricemia, uh, aggression, and maybe gout symptoms. Uh, but they do test this a lot. Uh, AGPRT. Uh, this is convenient as well. Hyperuricemia, G for gout, P for pissed off, aggression, self-mutilation. R is for red, orange crystals and urine. T is for tense muscles and dystonia. Treatment is allopurinol and fibrocystat. Uh, right there. So when you do this, it doesn't make any more your acid or allantoin. It just stops it right here. Okay. Uh, genetic code features unambiguous. Each codon specifies only one amino acid, uh, degenerate uh, redundant. Uh, most amino acids are coded by multiple codon. Uh, wobble, this is important, wobble. Uh, codons that differ in the third 
position may code for the same tRNA amino acid. Specific base pairing is usually required only in the full uh, in the first two nucleotide positions of mRNA codon. Exception are exceptions are methionine, uh, which is uh, the start codon AUG, and tryptophan UGG, encoded by only one codon. So besides these two, uh, everything else follows wobble. Uh, phenomenon. Uh, basically, they'll ask, uh, they'll give you that there is a amino acid that was coded by something, but then there was change in the codon, uh, but then it was still making the same amino acid. So what would the reason be? The reason is the change happened in the third position of the code. Uh, wobble would be the answer. Uh, commonly, commonless, non-overlapping. Read from a fixed starting point as a continuous sequence of bases. Uh, exceptions are some viruses. Universal. Genetic code is conserved throughout evol evolution, except in humans, uh, like mitochondria. DNA replication occurs in five prime to three prime direction synthesis is in continuous and discontinuous which is okazaki fragment fashion semi-conservative okazaki fragments are just that when it's making it uh as it's making hold on okay i'll just talk about it at the end so it's clear uh, in continuous and discontinuous Okazaki fragment fashion, semiconductor are more complex in eukaryotes than in prokaryotes, but shares analogous enzymes. Enzymes they share, but it's more complex in eukaryotes. Origin of replication, particular consensus uh, sequence in genome where DNA replication begins, maybe single prokaryotes or multiple for eukaryotes. So there is a question where they ask, uh, even though the replication sequence started at the same time for eukaryotes and bacteria, they both finished at the same time, even though for eukaryotes, uh, it was bigger and more complex. So how did this happen? It's because uh, the replication for eukaryotes happen at, happens at multiple sites. That's why they achieve the same amount in the same time, uh, more amount in the same time because of that. Uh, AT-rich sequences such as Tata box regions are found in promoters and origins of replication. Uh, this is also important. You will test us on this a lot. AT rich sequences such as Tata box regions are found in promoters and origin of replication. Replication fork, Y shaped region along DNA. So it's this thing. Yeah. So that would be the replication fork right here. Uh, Y-shaped region along DNA template where leading and uh, lagging strands are synthesized. Oh. oh, okay. We're going to end the call in 10 minutes. Uh, let's finish this page and then we'll take the break. Okay, Tata box, uh, replication fork, it's right there. Uh, okay, so leading strand is going from here. Okay, so origin of replication is right here. So in leading strand, it's going from five prime to three prime. Right, five prime to three prime, yeah, okay. Okay, now it's clear. So the five prime to three prime on the RNA, uh, on the DNA, uh, and 
the replication happens, like I said, uh, three prime goes on the five prime, it attaches there, and then it starts. But as the polymerase moves from uh, right to left, it can't continuously make because then it's going to come across something that's already been made. So that's why it makes it in fragments. And these fragments are called Okazaki fragments. However, when it's making it from three prime to five prime, the five prime can continuously go and without making any fragments. So that's why it's called the leading fragment. The lagging fragment is it keeps lagging behind. So that's what this is showing. It goes from fragment to fragment to fragment. But if it's going from, so that's what it is, okay. Uh, you can look over it uh, during the break, so it makes more sense. Helicase uh, unwinds DNA template at replication fork. Helicase halves the DNA, deficient in Bloom syndrome. So that one is the helicase right here. Okay, it unwinds the two. Uh, single stranded binding protein prevents strands from re annealing or degrading degradation by nucleases dna topoisomerases creates a single okay uh, we were at missense mutation results in that is that right here results in changed amino acid called conservative if new amino acid has similar chemical structure so the amino acid is changed but if the chemical structure is same then it's called co uh, conservative uh, mutation. Examples are sickle cell disease for missense mutation. Example is sickle cell disease, substitution of glutamic acid with valine. Uh, this is important. Uh, it will, will come across it later as well. But this is in sickle cell disease, you get missense mutation. That's the important thing. Nonsense mutation is it results in early stop codon. UGA, UAA, and UAG usually generates non-functional protein. Stop the nonsense. So nonsense is just stop codons. So that's these are important. These are the stop codons. UGA, UAA, and UAG. So UA and UA, you have that here. Uh, for these are was changed, and then you have UGA. So for this, there was a mnemonic for these as well. You are away, you are gone, you go away. Yeah. You go away, you are away, you are gone. Other mutations are frame shift mutation and splice mutation. Frame shift mutation uh, is when deletion or insertion of any number of nucleotides not divisible by three, misreading or all nucleotides downstream. Protein may be shorter or longer and its function may be disrupted or altered. For example, Duchenne muscular dystrophy or Tay-Sachs disease. These ones have frame shift mutation. These two are the most important ones that you need to know. In these, uh, you get frame shift mutation. Uh, so we have an example here that I didn't go over. Uh, so coding DNA are these, uh, mRNA codon are these, and amino acids are these. Okay, so for silent, it was, it's still making uh, GLU, blue, atomic acid, I guess. Uh, for missense was when you get a different one. So it was making GTG, uh, but now it's making GUG, which is valine. It's not making glutamic anymore. Then you have nonsense, it just stops. It's not even uh, amino acid, it just stops. Oh yeah, you will get a question. They ask, uh, uh, a, they'll give you a sequence and then they'll ask you what was the first sequence they'll give you a sequence like this with a bunch of letters but you need to remember that AUG is methionine so that is the start codon so methionine is always going to be the first one that you look out for
okay then comes the frame shift and frame shift uh this is not divisible by three uh so it could have an insertion you have a nucleotide here you have a uh g going out over here deletion so for both it's making aspartate now instead of glutamic okay so that's what frame shift is uh, splice site mutation so what happens when you just have three uh, codons coming in mutation like a mutation that has a amino acid added to the sequence I think that's also a thing but I guess it's just called insertion mutation then splice side mutation uh, retain intron in mRNA uh, leads to protein with impaired or altered function it's retain intron okay so it's reading what it's not supposed to as well in the mRNA uh, normally introns are introns or uh, they leave uh, you don't have those in mRNAs so if you have intron in the mRNA and it's being read then it's called splice site mutation because it's not been spliced it's supposed to be spliced out by now uh, so it leads to protein with impaired or altered function because the whole chain is disturbed now examples are rare cause of cancer dementia epilepsy some types of beta thalassemia Gaucher's disease or Marfan syndrome uh, these are all splice site this is not really tested on that much what is tested on is frame shift silent missense uh, nonsense is not really tested on because it's the easiest uh, lec operon uh, this thing okay okay so this thing is usually gonna have uh, it's gonna be with E. coli uh, that's the only time they're gonna bring this up or the E. coli is gonna be involved so it's gonna have a pink colony it's gonna have nitric oxide or nitrates in the culture or it's being spewed out uh, so anything like that they tell you any of these these are signs that it's E. coli so then uh, and if they start they start talking about glucose or and stuff or lactose you know they're talking about like operon so this is the phenomenon right here classic example of genetic response to an environmental change and glucose is the preferred metabolic substrate in E. coli but when glucose is absent and lactose is available the lec operon is activated to switch to lactose metabolism mechanism of shift let's read that again classic example of genetic response to an environmental change uh, this just happens to a due to an environmental change uh, glucose is the preferred metabolic substrate in e coli so e coli uses glucose uh, so but what happens when there is no glucose but when glucose is absent and lactose is available then lecoprone kicks in and is activated to switch to glucose uh, sorry lactose metabolism uh, so what is the mechanism of this shift you have low glucose what happens is uh, there will be increase in adenylate cyclase activity that's this thing right here so AT will be converted to uh, CAMP when adenylate cyclase is increased because normally it's being inactivated by glucose but you have no glucose then this is not being deactivated anymore or inhibited so now it's going to make more CMP when you have more CMP it's going to stimulate the capsite capsite uh, what is cap so you have increased and like adenylate cyclase activity which increases generation of CMP from ATP which leads to activation of catabolite activator protein which increases transcription so this will attach binds to the capsite induces transcription if this does not happen this whole lac operon does not happen 
So you need this to happen before anything else happens. So this will attach to the cap site. When this attaches, you get the uh, like operon inhibitor or repressor protein. It leaves it and then it attaches to uh, inducers like right here. So it doesn't repress anymore. Uh, this, if it binds to the operator side, if the transcription stops. That's what this is. So repressor protein leaves this when you have uh, allolactose or inducers and attaches and, you know, stops it from bothering them. When you have high lactose, it unbinds, uh, it leads to unbind uh, repressor protein from repressor operator site. So this increases transcription. So both of these reasons are why you have increase in transcription. Okay, so you have cap site, you have promoter, you have operator, you have lag Z, lag Y, lag A. There is, I had a note on this somewhere. Have it here. Nope. Okay. I guess this is all then. Uh, for gene, so you have like inhibitor site, uh, the cap site, the promoter site, the operator site, and then you have like Z, Y, and A. <coughs> when you come across this in your world, they have a really good. A diagram for this uh, it actually makes a better much better sense than that but uh, at the start of leg Z you have AUG methionine or the start codon uh, similarly for leg Y and leg A so now what happens when you have low glucose and lactose is available you have like operon uh, the cap site will go into the um, promoter site, uh, it will make RNA polymerase and it's gonna do the transcription. Leg genes are strongly expressed in this. What happens when you have high glucose and lactose is not available? Well, the repressor gene is gonna stop, uh, go on operator and stop the whole transcription. So it's gonna prevent the transcription from happening. Uh, that's the cap site, that's the promoter site, and that's the thing. So leg gene is not expressed here. When you have low glucose, but lactose is unavailable. Well, you don't have lactose to bind to a repressor gene here, right? So even though you have low glucose, it will leave this, but it's not gonna attach to this. So it's gonna go attach to operator site because that's what it does. It binds to operator site and blocks the transcription. So lag gene is not expressed here either. What happens when you have high glucose and lactose is available? Well, in this case, uh, there will always be some protein somewhere doing this, transcribing this, but it's going to be very low basal expression. So other than that, since this does not happen, this won't be attaching to the cap site. So transcription won't happen normally, but here it says it's very low. Okay, functional organization of eukaryotic gene. Enhancer, silencer gene is right here, uh, promoter gene, uh, five prime UTR, open reading frame, three prime UTR and silencer. Uh, okay, so first the DNA coding strand uh, does transcription, uh, then you get pre-mRNA, then you get the splicing of X, uh, introns. <coughs> And then you, after the introns are gone, you get mature mRNA. Uh, then you have uh, translation into proteins. Uh, DNA, uh, so DNA strand will have everything. It'll have the enhancer silencer region. You'll have cat box, the tata box. Uh, transcription starts over here. The exons, the introns. Uh, so in DNA, the introns starts with GT, 
and it ends with AG. It's going to be everywhere. Whereas in RNA, uh, RNA uh, GU and AG, GU and AG, because it's when butene is methylated, you get T and DNA, right? Uh, exons, and at the end, you have uh, AAT, AAAA. That's the telomerase, I guess, region. And the silencer, and this is the prime, three prime. Uh, in mRNA, you have exon introns. That's it. You don't have the promoter region. You don't have the silencer region. When it's mature, you don't have introns either. It's just the uh, exons. <coughs> Voice is getting raspier, I think. Okay, so you have the start code on here, the stop code on here, and the poly A tail is being added here. Okay, so regulation of gene expression, promoter, site where RNA polymerase 2 and multiple other transcription factors bind to DNA upstream from gene locus, AT rich upstream. So where the it's just saying it's anywhere, it can happen anywhere, it doesn't have to be here but anywhere on the promoter. So site where RNA polymerase two and multiple other transcription factors bind to DNA upstream from gene locus, AT rich upstream sequence with Tata and cat boxes, which differ between eukaryotes and prokaryotes. So as long as they have uh, adenine and thymidine rich sequence, that's where it's gonna attach. So they might ask you where are where would a promoter attach to? And then you need to know that it's, you're gonna look out for Tata and cat box, but that's not it. It's gonna be anything that has AT reach sequence. Promoter mutation commonly results in dramatic decrease in level of gene transcription. Mutation. So when you have a mutation in promoter, something that promotes something like a promoter for a fight in UFC, you don't have that, then it's not gonna be promoted as much. So similarly, when you have a mutation in promoter, it results in decreased level of gene transcription. Enhancer, a DNA locus, where regulatory proteins activators bind, uh, increasing expression of gene of this same chromosome. Enhancers and silencers may be located close to, far from, or even within in an intron, the gene whose expression they regulate. So there will come a question about zinc fingers. Uh, that's what this thing is right here. Uh, the zinc finger domains are found on DNA and these things go directly and attaches directly to the DNA. It's only these things. Everything else attaches to the membrane or nuclear membrane or the cell membrane, or it attaches to proteins in the side as well. But these ones are the ones that go directly through the cell membrane, through the nuclear membrane, into the DNA, and attaches somewhere on the strand. Those are progesterone or estrogen or steroids, uh, like cortisol, thyroid hormone, fat soluble vitamins, and aldosterone. So this is some, they usually ask about thyroid. This does have, get asked. So uh, it is what enhancers are. That's what the, that is. Uh, silencer DNA locus where regulatory proteins and repressor binds decreasing expression of a gene on the same chromosome. So these are DNA locus where regulatory proteins they repress or decrease the expression of gene on the same chromosome. It's the same thing. Something might enhance the gene, something might silence the gene or decrease the expression. Epigenetics. Uh, are changes made to gene expression heritable mitotically meotically meotically oh, that's a funny word 
without a change in underlying DNA sequence. Primary mechanism of epigenetic change include DNA methylation, histone modification, and non-coding RNA. This feels like this is the first time I'm reading this. I don't think it's in the previous books. Yeah, it's not in my 2020. Oh, 2021, okay. So it's not, this thing is not in 2021. So I guess there's a new concept they're testing. Epigenetics. These are changes made to gene expression, heritable, uh, mitotically or meiotically, uh, without a change in underlying DNA sequence. I'm having a hard time grasping this, hold on. Okay, got it. So it's something, the sequence has not been changed, but the expression has been changed the way it shows. Okay, so that's called epigenetics. Primary mechanisms of epigenetic change include DNA methylation, histone modification, and non-coding RNA. So primary mechanisms of these changes are either methylation happens or histone modification, the H1. Because if H1 linker, histone does not attach the chain uh, changes at the protein and non-coding RNA. Okay. Uh, RNA processing, that's eukaryotes. You have the capsize, you have coding here, and you have the poly A tail and hydroxyl group. Initial transcript is called heterogeneous nuclear RNA. Heterogeneous RNA is then modified and becomes mRNA. The following processes occur in the nucleus. So these are the things that will happen inside the nucleus before it leaves the nucleus. So right here. Okay, so right here. So initially it's called heterogeneous or HNRNA. It's then modified and becomes mRNA. Okay, so the following process occurs in the nucleus. Capping of 5' prime and a cap is added. Uh, addition of 7 methyl guanosine gap, cap, cap co transcriptional poly adenylation of 3A poly A tail or uh, 200 A's, or which is called poly A tail. Post transcriptional. This is important that this happens post transcription. So after transcription has occurred, they do ask this, when does this happen? Whereas the cap happens uh, while the transcription is happening. That happens right here. So by the time it reaches pre-mRNA though, or when that happens, you have both of those. Uh, splicing out of introns. This happens post-transcriptional as well. So that's after transcription. Right here, splicing. Okay. So I guess uh, it's in the nucleus until it reaches number three. Because uh, the mature mRNA is the one that leaves the nucleus. Okay, got it. Uh, cap tailed and splice transcript is called mRNA. There you go. mRNA is transferred out of nucleus to be translated in cytosol. So translated is when it uh, makes protein. Translation protein. mRNA quality control occurs at cytoplasmic processing bodies or P bodies. Uh, these are important, which contain exonucleases, decapping enzymes, and microRNAs. It's also a storage system as well, the P-bodies. It keeps, uh, it keeps uh, mRNAs or for future needs, which contains exonucleases, decapping enzymes, and microRNAs. mRNAs may be degraded or stored in P-bodies. There you go, mRNA may be degraded or stored in P-bodies for future translation. 
poly polymerase does not require a template. AAUAAA is equal to poly annihilation signal. So if you have this, that's what it is. Mutation in this poly annihilation, uh, poly annihilation signal will lead to early degradation prior to translation. So even before it, uh, this occurs, it's going to start degrading if you don't have poly retail. Okay, uh, RNA polymerases uh, in eukaryotes. Uh, RNA polymerase one makes our RNA the most common rampant type, presents only in nucleolus. RNA polymerase two, okay, so one is the most common, so rampant, our RNA, which presents only in nucleolus. Oh, oh 10 minutes left. Wow. How many pages do we get to more? Uh, okay, uh, RNA polymerase two makes mRNA, uh, which is massive. MicroRNA, which is miRNA, and small nuclear RNA or snRNA. RNA polymerase three makes five sRNA, rRNA, uh, tRNA, tiny. No proofreading function, but can initiate chains. RNA polymerase 2 opens DNA at promoter sites. Okay, so RNA polymerase 2 opens DNA at promoter site. There you go. Uh, the functions of these are not as important as uh, what RNA polymerase 1 does and what 3 does. Uh, you should know that tRNA is made by polymerase 3 and rRNA is made by 1. Everything else is made by 2. Uh, sorry, RNA is made by 1 and 3. But everything else like mRNA or miRNA or snRNA is made by 2. No proofreading function but can initiate chains. Po RNA polymerase 2 opens DNA at promoter site. 1, 2, and 3 are numbered in the same order that their products are used in protein synthesis. rRNA, mRNA, then tRNA. Uh, alpha amenitine found in amenita uh, phalloids death cap mushrooms inhibit RNA polymerase 2. Uh, this was tested on a long time ago. I don't think it's being tested on anymore. Causes dysentery and severe hepatotoxicity if ingested. Just remember alpha amenitine, stay away from it. Why? Because it's hepatotoxic. It stops RNA polymerase 2. Dekinomycin inhibits RNA polymerase in both prokaryotes and eukaryotes. Dekinomycin inhibits RNA polymerase in both prokaryotes and eukaryotes. Prokaryotes, one RNA polymerase, multi subunit complex, makes all three kinds of RNA. Uh, rifamycin, rifampin, uh, rifabutin inhibit DNA dependent RNA polymerase than prokaryotes. Um, most of uh, antibiotics are for, you know, antibiotics. So this is one of those. Rifampicin or rifampin, rifabutin inhibits DNA independent RNA polymerase and prokaryotes. Let's take a break here. Part of process by which precursor mRNA, pre-mRNA is transitioned Transform, sorry, it's transformed into mature mRNA. Introns typically begin with GU and end with AG. We saw that over here, GU and AG in introns. Alteration in SNRNP assembly uh, can cause clinical diseases. For example, in spinal muscular atrophy, SNRNP assembly is affected due to decrease SMN protein, which leads to congenital degeneration of anterior horn of spinal cord, uh, which leads to symmetric weakness, hypotonia, or floppy baby syndrome. SNRNPs are SNRNA bound to protein, which is SMIF or SM, to form a spliceosome that cleaves pre mRNA. So SN, you can think of it like SNP because it snips the pre-mRNA. 
So that's how you remember that. Or that's how I remember it. Uh, SNR and RNP antibodies are associated with SLE, mixed connective tissue disease, other uh, rheumatic diseases. Uh, pre, uh, sorry, primary transcript combines with small nuclear ribonucleoproteins, SNRNPs, and other proteins to form a uh, spliceosome. Five prime splice site is right here. So this is five prime, three prime, exon, exon. This is the whole intron. So what happens is uh, this is a splice site. Uh, U1 SNRNP. This is the U2 SNRNP. Uh, so when anti U1 SNRNP antibodies are here, it's associated with SLE, mixed connective tissue disease, and other rheumatic diseases. That's what the an antibodies are against. You have GU at the starting of uh, the intron. You have AG at the end of the intron. This has a OP and this has an OP as well. Uh, this is the branch point A. Okay, so primary transcript combines with small nuclear ribonucleoprotein, SNRMP, and other proteins to form spliceosome. So uh, spliceosome is basically the thing that's going to be spliced out. Uh, cleavage at five prime splice site. Uh, lariate shaped or loop shaped intermediate is generated. So that's the two uh, U1s and U2. Uh, they join this uh, together to bring the whole thing together into a loop. Uh, then the cleavage at three prime splice site lariate is released to previous uh, precisely remove intron and join two exons. So then what happens at three site where? Uh, lariate is released to precisely remove intron and join the two exons. So this thing is, I don't, I'm not sure what lariate is. Let's check that out. A rope used as a lasso. Okay. So it's just, Devin told us what does that. I guess SNR and P's do that, I guess. Uh, so that takes that, okay. It removes intron and join two exons. So then these two are joined by the P. Mature, this is called a mature mRNA. Uh, WP is over here and has a hydroxyl group. The whole splice is over. Okay. Uh, nothing too important here. Just, yeah, I don't know. I guess you need to know this, but I don't see what else they can test us on yeah, over here, right? You need to know that SNRNP is what's involved in the splicing of the RNA. Intron versus exons. Exons contain the actual genetic information coding for protein or functional RNA. Introns do not code for protein, but are important in regulation of gene expression. Different exons are frequently combined by alternative splicing to produce a larger number of unique proteins. Introns are intervening sequences and stay in the nucleus, whereas exons exit and are expressed. Alternative splicing can produce a variety of protein products from a single HNRNA, uh, heterogeneous nuclear RNA sequence. For example, transmembrane versus secreted uh, immunoglobulin or trans, uh, tropomyosin variant in muscles or dopamine receptors in the brain post defense evasion by tumor cells. Basically, it's saying is that uh, one RNA can produce numerous types of uh, proteins or uh, immunoglobulins or, you know, other stuff. How? It's because of the introns and exon, ex, uh, exons. Uh, so in one, it if it's red like this, it's gonna make this. If it's red like this, it's gonna make this. If it's red like this, it's gonna make this. By red, I mean, uh, depending on where the introns are being spliced out from, because the starting of a whole codon 
happens at multiple sites, not just at one site. So it's gonna go through it uh, at different sites. So it's gonna create different types of sequences. So that's what it's saying. So introns are intervening sequences and stay in the nucleus, whereas exon exit the nucleus and are expressed. That's how you remember that. Exons are expressed, introns stay in the nucleus. So that's where the splicing happens. So after the splicing happens, introns are gone, then you have mRNA, mRNA goes out and translates into proteins. Uh, tRNA structure. Uh, this seems complicated, it's not really. Uh, I'll tell you what you need to know. 75 to 90 nucleotides secondary structure cloverleaf form anticodon and is opposite three prime aminocyl and okay so you have aminoside and it's right here three prime so that's the attachment sites the five prime uh, uh sorry the amino acid will attach to this thing right here uh okay all tRNAs both eukaryotes and prokaryotes have ca at three prime and so you need to know this this is important so cca so you always read a codon from five prime to three prime so coming from five prime it's going all the way around and here it's cca so remember that you always read it from five prime to three prime uh, have cca at three prime and along with high percentage of chemically modified bases the amino acid is covalent bond covalently bond bound to the three prime end of the tRNA. CCA can carry amino acids. Uh, this is the T-arm right here. Uh, T-arm contains the uh, T symbol C. I'm not sure how to pronounce that symbol. Ribothyme, methine, uh, pseudouridine, and cytidine. Sequence necessary for tRNA ribosome binding. T arm tethers tRNA molecules to ribosomes. So that's where it attaches to ribosomes. DS4. Uh, we'll come. It'll make sense when we get here. Uh, you need to know that this is the T arm and what it does. And this is the D arm, what that does. Well, D-arm contains dihydrouridine residues necessary for tRNA recognition by the correct aminoacyl tRNA synthase. Synthetase. D-arm allows detection of the tRNA by aminoacyl tRNA synthetase. Attachment site three prime ACC to five prime is the amino acid acceptor site. Okay, so this is aminoacyl. TRNA synthetase, uh, ATP, AMP, TTI. It goes into this, amino acid attaches to this. So this is the structure, this is charging, uh, this is the pairing. So this part right here, the anticodon loop. Okay. Uh, So the five prime attaches to the three prime is three prime to ACC five prime. Okay. It's amino acid acceptor site. Okay. Charging. Amino acyl tRNA synthetase uses ATP, one unique enzyme per respective amino acid. So you have one tRNA for one amino acid. And binding of charged tRNA to the codon are responsible for the accuracy of amino acid selection. So this is important to have the correct amino acid selected, um, binding of charged tRNA. So how would that happen? It's because of this thing right here, the green stuff. Uh, amino acid tRNA synthetase matches an amino acid to the tRNA by scrutinizing the amino acid before and after it binds to tRNA. So even before and after, it uh, goes under proofreading and whatever. If an incorrect amino acid is attached, the bound, the bond is hydrolyzed. Uh, it gets separated 
um, mischarged tRNA reads the usual codon but inserts the wrong uh, amino acid. You need to know this. They will ask what happens if uh, wrong uh, tRNA attaches to the wrong codon. Uh, you'll have a wrong amino acid. Uh, at some point, it stops proofreading. So whatever you end up with, that's what you end up with. Uh, it does not get repaired. So you need to know that too. So this is the pairing. Uh, the anticodon goes to the codon. And as soon as this happens, you have this thing happening. So we'll do that now. After start and stop codon, uh, mRNA start codon is AUG. That's the methionine. Uh, AUG inaugurates protein synthesis, eukaryotes, codes for methionine which may be removed before translation is completed. Uh, prokaryotes, codes for N-formal methionine or FMET. FMET stimulates neutrophil hemotaxis. So prokaryotes are bacteria. So if, when bacteria come in with their FMET, our system's like, no, -uh. they get all the neutrophils to act up. mRNA stop codons are, uh, you go away, you are away, and you are gone. Uh, UGA, UA, UAG are uh, recognized by release factors. Uh, protein synthesis, uh, initiation. So this is what it is. So first one is right Okay, so initiation, what happens? You find that in 60 uh, by 50 S ribosomes or 40 by 30 S ribosome in the prokaryotes. Wait, 60 and 40, okay, here it is. Uh, 40 and 60 S, uh, 80 are found in eukaryotes and 30 and 50 S, which makes 70, which is a prime number P for prokaryotes. Okay, so yeah. one, eukaryotic initiation for the protein synthesis, okay. Eukaryotic initiation factors, EIFs uh, identify the five prime cat. Two, uh, E, uh, eukaryotic initiation factors help assemble the 40S ribosomal subunit with the initi initiator tRNA. Three, eukaryotic initiation factors released when the mRNA and the ribosomal 60S subunit assembly assemble with the complex. It requires GTP, so that's when it happens and it leaves the ribosome. Okay, so it attaches to this and when, so when it has to go to the other one, I guess. No, I got that wrong. So it attaches to the five prime cap, okay assembles the 40s ribosome subunit the 40s with the initiated tRNA so both of these okay and then it's released when the mRNA and the ribosome 60 subunit assemble with this complex okay so it goes from 40 to 60 it requires GTP uh, synthesis occurs at the N terminus to the C terminus ATP uh, just remember that N to C. Uh, ATP is tRNA activation. Okay. ATP is required for the activation of the tRNA or the charging. GTP, tRNA gripping and going places, translocation. So it's when it's what's required to leave this place and go to the next one. Elongation, uh, one, two, and three. One, aminosyl. Uh, tRNA binds to a site that's this site right here or right here okay except for initiator uh, methionine so okay which binds to the p site so at the p site it's going to be AUG methionine okay so aminosyl tRNA binds to the a site except for initiator methionine uh, which binds to the P site. So 
P side, you're going to have a tRNA that only attaches the methionine to it. Uh, so that is not going to be, well, it is going to be part of the chain, okay. Uh, two uh, is rRNA ribozyme catalyzes peptide bond formation, transfers growing polypeptide to amino acid in A site. Okay, so when it's done here, it goes and attaches on top of the other one. Ribosome, ribosome advances three nucleotides towards three prime of mRNA, moving peptidyl tRNA to P site. Okay, so now this is gonna move onto this side. So from A, it's gonna go to this side. Ribosome moves left to right along mRNA. Almost left to right. Oh yeah, this side is the right side, so it goes from here to here. Okay. Uh, think of going A. A side is incoming SL transferase uh, amino tra amosyl tRNA. P side is accommodates growing peptides. Okay. And E is the exit side, holds empty tRNA as it exits. So it attaches, goes to this and then it exits to this, okay. Elongation factors are targets of bacterial toxins, diphtheria, and pseudomonas. Uh, termination, uh, so how does it terminate then? How does it leave this cycle? Now, eukaryotic release factors, ERFs, recognize the stop codon and halt translation. Completed polypeptide is released from ribosomes, which requires GTP. It requires GTP to go into 60 years thing, I guess. That requires GTP as well. Uh, shined Delgarno sequence. Ribosomal binding site in prokaryotic mRNA recognized by 16S RNA in ribosomal subunit enables protein synthesis initiation by aligning ribosome with start codon so that code is read correctly. Okay. Ribosomal binding site in prokaryote. That's where it is. Recognized by 16S RNA in ribosomal subunit. It enables protein synthesis initiation by aligning ribosome with start codon so that it's read correctly. Okay. Now, I don't think it's being asked, but just know about it because I have seen it in like question stem, but they don't ask about it. Uh, post translation no uh, modification post translation post translational modifications trimming removal of n or c terminal poly propeptides from zymogen to generate mature proteins for example tryptinogen to trypsin so so that's called trimming uh, happens. Uh, covalent alterations happen, which is phosphorylation, uh, glycolization, uh, hydroxylation, methylation, ac acetylation, and ubiquitination. Uh, they do ask about this. <coughs> I think this was asked uh, uh, at what part this happens, ubiquitation. Uh, ubiquitination. Uh, it would be post-translational then. I, I think that's the one I came across. Chaperone protein, uh, intracellular protein uh, involved in facilitating and maintaining protein folding in yeast, high shock syndrome, HSP60, are constitutively, uh, constitutively expressed, but expression may increase with high temperatures, acidic pH, and hypoxia to prevent protein denurturing and misfolding so that's the job of this chaperone protein it just by experiment may increase high temper or let's read that again intracellular protein involved in facilitating and maintaining protein folding that's what it does in yeast high shock heat shock proteins are constitutively expressed i guess that's why you have the budding happening when it's uh, and going into 
uh, it was budding and yeast. I think those two modes they have. So when under heat, this is why. Uh, but expression may increase with high temperature, acidic uh, pH, and hypoxia. This is why it still functions even under high pressure and high uh, temperature. Uh, hypoxia prevent protein denurturing in this folding. We don't have that. Uh, biochemistry cellular cell cycle phases. Checkpoints and control transition between phases of cell cycle. This process is regulated by cyclin, cyclin-dependent kinases, and tumor suppressors, CDKs. M phase, shortest phase of cell cycle, includes mitosis, prophase, prometaphase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase, and cytokinases, cytoplasm, splits into in cytokinases. G1 is of variable duration. Uh, this one's the most important one, tumor suppressor. Let's go. Regulation of cell cycle. Cells, uh, cyclin-dependent kinases constitutively, constitutively, uh, expressed but inactive when not bound to cycling. Uh, okay. Cycling dependent kinases. Uh, I don't know why I'm skipping on the pronunciation for this. Constitutively uh, expressed but inactive when not bound to cycling. Uh, cycling CDKs complexes. Cyclins are phase specific regulatory proteins that activate CDKs when stimulated by growth factors. The cycling CDK complexes can then phosphorylate other proteins or RB, for example, to coordinate cell cycle progression. This complex must be activated, inactivated at appropriate times for cell cycle to progress. That's what happens. Okay. So tumor suppressors are P53, which goes to P21 induction, which goes to CDK inhibition, which leads to RB hypophosphorylation, which is activation which leads to G1S phase. Okay, so you have, let's finish this, G1-2S phase progression inhibition. Mutation in the tumor suppressor genes can result in unrestrained cell divisions, uh, Leifrimini syndrome. The growth factors, for example, insulin, PDGF, EPO, and EGF, by tyrosine kinase receptors to transition the cells from G1-2S phase. So from G1, S phase. So this is where the RB P53 uh, acts basically. So how this cycle works is very important. Let's do that. Uh, okay. So you have either DNA damage or Lee-Fermini syndrome or uh, herpes E6 or human papillomavirus, sorry, uh, E6 strand. Uh, they all inhibit P53 or P53 is damaged. What you get is it normally does what? It activates P21, uh, which would inhibit uh, CDK and cyclin complex to act on RB or E2F to make RB uh, phosphorylation. <coughs> The P cycle phosphorylation. Okay. I actually have a photo for this. Give me a second. I'll get that in my note. I didn't. I don't think I have it.
Okay, uh, for some reason it's not getting picked up on me. Let's, I'll send it to the group. So if you look at the photo I just sent, uh, DNA damage in that P53, uh, it either goes to BCL2 and gets active. So BCL is be clever and live. That's what it's known for. Uh, BAX is bad, so it stops the... Uh, it causes apoptosis. That's what it is. So when you have B. and live gene, it will stop Bax. So when Bax is inhibited, capsis won't activate and it won't go into apoptosis. Another thing it does is it activates P21. When P53 is active or dephosphorylates, it dephosphorylates uh, RB gene. Is that what it says here? Yeah, so it hypophosphorylates. So that's what activates it, okay. When it's phosphorylated, it gets inactivated, okay. So P21 will inhibit CDK cycling, which deactivates RB and EF2, E2F. Uh, E2F is elongation factor. That's what this is. Uh, so new, it's required for new DNA synthesis. Uh, and this is required to go into S phase basically, okay. I don't know why I'm getting confused by this, but okay. Uh, P53, uh, so what happens uh, when there is a mutation here? When there's a mutation here, uh, this is not gonna be activated. If this is not activated, it's not gonna inhibit this. If this is not inhibited, then this is gonna keep, uh, you need, uh, this is gonna attach to this complex to keep making more transcription. Uh, gene transcription will keep going. So this is, uh, P53 is required to stop of mutated uh, DNA or uh, DNA from making wrong sequences. That's what this is important for. So we, when you don't have this, wrong sequences are also gonna be synthesized and then get translated into more abnormal proteins. That's what this is important from, for. Uh, so let's read that again. Uh, P53 goes to P21 induction, CDK inhibition. Uh, with it inhibits CDK inhibition. So this will cause uh, RB hypophosphorylation, which causes activation. And then when it's activated, G1 will go to S phase. When there is no problem, that's gonna happen. Uh, mutations in tumor suppressor genes can result in unrestrained cell division. You have that in the Firmini syndrome. Growth factors are uh, insulin, PGF, EPO, EGF. It binds tyrosine kinase receptors to transition the cell from G1 to S phase. Okay. On the other note I have is cell cycle proceeds when RB is. I guess that's wrong. Uh, unphosphorylated RB prevents G1. Nope, I got that wrong. Yeah, don't look at the second one I sent. Uh, cell types, permanent, stable, and labile. Uh, permanent, remains and GO, uh, regenerates from stem cells. Neurons, skeletal, and cardiac muscles, or RBCs. These are the ones that don't, uh, you know, you don't have a lot of regeneration of this. 
you can uh, for skeletal you have like hypertrophy and hypertrophy but you don't have you know new skeletal muscles uh, same thing with cardiac and neurons once you have it that's you stay with that for life kind of thing uh, for RBCs uh, it comes from the bone marrow they have stem cells there so that's where it's made from but it's called the permanent cells stable uh, crescent enter g1 from g o when stimulated these are your hepatocytes lymphocytes uh, pct peristeal cells that's proximal convoluted tubule in the kidney uh, labile are they never go to g o phase divide rapidly with a short g1 most affected by chemotherapy these are going to be your bone marrow, gut epithelium, skin, hair follicle, and germ cells. So bone marrow, gut epithelium, skin, hair follicle, and germ cells. Uh, these are the ones that uh, you regenerate every like seven days kind of thing. Gut epithelium, you can imagine when everything is brushing across its border, some cells are bound to get, uh, you know, broken off and go into your stool. So it requires regeneration constantly. Same thing with skin. You get a lot of dead skin. Uh, same thing with hair, uh, unfortunately, and germ cells, bone marrow. Okay. Uh, there you go. Uh, then. RER for RER site of synthesis of secretory uh, exported proteins and end linked oligosaccharide addition to lysosomal and other proteins. Uh, this is important. Sorry. Uh, I think I have a note on that. Uh, are your secretory exported proteins within organelles are formed in? Okay, so they might ask you about the proteins that are in the organelles, like uh, Golgi bodies or lysosomes. They are found in RER, formed in RER, sorry. Uh, same thing with cell membrane and proteins. Uh, uh, for uh, the there's uh, free RER that's in cytosol, uh, solic, peroxisomal, and mitochondria proteins. There is a uh, smooth endoplasmic reticulum. It's found in uh, liver hepatocytes and steroid hormone producing cells of the adrenal cortex and gonads. Uh, these are your steroid forming ones. It's formed in SER, site of steroid synthesis and detoxification of drugs and poisons. Uh, there you go. Location of uh, glucose 6-phosphate. Ts, glucose 6-phosphatase. Where's the other SER? It contains 21 hydroxylase involved in synthesis and processing of hydrophobic compounds like lipids, phospholipids, and cholesterol derivatives like steroid or hormones when they ask you specifically about these it's made here promotes male pattern baldness and realization and tumor with high ser so there you go let's read that again site of synthesis of secretory exported protein and n linked oligosaccharide addition to lysosomal and other proteins. Nasal bodies, RER, and neuron synthesis, peptide, neurotransmitters, and secretion, free ribosomes, unattached to any membrane, site of synthesis of cytosolic, peroxomal, and mitochondrial uh, proteins. So this is important. This thing right here is important. Nasal body, these are RERs in uh, neurons this is the reason why you would see uh, staining of a neuron 
because these are not found in the axons, but they are found in the dendrites and uh, cell body. So when you put in a stain, what it stains actually is RER, and that's why you see those uh, in neurons. It synthesizes uh, synthesizes peptide neurotransmitter specification. End-linked glycolization occurs in endoplasmic reticulum, mucus secreting goblet cells of small intestine and antibody secreting plasma cells are rich in RER. Proteins within organelles, ER, Golgi bodies, lysosomes, are formed in RER. So that's important too. Uh, mucus corpus is one to that is antibody secreting. Plasm cells are rich in RER. I guess that's important too. But this is more important in, uh, when we come to GAT. Uh, smooth endoplasmic reticulum, site of steroid synthesis and detoxification of drugs and poison. Lex, surface ribosomes. Location of glucose 6-phosphatase, last step in glycogenolysis and gluconeogenesis. Last step in. Let's check that out. I have glycolay, I don't have. We don't have that here. We have glycogen. I have glycogen metabolism. I don't have lysis. I guess that is similar to glycolay. There you go. There's where it is. Yeah. Um, glucose 6-phosphatase, so that's where you find it, when it says location of glucose 6-phosphatase, last step in glycogenolysis and gluconeogenesis, let's look at that, uh, glucogenol, so this is gluconeogenesis and that's where you see it, uh, okay. Uh, hepatocyte and steroid hormone producing cells of the adrenal cortex and gonads are rich in SER. Cell trafficking. Golgi is, uh, okay. So for this, uh, they will, they ask about this. They don't ask about much of anything else, but you should know this. So let's go. Golgi's distribution center for proteins and lipids from endoplasmic reticulum to vesicles and plasma membrane. So this is how it gets distributed. Uh, what? The proteins and lipids from endoplasmic reticulum to everywhere else. Uh, it goes to Golgi. Uh, Post-translational events in Golgi include modifying N oligosaccharides on aspergine, adding O oligosaccharides on serine and threonine, sorry, and adding mannose 6-phosphate to proteins for lysosomal and other proteins. Endosomes are sorting centers for material from outside the cell or from the Golgi. So everything here will go outside. Uh, sorry, it comes in from outside of the cell or from the Golgi. And it sends it to the lysosomes for destruction or back to the membrane or Golgi for further use. Okay. So here we saw that post transition and Golgi include modifying. So in Golgi, what happens is uh, includes modifying and oligosaccharides on arginine, aspargine, sorry. But also the, this is what they ask, adding O oligosaccharides on serine and threonine and they are okay. This is what they are. Sorry, not that. Adding of mannose six phosphate to proteins for lysosomal and other proteins. So this is the most important aspect of Golgi. Uh, okay, so it's distributing center anyway. So everything after all this done, it sends it out to endosomes or lysosomes. Sorry, I cell disease. It's also known as inclusion cell disease, a mucolipid, 
lipidosis type 2. Inherited lysosomal storage disorder or autosomal recessive defect in N acetyl acetyl glucosamyl 1 phosphotransferase, which leads to failure of Golgi 2 phosphorylate mannose residues, uh, decrease in mannose 6 phosphate on glycoproteins. This leads to enzymes secreted extracellularly, like, uh, cellularly rather than delivered to lysosomes, which leads to lysosomes deficient in digestive enzymes will cause buildup of cellular debris and lysosomes, which is called inclusion bonds. So in a question stem, they might tell you that uh, on a electron microscope or uh, via histo, uh, they see lysosomes and they are big. Uh, nor like twice the size or maybe 40 times the size of normal lysosomes. So you know something is being built up there. So it's one of the lysosomal storage diseases. Uh, how you get to this is uh, they have a specific buzzword. So that's right here. Results in coarse facial features, gingival hyperplasia, corneal clouding, restricted joint movement, claw hand deformities, kyphoscoliosis, and increase in plasma level of lysosomal enzymes. Uh, the coarse facial hair is the dead giveaway along with gingival hyperplasia. Uh, if you get these two, uh, anything else is a bonus. Uh, it's gonna be your eye uh, inclusion cell disease. So you need to know what it looks like uh, I'm not sure if there is like a photo. Let's see if there's like a feature. Okay, so that's what they look like. Yeah, you can see the similarities between the photos. So, yeah, of course, facial hair. Uh, facial features, sorry, uh, gingival hyperplasia. Right there. Uh, kyphoscoliosis, that's why they have uh, this. I think we have 10 minutes left. Yeah. Okay, we're almost done with this page. Um, and they have claw hand deformities. So anything like that, you see, it's going to be your eye cell disease. This is important because lysosomal diseases, there are a lot more. It's the, I don't know if I got it here. Story, there you go. It's this thing right here, Tay-Sachs, Fabry. So you need to know how to differentiate between all the lysosomal storage diseases. So this is one of them. Symptoms similar to, but more severe than Hurler syndrome. That's what it is, because it does have clouding in it. Uh, Hunter doesn't have clouding of cornea, but Hurler does, so that's how you know. Often fatal in childhood. Signal recognition particle, SRP, abundant cytosolic ribonucleoprotein that traffics polypeptide ribosome complex from the cytosol to the RER. Absent or dysfunctional SRP will lead to accumulation of protein and cytosol. Vesicular trafficking proteins, um, COPI, Golgi will lead to. Okay, so these are not really that important. They don't get tested on much, but you will might do it. So vesicular trafficking proteins, so COPI. Golgi, Golgi retrograde, cis Golgi ER. COP2 is ER, will lead to cis Golgi retrograde. This is two. So two steps forward, which is retrograde. And one step back, which is retrograde. So that's the most that they will test you on. Which one goes forward, which one goes backward. Uh, claritin transgolgi lysosomes plasma membrane leads to endosome receptor mediated endocytosis 
for example, LDR receptor activity. I'm not going to go over that much because, like I said, it's not as much. They do ask about this signal recognition particle. It's abundant cytosolic ribonucleoprotein that traffics polypeptide ribosome complex from the cytosol to the RU. Absent or dysfunctional SRP will lead to accumulation of protein in cytosol. So that's what happens when you have a defect in SRP. All right, we'll take a five minute break. Membrane enclosed organelle involved in beta oxidation of very long chain fatty acids or VLCFA, strictly peroxymal process and alpha oxidation of branch chain fatty acids, strictly peroxymal process as well, okay? Uh, catabolism of amino acids and ethanol happens in peroxisome. So they might ask you, uh, uh, man has a lot of, had drank ethanol. So what part of the cell is involved in removal of it? That would be your peroxisome. Amino acids, uh, catabolism also happens here. Synthesis of bile acids and plasmalogens, important membrane phospholipids, Uh, synthesis of bile acids and plasmalogens, uh, important membrane phospholipids, uh, especially in white matter of brain. So they might give you a question about uh, what makes the membrane, cell membrane. You might have peroxisome or you might have endoplasmic reticulum, uh, one or the other, but you won't have both because this also makes peroxisome, uh, sorry, mitochondrial proteins right here. The ribosome. Okay. Uh, then you have Zellweger, uh, Zellweger syndrome, autosomal recessive disorder of peroxisome biogenesis due to mutated PEX genes, hypotonia, seizures, jaundice, craniofacial dysmorphia, hepatomegaly, early death. Uh, Refsum disease is, uh, they ask about this in your world. Uh, autosomal recessive disorder of alpha oxidation, which leads to buildup of phytanic acid due to inability to degrade it. So they'll give you a person who has scaly skin, that's the buzzword, uh, ataxia, cataracts or night blindness, shortening of fourth rim, Fourth toe, this is also a buzzword for this. They do give you this in the question stem. Shortening of the fourth toe. Uh, epiphyseal dysplasia. So they might be shorter. Uh, they might have a short stature. Treatment is diet and plasmapheresis. So you avoid anything that has this in the diet. Anything that would require you to have peroxisome avoided. Uh, Zellweger syndrome is hypotonia, seizures, jaundice, craniofacial dysmorphia, hepatomegaly, and early death. By itself, everything is very vague. Like hypotonia can happen for many reasons. Jaundice happens for many reasons. Uh, seizures can happen for many reasons so all of this is vague but when you're talking about shortening of fourth toe or scaly skin uh, this happens because of maybe vitamin a or this refsum disease but then when they give you shortening of fourth toe with scaly skin you know it's refsum disease now uh, if they have short stature they do that too they tell you how tall they are then you know it's refsum Adrenal leukodystrophy, X-linked uh, recessive disorder of beta oxidation due to mutation in ABCDI1 uh, gene. VLCFA buildup in adrenal glands. You'll have fatty chains in adrenal gland. Uh, white matter of the brain, which is leuco is white matter of the brain. Okay. And testes. Progressive 
disease that can lead to adrenal gland crisis, progressive loss of neurologic function, and death. Uh, they have asked about this. So somehow we need to remember that adrenal, so it tells you it's in adrenal glands. Leuco, it tells you it's in white matter. And uh, testes. Uh, there is no way of memorizing this from the word, but uh, they'll probably give you this and this. So uh, what you get is uh, very long chain fatty acids. You require peroxisomes for that. So that's why there's a buildup of it in these places. Uh, proteasome, uh, barrel shaped protein complex that degrades ubiquitin tag proteins. Defects in the ubiquitin uh, proteasome system have been implicated in some cases of Parkinson's disease. Uh, this is important. Uh, we'll learn about that over here. Um, proteasomes. Uh, these are proteasomes, by the way. Uh, or are they? Now I'm confused. They're bear shaped protein complex that degrade ubiquitin tag proteins. Okay. It's pretty obvious when they, they ask you about this. Uh, they will give you this term right here so you know you're talking about proteasome and the, the whole thing. This is not that, I guess. Uh, they are, they're, ubiquitin is basically something that is tagged to be degraded. Uh, so they'll give you a question where something is getting built up. Uh, something as in like catabolized amino acid or protein that has been denatured that needs to be removed from the cell. So they would be tagged and it's called ubiquitin tag. And then what happens is proteasome comes along and it picks up the tags, not the proteins or anything, but it recognizes the ubiquitin and then it takes it up and then it uh, properly discards it. So if it's not tagged by this, then it's not going to be discarded. So if this doesn't happen, there is a problem with proteasome or the way it's tagged or something like that. Okay. Cytoskeleton elements, a network of protein fibers within the cytoplasm that support cell structure, cell and organal movement and cell division. Type of filament, uh, predominant functions and examples. So microfilaments are in muscle contraction, cytokinesis. Example would be your actin or microvilli. Uh, intermediate filaments are, uh, they maintain the cell structure. So that's your vimentin, desmin, cytokeratin, lemons, glial fibrillary acidic protein, also known as GFAT, uh, and neurofilaments. Microtubules, uh, they function, uh, their function is movement and cell division. Examples are cilia, flagella, mitotic spindles, axonal trafficking, and centricles. Uh, out of all of these, you should know microfilaments are actin and microfilament. Microtubules are cilia, flagella. Uh, yeah, these two are the important ones. Uh, the other ones you can know, mitotic spindles are the ones that are in the, you find in the cell when they're dividing. So when you see those lines that are like, this is your cell and then when they're dividing these lines. And then you have your chromosomes here. So these lines are what the mitotic spindles are, the spindle fibers. Exonal trafficking and centrioles. Uh, microtubules, uh, cylindrical outer shape structure composed of helical array of polymerized heterodimers of alpha and beta tubulin. Each dimer has two GTP bound, uh, incorporated into flagella, cilia, mitotic spindles, also involved in slow exoplasmic transports in neurons. Uh, so these are what's uh, involved in slow exoplasmic transports in neurons. Uh, molecular motor proteins transport cellular cargo towards opposite end of microtubules. This thing right here is the most important out of all this. 
uh, that the retrograde to microtubules that's from positive end that's up here to the negative end that's here. So dime. Okay. Uh, so ready and attack is how they want us to remember it. So uh, ready, our E is for retrograde, uh, DY is for dining, attack, A is for retrograde to microtubule that goes from negative to positive, uh, and kind of same. Why is this important to know? Uh, it's because uh, some of the bacteria and toxins like clostridium to toxin, toxin uh, this is how you uh, because of the way they travel is how you have the symptoms appear on your body uh, so when you have enterograde so that's from negative to positive or from down here to up here that's why you have uh, polio it affects your leg and not the top. So clostridium titani toxin, herpes simplex virus, polio virus, and uh, rabies virus use dining for retrograde transport to, sorry, huh, yeah, that, uh, to the neuronal cell body. Okay. So the way it travels is how you're going to get the symptoms. Most of them are going to use retrograde. Uh, I don't think they ask about the retrograde one. They usually ask about the dining one. Uh, drugs that act on microtubules uh, are these. Microtubules get constructed very terribly. So M for mebendazole. Uh, you bend a tube, so you can remember it that way. Mebendazole. Anti, it's used for anti-helminthic. Uh, then you have griseofilvin. You know those are for antifungal. Uh, they also attack the microtubules in the cell, the, this thing, mitotic spindles. <coughs> uh, colchicin uh, or anti-gout, uh, vinca alkaloids, anti-cancer, and texans, anti-cancer as well. So you gotta remember which ones, which drugs you give for, uh, that has a mechanism of action that involves microtubules. So that's mebendazole, grisofovin, cochicin, vinca alkaloids, and taxins. Uh, we'll come go through this during pharmacy as well. Uh, negative end near nucleus. That's an easy way to remember. Positive end points to periphery. Okay. So positive is periphery. And so when you have... A cell, whoops, the nucleus. Okay, I'm spending way too much time on that. Uh, so this would be your nucleus, the negative end would be on this side, and positive end would be near the periphery over here. Ready attack, just remember the way it goes and which ones do use dyne. So that's your clostridium titani toxin, herpes simplex virus, polio virus, rabies virus. Okay. Uh, cilia structure. Uh, motile cilia consists of nine doublet plus two singlet arrangement of microtubules. Basal body, so that's your doublet and that's. Uh, sorry, that's your singlet, and that's the doublet. Um, basal body. Base of cilium below cell membrane consists of nine microtubule triplet, triplets in B. With no central microtubules. These are non-motile primary cilia, work as chemical sense, signal sensors, and have a role in signal transduction and cell growth control. This genesis may lead to polycystic kidney disease, mitral valve prolapse, or retinal degeneration. So de this genesis of these will lead to uh, PD, 
MEP and retinal degeneration. Exonemal dining. ATPase that links peripheral nine doublets and causes bending of cilium by differential sliding of doublets. Uh, gap junction enables coordinated ciliary movement. So you have dining, microtubule A, microtubule B, uh, next in doublets. Uh, I'm not really sure uh, about this one because I never came across a question that tested us on this, so I don't think that's that important. But it is, you know, FA, so everything in FA is high yield apparently, so. There it is. Uh, primary ciliary dyskinesia. This is important. Why? Because it's cartic nerve syndrome. Uh, they test this in a lot of chapters. It comes in your recipe, most importantly. Uh, and also in something else. I skipped it right now. Also called cardiac nerve syndrome, autosomal recessive, dining arm defect. It leads to immortal cilia. That's the important one. Uh, they usually ask you to, you need to be able to differentiate between this and cystic fibrosis. Uh, yeah. Dysfunctional ciliated epithelia. Uh, developmental abnormalities due to impaired migration and orientation. So for Cartagena, what you're gonna have is situs inversus. The heart is gonna be on the right side instead of the left. Hearing loss due to dysfunctional eustachian tube cilia. The cilia in your eustachian tube is gone. Uh, recurrent infections, sinusitis, ear infection, bronchiectasis due to impaired ciliary clearance of debris and pathogens. Uh, so if you have read uh, cystic fibrosis, you know this is similar to cystic fibrosis. You get a lot of ear infection in that too. You get pseudomonas in that one. Infertility is increased risk of ectopic pregnancy due to dysfunctional fallopian tube cilia and immortal spermatozoa. So they also tell you that he's infertile, but I, you need to know why. So if you're differentiated that it is because of cartagena, you need to know why it is. Uh, and cystic fibrosis, you get degeneration or degradation of uh, vas deferens, where, whereas in cartagena, it's because of immortal spermatozoa. And there is an increased risk of ectopic pregnancy. It's because the cilia is not working, so it's not gonna travel, the egg is not gonna travel down the fallopian tube. So the sperm will come up the fallopian tube wherever the egg is, and then it's gonna get uh, fertilized there. Uh, so you have ectopic pregnancy then. Uh, yeah, it's important to differentiate between just keep the page number in mind so when you do uh, cystic fiber you can come back here and just check it out uh, sodium potassium pump sodium potassium ATP is, is located in the plasma membrane with ATP site on cytosolic site for each ATP consumed, 2K go in to the cell, pump dephosphorylated, and 3NA go out of the cell, pump phosphorylated. Okay, two strikes, K, you're still in. Three strikes, nah, you're out. Okay, besides this, every time you're talk gonna talk about K, it's always gonna be going out, or N is gonna always be coming in because that's how you uh, do action potential. That's the only time this is most important when you're doing action potential. Uh, okay, uh, cardiac glycosides, digoxin and digitoxin directly inhibit sodium potassium ATPase. So you get indirect inhibition of sodium calcium exchange. So you have increase in calcium, uh, intracellular increase calcium. 
which leads to increase in cardiac contractility. Uh, that's the mechanism of action for digitoxin or digoxin. Uh, what it does is blocks this pump, so you have uh, you have more uh, sodium staying inside. So what that does is it causes release of calcium. Uh, there's another uh, receptor inside the cell uh, in the vesicles that hold the, I think it's called sir, sir no. It's called something. Uh, so when it it keeps the calcium inside. So when this does action potential, the calcium comes out of those because of the receptors getting activated. And when you don't have sodium, they go back in to the cell. So that's why we give this to block the uh, sodium from going out. So you have increased calcium. Calcium is a contractile, so it will do cardiac contractility. Exercise your space is just explain that stuff. Uh, collagen. This is important. They ask about this a lot in wound repair and in collagen itself. Also, skin routine. It's very important for that. If you have a skin routine, have vitamin C. Most abundant. Uh, most abundant uh, protein in the human body. Uh, extensively modified by post translational modification. Okay. Organizes and strengthens extracellular matrix. Type 1 and 2 type 4 are the most common types in humans. That doesn't mean that's all there is. There are more types as well. But uh, for step 1, you just need to know about these four. So type 1 is skeleton. Type 2 is cartilage. Type 3 is arteries. Type 4 is basement. They call it scab. Okay. Mm. Yeah, okay. Type one. Uh, most common, ninety percent, is bone. Made by. Let me just put it down. Okay, so type one, most common is, this is the most common type. Uh, it's the bone made up of uh, osteoblast, skin, tendon, dentine, uh, fascia, cornea, and late wound repair. So type one, bone, tendon, uh, decreased production and osteogenesis imperfecta one. You need to know that. You need to know uh, what it makes. So it's that. Uh, but it's easy to remember when you know it's skeleton because all the other ones are very specific. Uh, type 2 is cartilage, uh, vitreous body, and nucleus pulposus. That's the one, that's the jelly between your vertebras. Uh, type 2 is cartilage. That's why I remember that. Uh, or scab. The C is for cartilage. Uh, type 3 is reticulin, uh, skin, blood vessels, uterus, fetal tissue, early wound repair. Uh, blood vessels is important, but just as important as skin, because again, type one had skin, type three has skin. But here, it's involved in early wound repair. So first you're gonna see this, and then it's gonna be replaced by type one in late wound repair. Type three, it's deficient in vascular type of ehlers Danlos syndrome. That's important. Uh, they test us on ehlers Danlos syndrome a lot. Uh, type four is basement membrane, basal lamina, glomerulus, cochlea, lens. Type four, under the floor, basement membrane. That's how you remember, or scab. Uh, so type 4 under the floor or basement membrane. Uh, defective in L-Port syndrome. L-Port, I remember that L-Port as an airport. An airport is like, you know, the floor or the ground. Uh, targeted by autoantibodies in good pasture. Pasture is also a plain ground. So that's how I remember the two. 
And this will come in, you know, let me go over it there. Myofibroblasts are responsible for secretion, uh, proliferative stage, and wound contraction. Okay, now the fun stuff. Uh, collagen synthesis and structure. Uh, that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven steps. And you need to know all seven steps of these and what happens in what step. So in synthesis, you have translation of collagen alpha chain, uh, pre-pro-collagen, uh, usually XY. So you'll have glycine and then you will have X or you will have Y attached next to it. X is often proline or lysine where and Y is often hydroxine proline or hydroxine lysine. Collagen is one third glycine. So that's the most abundant one. They will ask you what's the most, uh, which of this is the most uh, abundant in collagen. So it would be your glycine. Glycine content of collagen is less variable than that of lysine and proline. It's the same thing that they're saying. Because these are variable, but glycine is not variable. That's all they're saying. So in number one, pro-alpha chain backbone. The backbone is made up of glycine, and then you have proline or hydroxyproline or lysine or hydroxylysine. Uh, so in two, you have hydroxylation happening. Hydroxylation is hydroxylation of specific proline and lysine residue. It requires vitamin C. This is why uh, the, a lot of skin brands and serums, they have vitamin C. Uh, you use that to keep your skin taut, basically. Uh, deficiency will lead to scurvy. Uh, so you have hydroxylation of proline and lysine. So you have OH groups attached to this now. Glycosylation is glyco, so that's sugar. So you're adding sugar to something now. Glycosylation of pro-alpha chain hydroxylysine uh, residues and formation of pro-collagen via hydrogen and disulfide bond. Sulfide bond, sorry. Uh, triple helix of three collagen alpha chain. Why hydro? Hold on. Let me read that again. Glycosylation of pro alpha chain hydroxylysine residue and formation of pro collagen via hydrogen and disulfide bonds. Triple helix of three collagen alpha chain. So you're going to have triple helix right here forming. Problems forming triple helix will lead to osteogenesis imperfecta. We already saw this term up here. Uh, type 1 deficiency will decrease production. Yeah, decreased production of type 1 and osteogenesis imperfecta type 1. Over here, they're saying that if you cannot make a triple helix formation or a procollagen, you'll have osteogenesis imperfecta. Buzzword for osteogenesis imperfecta, uh, bluish coloration of sclera. Uh, I think we're going to do that here. The next thing. Uh, exocytosis. Exocytosis of procollagen into extracellular space. Uh, so all of this, 1, 2, and 3, happen in RER. That is important to remember. You have nucleus. Uh, from which collagen mRNA came out of. When you have the mRNA going into our ER, it's going to make the protein, right? So then uh, here you have pro pre pro collagen, then that's going to get converted into pro collagen, and then it's going to go into uh, Golgi to get released from the cell. So that's your exocytosis uh, of procollagen into extracellular space. So from here, it's going out of the cell. So it's extracellular into the extracellular space. It's important to know which part is intracellular and which part is extracellular because they do test you on that. Uh, five, proteolytic processing. Cleavage of, also you need to know which part of the cell 
all of this happens in. So that's your RER, rough endoplasmic reticulum. Only for exocytosis, it goes into the Golgi because that's your distribution center. So for five, proteolytic uh, processing, cleavage of disulfide-rich terminal regions of procollagen leads to insoluble tropocollagen. So here you have cleavage of procollagen. You have uh, C and N terminals. Uh, you have the N first and then the C, N to C, it goes. Hold on. Uh, uh, six is assembly and alignment. Collagen assembles into fibrils and aligns for cross-linking. Self-assembly into collagen fibrils. It just assembles itself. Uh, seven is where the most important step happens outside of the cell. Cross-linking. Reinforcement of staggered tropocollagen molecules by covalent lysine hydroxylysine cross linkage by copper containing lysyl oxidase to make collagen fibrils cross linking of collagen increases with age so this increases with age problems with cross linking uh, leads to minkes disease minkes is uh, x linked right leave uh, okay so then you have osteogenesis imperfecta uh, genetic bone disorder brittle bone disease caused by a variety of gene defects most commonly coli col call 1a1 and call 1a2 so genetic bone disorder, brittle bone disease caused by variogenic gene defects. Okay. Most common form is autosomal dominant with decreased production of otherwise normal type 1 collagen. Altered triple helix formation manifestations include multiple fractures and bone deformities. Uh, it's really easy to figure out it's this in the question stem because they'll give you that the person has suffered with uh, from multiple fractures from childhood and bone deformities after minimal trauma uh, during birth. Uh, they don't really give you blue sclera, even though it's a buzzword. Uh, they might give you that it's pigmented sclera. Uh, due to a translucent connective tissue over choroidal veins, some form have tooth abnormalities, uh, including uh, opalescent teeth that wear easily due to lack of dentine, uh, dentigenous imperfecta. Remember here somewhere, yeah, type one is involved in that as well. And it makes sense because when you don't have vitamin C, you get scurvy, which is also something uh, you'll have deformed teeth in. So you have everything of that sort showing up. Some form of tooth abnormalities, there you go. Uh, so, conductive hearing loss, uh, abnormal ossicles is what you have. Um, may be confused with child abuse, treat with bisphosphonates to decrease fracture risk. Uh, so, when you have this, because of scurvy, uh, if there is scurvy uh, or vitamin C, uh, you do have like, a, what do you call it? A bleeding into the skin uh, because uh, it's not being, you know, repaired. So it might seem like they're being abused, but it's not that, it's that they have osteogenesis and perfecta. Treat with bisphosphonates to decrease fracture risk. Patients can't bite bones. Multiple fractures. Uh, bite is for B for bones, eye, teeth, and ear. You have multiple fractures, blue sclera, dental imperfections, and hearing loss. Yeah, it's fairly easy to figure out that it's this. Then you just need to know that it's 
caused by a variety of gene defects. Uh, it is autosomal dominant. And uh, the problem is it with type 1 collagen. Uh, yeah, that's mostly what they test you on. Or they might just straight out ask you what is, what is it. So that's that. Uh, LR Danlos syndrome. It's uh, they ask you what the uh, what's the disease about or like why this is happening. So faulty collagen synthesis causing hyperextensible skin, uh, hypermobile joints. It's pretty fairly easy to figure this one out as well. You're gonna have to differentiate between this and Marfan's and homocysteine urea. Uh, they all have like similarities. Uh, so yeah, you gotta DD those out. Uh, again, faulty collagen synthesis causing hyper extensible skin, uh, hypermobile joints and tendency to bleed, easy bruising. Same thing as this one, easy bruising here as well. Multiple types, inheritance and severity vary. Uh, can be autosomal dominant or recessive, may be associated with joint dislocation, berry and aortic aneurysm, uh, and organ rupture. This is very important, but this does happen in other diseases as well, or syndromes as well. But important one is joint dislocation, uh, happens a lot with these people. Uh, they also have a hypermobile joint, so uh, and hyperextensible skin. So those are the buzzwords basically for these, because you won't have hypermobile joints in uh, Marfan's or homocysteine urea. Uh, hypermobility type joint instability, most common type, and the classic type is joint and skin symptoms. It's caused by mutation in type four collagen. That was, sorry, type 5 collagen. Uh, for example, col 5 one or col 5 a 2 uh, Vascular type, fragile tissue, including vessels, aorta, muscles, and organs that are prone to rupture, like gravid uterus. Mutations in type 3 procollagen is called col 3 a one for example. So that would be your vascular type. So apparently there are three types. There are multiple types, but the three types concerning us is hypermobility type. That's the most common type for LR Danlos. Second type is uh, classical type. It includes joint and skin. Uh, it's caused by mutation in the fifth collagen, uh, type five collagen. Then there is vascular type. That's your fragile tissue, including vessels. So Vascular is vessels, so it's easy to remember that way. But vessels going to uh, muscles or organs are also prone to rupture. And you get a gravid, for example, gravid uterus. Um, for vascular type, the mutation is in type 3 procollagen. Okay. Uh, Minkie's disease, X linked. Yep. Hold on. Okay, uh, Minkus disease, X-linked recessive connective tissue disease caused by impaired co copper absorption and transport due to defective Minkus protein, ATP7A, or absent cooper, copper, uh, versus ATP7B in Wilson's disease. There is a copper buildup here. Okay, so here we have... Uh, over here, it cannot get, it cannot transport copper from uh, the tissues, but here it can't even absorb the copper and transport from the intestine. Uh, so it leads to decreased activity of lysol oxidase because we need copper for that here. That was right here by copper containing lysol oxidase. So when you don't have that, where'd it go? It leads to decreased activity of lysol oxidase. Copper is necessary cofactor. It leads to defective collagen cross-linking. Results in brittle, kinky hair, 
growth and developmental delay, hypotonia, increased risk of cerebral aneurysm. So it results in kinky hair. Uh, that is a buzzword for this. Uh, other than here, you get kinky hair in like two more places, but you got to DD that. Uh, you're going to get brittle, kinky hair. Growth and developmental delay. That's an easy one because you don't have... Well, you do. Okay. Uh, hypotonia is, I guess, another thing that goes with kinky hair for minkies. And there's an increased risk of cerebral aneurysm. So you might have a question stem that says that a person was brought in uh, and they have uh, sub... Uh, intracranial hemorrhage and then they give you they were suffering from growth and developmental delay and the hair uh, on physical appearance seems brittle or kinky then you're gonna kinky is for minkies uh, elastin another place where this happens is in the protein malnutrition part uh, they also give you this uh, and I I think that was it. It's some kind of deficiency, I think, as well, other than protein. We'll come across it. It's okay. Uh, elastin. Uh, elastin is the stretchy protein within the skin, lungs, large arteries, elastic ligaments, vocal cords, epiglottis, ligamentum flavor. Uh, this is connect. It connects the vertebra, uh, which leads to, uh, which is responsible for relaxed and stretched conformations okay so elastin is very important uh, there's multiple things that's gonna happen with this thing uh, you'll find it in liver you'll find it in uh, lungs uh, liver the alpha 1 uh, trypsinogen trypsin uh, Deficiency causes uh, something to do with this. Okay, I'm getting sidetracked. Back to this. Rich in uh, non-hydroxylated proline, lysine, and lysine residue versus the hydroxylated residue of collagen. Okay, so it's rich in non-hydroxylated proline and glycine uh, and lysine residues versus the hydroxylated ones in the collagen. Uh, tropoelastin with fibrillin scaffolding. So that's, uh, this is elastin and stretch, a single elastin stretch, relax into this cross link. Okay. So cross linking occurs extracellularly via lysyl oxidase and gives elastin and elastic properties. Broken down by elastase, which is normally inhibited by alpha-1 antitrypsin. There you go. That's what I was talking about. Broken down by elastase. Uh, so elastin is broken down by elastase. Uh, so elastase is inhibited by alpha-1 antitrypsin. So when you don't have antitrypsin, uh, alpha-1 antitrypsin, what happens is elastase goes rampant. It breaks down all the elastin it can find. And that's why you have diseases for that. The disease you have is emphysema. Uh, alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency results in unopposed elastase activity, which ca can cause COPD, COPD emphysema. Uh, Marfan syndrome will lead... Uh, okay, so what is Marfan syndrome? That's this thing right here. Uh, you have tall person with a cavitation in their chest. Uh, that's usually... And uh, they'll have lens dislocation these are the buzzwords for marfans but that's also the buzzword for homocystinuria the way you differentiate between the two is the lens dislocation right here uh for marfan fan is on the ceiling which is up so upwards and temporal so marfan fans out whereas for homocystinuria is downward and nasal uh for marfans it can be uh Autosome, since it's autosomal dominant, they might have someone else who has it in their family as well. Homocystinuria is not, so you won't see that in family history. 
uh, Marfan syndrome, autosomal dominant with variable expression, connective tissue disorder affecting skeleton, heart, and eyes. Uh, FBN1, gene mutation on chromosome 15, F for Marfan, and FBN1 and 15. Results in defective fibrillin 1. That's important. Fibrillin 1 for Marfan. And for Enlardenlos uh, is collagen type 5 or 3. Well, this is collagen based. There's a mutation in collagen here. Over here, there's a mutation in fibrillin or defective fibrillin 1. A glycoprotein that forms a sheath around elastin and sequesters TGF beta. That's tumor growth factor beta. So a glycoprotein that forms a sheath around elastin and sequesters this. Okay, so that's what fibrillin does. It's a glycoprotein that forms a sheath around the elastin and sequesters TGF beta inside it. Findings. So this is going to be your what you see in the question stem. The person is going to be a tall person with long extremities. Uh, chest wall deformity, uh, pectus uh, carnitum, pigeon uh, chest, or pectus excavitum. That's this thing right here. I think we only have 10 minutes now. Yeah. Okay, yeah, we're almost done with this. Uh, cystic medial necrosis of aorta, aortic root, aneurysm, rupture, or dissection. Most common cause of death is this aortic root this is the most important thing like this is uh something that you'll be asked they'll give you that it's morphins and they will ask you uh, what kind of heart complications will you see in this person so cystic medial necrosis of aorta can happen uh because of which you'll get aortic root aneurysm rupture or dissection most common cause of death uh mitral valve prolapse you get this is the most common one as well so you'll have either this or this in the answers but you won't have both together uh, but if you do have both together then this would be your most common one so you would pick this then uh, increase risk of spontaneous pneumothorax as well homocystinuria most commonly due to cystothionine synthase uh, deficiency leading to homocysteine buildup. Presentation similar to Marfan syndrome with pectus deformity, tall stature. Increase arm height length. So here they gave you that as well. That it's first let's see why it happened. Most commonly due to cystathione synthase deficiency leading to homocysteine buildup. Uh, then they're saying that it's uh, the presentation is going to be similar to Marfan's. I already told you that. They're going to have pectus deformity. They're going to have tall stature. They're also going to have uh, increased arm to height ratio. They're going to have decreased upper to lower body segment ratio. But this thing, you're not. they're not going to differentiate that in the question stem. So just know that they're tall. That's it. They will give you this, but this is also in Marfan. Joint hyperlexicity is in uh, LR Danlos. Uh, skin hyperelasticity and scoliosis. This happens in Marfan. This happens in LR Danlos as well. So the way you differentiate is, like I told you, lens dislocation, they will give you that for sure. Uh, vascular complications between the two is, this one is aortic uh, root dilation because uh, between the layers of the aorta, there is a necrosis happening, medial necrosis. So that's why you have that. Intellect is normal in Marfan. Uh, inheritance, so they might have like ambitions and stuff. That's how you know that their intellect is normal. Inheritance is autosomal dominant. For homocystinuria, autosomal recessive. Uh, intellect is decreased because uh, you have buildup of uh, cystathione synthase. Sorry, uh, whatever the precursor to this is going to have a buildup of that. So which is homocysteine. Uh, build up. Uh, vascular complication is thrombosis and less dislocation is downwards. Okay. 
we're going to start the laboratory techniques in 30 polymerase chain reaction or PCR. Uh, molecular biology lab procedure used to amplify a desired fragment of DNA. Useful as a diagnostic tool. Uh, for example, neonatal HIV or herpes encephalitis. So you can diagnose these with PCR. How does it work? You get a DNA strand, then you split it, and then you make the complementary strands for it. And then the complementary strand is going to become the new strand like that. And then you're going to split it again and keep repeating the cycle. Uh, so first step is denaturation. Uh, that's DNA template. So that's denaturing DNA template. That's this uh, with DNA type uh, primers, a heat stable DNA polymerase, and deoxynucleotide triphosphatase or DNTPs are heated to approximately 95 degrees Celsius to separate the DNA strands. So you need high temperature to separate them. You need all of these to have it happen properly. You guys got to be tighter on the time, man. Uh, okay, I'll do that again. Uh, so you get the DNA strand, uh, which would be your DNA template. You To separate it, you need to put it on approximately 95 degrees Celsius uh, in the presence of heat-stable uh, DNA polymerase, uh, DNA primers and DNTPs or deoxynucleotide triphosphatase. So you put that in uh, and then you get denaturation. Then what happens is uh, annealing. That's linking of the two. Sample is cooled to 55 degrees Celsius. DNA primers anneal to the specific sequence to be amplified on the DNA template. So that's what annealing is. They attach the two or link between the two. Uh, DNA primer annealed to the specific sequence to be amplified DNA. So first you took the DNA strand, you split it, then you attach the DNA primers. We put those in for whichever one we want. Uh, so that's going to be specific to the start sequence or the gene code on you are trying to amplify so that's where it's going to be specific to the dna primer so we already know what that is when we put it in uh, so then uh, the third step is elongation temperature is increased to uh, approximately 72 degrees celsius dna polymerases adds uh, dntps that was your deoxynucleotide triphosphatase to the strand to replicate the sequence after each primer. So that's how they get attached and uh, the sequence is made. So that's your DNTP uh, going along the strand from five prime to three prime, from five prime to three prime. Your anticodon would be this. Anticodon reads from three prime to five prime always it's anti, so it goes the opposite way. Heating and cooling cycles continue until the amount of DNA is coefficient, uh, sufficient. Sorry. So, like I said, this thing, uh, you separate the two, you attach the RNA primer, then with the help of uh, polymerase and DNTPs, uh, they continue the sequence. Once the you have that, you're going to go back to step one, you're going to put it at 95 degrees Celsius to separate these two in the presence of uh, all of these. And then it's going to separate and then start all over again. One, two, three. Okay. That's all there is to it. Uh, they'll test you on this, on the steps, uh, what happens and uh, also what the product is. So if you start with DNA, you're going to get DNA. If you start with RNA, you're going to get RNA. Uh, this can 
uh, also happens in RNA though. So they don't give you that here, but they do test you on that. Uh, CRISPR, Cas9, a genome editing tool derived from bacteria. Uh, this is a cutting edge uh, discovery and technology. Nowadays, it's uh, you might have read it in news and stuff. Uh, so it might be tested on. Uh, genome editing tool derived from bacteria consists of a guide RNA. So this would be your guide RNA right here, uh, which is complementary to the target DNA sequence. Whatever DNA sequence you're trying to uh, interact with. And an endonuclease, that's Cas9. That's the one where it's going to split it. Endonuclease cuts it open. So uh, endonuclease Cas9, which makes a single or double strand break at the target site. It will make either a single or double strand break at the target site. Imperfectly cut segments are repaired by non-homologous uh, and joining. That's the one where the sequence doesn't matter. It's just going to join it. So imperfectly cut segments are repaired by non-homologous and joining, NHEJ. So that's this one. Uh, this will create an accidental frame shift mutation or knockout because uh, whatever is gone is gone. Uh, it's just gonna join these two together. So this will be knocked out. Uh, or a donor DNA sequence can be added to fill in the gap using homology directed repair. This is where the sequence is conserved. So they're gonna see what the sequence was, uh, compare the two, and then they're gonna fix it like that. So why is this important? what are the application of these and why is it in the news well the potential applications include removing virulence factors from pathogens replacing disease causing alleles of genes with healthy variants so it can cure diseases it can get rid of pathogens or virulent factors of the pathogens uh, in clinical trials for sickle cell disease right now and specifically targeting tumor cells. Uh, and specifically targeting tumor cells. Okay. Yeah, so that's why it's important. Uh, these are the applications. What it does is basically either, if it's non-homologous, it's gonna be this one, non-homologous uh, EJ or N joining, sorry and knock-in would be it conserves it so the guide wire is gonna help it build up the dna okay yeah i i think they test you on uh what uh goes where like what the sequence is so first you have the attachment or guide wire then you have the endonuclease and then the breakage happens and then the fixing happens so that's the path or the sequence so you need to know the sequence of and what is involved in each sequence so cas9 would be your endonuclease grna is your guide rna like that. blotting sequence uh, for this i have a note Okay, so we'll just look at that. A blotting procedure. So salgum blot would be uh, one. A DNA sample is enzymatically cleaved into smaller pieces, which are separated on a gel by electrophoresis and then transferred to a membrane. So first, uh, you put in the DNA sample that needs to be detected or whatever. Uh, then you uh put it on uh electrophoresis on gel electrophoresis so it's separated then second step is membrane is exposed to label uh, dna probe that anneals to its complementary strand so for this uh, you're gonna pick so say you're looking for uh, i guess let's see 
cystic fibrosis, then you're going to have uh, complementary strands for cystic, cystic fibrosis. And then you're going to label them like immunolabel or uh, fluorescence, some kind of labeling. And then uh, you put those into the, uh, the mix right here, the gel. And then it's going to attach to its complementary strand. So if the DNA does have uh, cystic fibrosis uh, sequence, then it's going to attach to it. So that's how you know that uh, the person has it. So there it is. Resulting double-stranded labeled piece of DNA is visualized by membrane when membrane is exposed to film or digital imager. So uh, this is southern blot. They're giving you the normal ones, which is A, and then this is your abnormal ones, A, A, A. So I don't know how to read this. It's weird. So they both have recessive genes, I guess. Okay. They both are carriers. The parents are carriers. And then uh, this is the recessive one, so AA, so that the, that's where the mutant gene is expressed. Over here, since it's recessive, the dominant one is normal. So it's only a carrier. Okay. And this is normal as well. Black. So here is a carrier. Here's the mutant gene is expressed. Here it's a carrier. Here's a it's a carrier. So when you do a southern blot, you know what the sequence is. You can just put it, and that's how you figure out when you put it under a, expose it under a film or a digital imager. You'll see or visualize when the filter is exposed to film. Okay. For northern plot, it's the same thing, but instead of DNA, it's with RNA. So similar to southern plot, except that an RNA sample is electrophoresist. Uh, uh, useful for studying mRNA levels, which are reflective of gene expression. Uh, then you have Western blot. This is the most popular one. Uh, for this, uh, say you have like a, uh, you're looking if the person has HIV or something, then they're going to take the sample. Uh, they're going to, uh, the protein via gel electrophoresis. They're going to separate it. So sample of protein is separated via gel electrophoresis and transferred to a membrane. When you put it into a membrane and then you already have what uh, antibodies to HIV, you have a sample of that. So then you're going to put those antibodies into the sample. And uh, if there is HIV, the sample that is being labeled already, that has been labeled already, will attach to the protein uh, right here. So this was labeled uh, antibody protein binds to the relevant uh, protein. And then you have the detection. So then you know that the person has HIV. Uh, so that's how Western blot works. Uh, Southwestern blot identifies DNA protein uh, binding proteins. So DNA binding proteins, this is what this one does. Uh, for example, C-June or C-FOS. Uh, they might, when they test you on this, uh, they'll ask you, uh, what is this used for, uh, Southwestern blot or what do you, what kind of, uh, test would you use for leucine zipper motif? Uh, so vice versa, it can be asked both ways. So you won't see this anywhere else other than here. Uh, okay. So it identifies DNA binding protein southwestern. Uh, south was DNA, so there's DNA, and then west is protein, so it does DNA binding proteins. You can remember that way as well. Uh, using labeled double stranded DNA probes. So, uh, yeah, there's they don't test you on this bit, they test you on this bit right here. Uh, southwestern DNA plus western protein equals southwestern DNA binding protein. Okay, so hopefully that's clear. Uh, snowdrop is how you remember it. S for DNA, N for RNA, 
West for protein absorption. Okay. Uh, flow cytometry. Uh, laboratory technique to assess size, granularity, and protein expression, immunophenotype of individual cells in a sample. S commonly used in, okay, do I go this way or this way? I'll go this way. So lab technique to assess size, granularity, and protein expression, immunophenotype of a individual cells in a sample. So we have a sample with a cell, it's gonna assess its size, granularity, and protein expression. So remember that, what flow of cytometry does. Uh, cells are tagged, so how does it do that? Cells are tagged with antibodies specific to the surface or intracellular proteins. Antibodies are then tagged with a unique fluorescent dye. Sample is analyzed one cell at a time by focusing a laser on the cell and measuring light scatter and intensity of fluorescence. So you put it in the thing, then it goes one cell at a time down the tube. You have a laser and a detector. So the detector will detect it. Uh, you have fluorescent labels, which is red on the antibody. You have anti-CD3 antibody. You have anti-CD8 antibody. These are the surface markers right here. Uh, again, Antibodies against the surface markers. That's what these are. The CD8, CD3. It's found on almost all the cells, I think. Um, fluorescence is detected, labeled. Uh, cells are counted. Then when they do attach to the thing, uh, they the fluorescence and the labeled, whatever the uh, antibodies are, they are going to be detected. Not the cell itself, but this. So that's how you know how much uh, protein expression is happening there. Commonly used in workup of hematologic abnormalities like leukemia, for example, peroxomal nocturnal hemoglobinuria, fetal RBCs in pregnant person's blood, uh, and immunodeficiencies, for example, CD4 cell count in HIV. Uh, data are plotted either as histogram, one measure, or scatter plot. Any two measures as shown in illustration. Uh, this is pretty easy. They do give you this exact diagram and then they'll ask you what's happening. Like, uh, so data are plotted either as histogram, one measure, or scatter plot. Any two measures as shown in illustration. Cells in the low, left lower quadrant is negative for CD8. So this is your CD8. Uh, this is your CD3, so so negative for both. Okay, left. Okay, I guess left is this side then. Left lower quadrant negative for CD3, CD3. So that's this thing right here. Let's put the diagram. Uh, left lower quadrant for both CD8 and CD3. Uh, cells in right lower quadrant is positive for CD8 and wait. Uh, okay, so right core. Am I messing this up or are they did they exchange the left and right? Cells in right lower quadrant is positive for CD8. Yeah. It's negative for this. Never mind. I, I think I'm messing up. Okay. Okay. Since this is the negative area and this is the negative area, that's what they mean. Okay. CD8 and CD3 is negative here. Cell in the right lower quadrant is positive CD8, but negative for CD3 because CD3 is not here. Okay. In this example, right lower quadrant is empty because all CD8 expressing cells also express CD3. Right lower quadrant, okay. So everything that has, every cell that has CD8 also has CD3, but not all CD3 cells 
that are being expressed are uh, have CD8. Okay. Uh, hello, Somia. We are struggling with this chart. <laughs> okay. Uh, cells in left upper quadrant positive for CD3 and negative for CD8. So left upper quadrant is positive for CD3, as you can see, and negative for CD8. So I guess you have to remember uh, the positive and negatives are here and here, and then it's fairly easy to figure it out where you're seeing with those stuff. Uh, so it's in the left upper quadrant this time. Uh, cells in right upper quadrant is positive for both CD8 and CD3 right here, okay. So I think the question I came up across was this, and they told us, asked us, uh, what are you seeing? So you would see CD3 cells. Uh, that was the answer, like that would be the answer there. Majority of the cells you're seeing is CD3 is what you would say with CD3. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so we're on microarrays now. Array consisting of thousands of DNA oligonucleotides arranged in a grid on a glass or silicon chip. The DNA or RNA samples being compared are attached to different fluorophores and hybridized to the array. The ratio of fluorescence signal at a particular oligonucleotide reflects the reflective amount of the hybridized nucleic acid in the two samples. <coughs> okay. So array consisting of thousands of DNA oligonucleotides arranged in a grid or in a glass or silicon chip. The DNA or RNA samples being compared are attached to different fluorophores and hybridized to the array. Okay. The ratio of fluorescence signals at a particular oligonucleotide reflects the relative amount of hybridized uh, nucleic acid in two samples. So I guess it's similar to this, but instead of going uh, through a tube, it's just going to be on a silicon chip or a glass, and then they do the same process there. They're going to shine the uh, laser, uh, and it's going to bounce off the fluorescent signal, and then it's going to get picked up, and that's how we know how many different types of RNA or DNA are being compared to. Or let's see, used to compare the relative uh, transcription of gene and two RNA samples can detect. Let me see. Okay, so you have uh, green label, red label, mixed and hybridized. Okay, and then you compute the analysis. Okay, so that's how it's done. So the spot, zero, uh, yellow is with two copies, okay, of this. Contr patient has two copies of green, control is two copies of uh, red, and then green to red ratio is one to one. Then you have three copies of this and two copies of this is one to one. Okay, so that's how you compare the two, I guess. Why would you do this? It's used to compare the relative transcription of gene in two RNA samples. So RNA from one person and RNA from a second person, and then they're gonna compare the two like this. Can detect single nucleotide polymorphism, that's pretty cool, and copy number variants, number of variants for genotyping clinical genetic testing. So that's where this would be uh, useful in genetic testing. Forensic analysis and cancer mutation and genetic linkage analysis when DNA is used. Okay. Uh, enzyme linked immunosorbent 
Hesse or ELISA, more commonly known as. Uh, immunologic test used to detect the presence of either a specific antigen or antibody in a patient's blood sample. Uh, this is important. Uh, you need to know what ELISA detects. You need to know that for everything, I guess, but this one they do test you on. Uh, detection involves the use of an antibody linked to an enzyme. Added substrate reacts with the enzyme, producing a detectable signal. Can have high sensitivity and specificity, but is less specific than a Western blot. Often used to screen for HIV infection. Western blot was the one with the protein. Uh, you have the uh, blood sample, which would have uh, protein in it, and then you put in the labeled you where to go then you put in the labeled uh, antibodies to it and then if uh, you see a lot of them attached when after you wash it and you still detect the immunofluorescence then or the labels somehow then you know that HIV is present where to go where you get from here uh, yeah done karyotyping uh, Eliza, okay, so specific antigen or antibody in the patient's blood sample. Uh, detection involves the use of antibody linked to an enzyme, added substrate, reacts with the enzyme, uh, producing a detectable signal. Uh, can have high sensitivity, specificity, but less than Western blot. Since the signal, it really depends on the signal it produces that needs to be able to be picked up by the machine. Uh, often used to screen for HIV infection. But we are, if we already know uh, what one of the factors we put in in the Western blot is, then it's a lot easier uh, to detect stuff when you're the one in control of the factor that is involved in detection. Okay, uh, karyotyping. Colchicin is added to the cultured cells to halt chromosome in metaphase. Uh, Chromosomes are stained, ordered, and numbered according to morphology, size, arm length, ratio, and bending pattern. Arrow in A points to extensive abnormality in the cancel stair. So, so that's like a third one there. That's a double. Okay. Guess those two are. I don't know what's wrong with that one. Okay, you'll see here. It has a part of another. Uh, so that's pink. So that pink would be here. So it has part of this in this. That's why this one is. Well, these two are identical. And this one has a trisomy. Okay. Fluorescence in. Okay, so that was this can be performed on sample of blood, bone marrow, amniotic fluid, or placental tissue used to diagnose chromosomal imbalance, for example, autosomal trisomy, sex chromosome, and disorders. It can detect trisomies or sex chromosome disorders. Fluorescence in C2, uh, hybridization. Fluorescent DNA or RNA probe binds to specific gene or other site of interest on chromosome arrow in A. Okay, so these arrows. Okay, so it's saying specific gene or other site of interest to abnormality in cancer cell. Each fluorescent color represents a chromosome specific probe. Used for specific localization of genes and direct vis visualization of chromosomal anomalies. So micro deletion, no fluorescence or on a chromosome compared to fluorescence at the same locus on the second copy of the chromosome. Uh, translocation would be fluorescence signal that correspond to one chromosome is found in a different chromosome, two white arrows in A. So oh, this one, okay, so yeah. Part of this is found right here. So that's translocation. Fluorescence signal that corresponds to one chromosome is found in a different chromosome, two white arrows in it. Show fragments of chromosome 17. That is 17 right there. 
that has translocated to chromosome 19. Uh, duplication, a second copy of chromosome resulting in trisomy or tetrasomy. Uh, so that's a tetrasomy, that would be a trisomy right there. Or two blue arrows in a duplicated chromosome eight resulting in tetrasomy. Okay. Then talk about the single white arrow. Um, molecular cloning, production of recombinant DNA molecule in a bacterial host useful for production of human protein and bacteria human growth hormone insulin for example so why is molecular cloning important uh, because of production of recombinant dna molecule in a bacterial host useful for production of human proteins like insulin or agh steps are you isolate the eukaryotic mrna uh, post uh, RNA processing. So you're done with the translation. Uh, sorry, transcription, not translation. You're done with the transcription. And it has left the nucleus uh, of interest. Okay. Two, add reverse transcriptase and RNA dependent DNA polymerase to produce complementary DNA. So complementary DNA, so it lacks introns. That's how you know it's a complementary DNA. This thing is found in uh, retrovirus. I think that's your HIV virus. Uh -huh. But I think that one is DNA dependent. Uh, DNA polymerase, not RNA dependent. Inserts uh, clone DNA fragment into bacterial plasmids containing antibiotic resistance gene. Uh, four, transform recombinant plasmid into bacteria. Surviving bacteria on antibiotic medium produce clone DNA. Let me see if there's a chart for this. So you have foreign DNA, you have a plasmid, you take the DNA and you put it into the plasmid. It's attached, then you put it into the bacteria and then it colonizes and replicates. Okay. Yeah, same thing here. So you isolate the eukaryotic. Isolate eukaryotic mRNA, uh, post rendering of interest, add reverse transcriptase. I guess that's somewhere in here. Okay, so that's useless. No, but we get it. Uh, you insert the clone DNA fragment into the plasmid and then uh, it transforms. Uh, transform or insert the recombinant plasmid into the gene uh, bacteria. Okay, we are still there. And then we do that. Okay. I guess this is the important step that the insert uh, clone DNA fragment into bacterial plasma containing antibiotic resistance genes. Okay. Uh, gene expression modification. Uh, transgenic. Oh, you're almost done. Uh, gene expression modification, transgenic strategies in mice and wall. Uh, random insertion of gene into mouse ge genome. Uh, random insertion into okay, and targeted insertion or deletion of gene through homolog homologous recombination with mouse gene. So it could be a random insertion of gene into the mouse genome, or it could be targeted insertion or deletion of a gene through homologous recombination. Homologous is the one where you conserve the sequence uh, with mouse gene. Okay, knockout. 
removing a gene, taking it out, knocking is inserting a gene. Random insertion is called constitutive uh, expression. Uh, targeted insertion is called conditional expression. Because uh, you have conditions about where it goes, so conditional is targeted. Random is constitutive. Uh, RNA interference process whereby small non-coding RNA molecule targets mRNAs to inhibit gene expression. Okay, RNA interference. Hold on. Uh, okay, so process whereby small non-coding RNA molecules target mRNA to inhibit gene expression. I think I'm just zoning out, sorry. Uh, RNA interference process, whereby small non-coding RNA molecules target mRNAs. Okay, so you have small non-coding RNA molecules. What are non-coding RNA molecules? Okay, the ones that are not translated into a protein. So I guess, okay. Uh, targets mRNAs to inhibit gene expression. Okay, so you have microRNA naturally produced by cells as hairpin structures. Loose nucleotide pairing allows broad targeting of related mRNAs. When miRNAs bind to mRNA, it blocks translation of mRNA. So MI is like methylation RNA. I think we already did that. But it blocks translation of mRNA and sometimes facilitates its degradation. Okay, so me is not good. Abnormal expression of miRNAs contributes to certain malignancies. For example, by silencing an mRNA from a tumor suppressor gene the p53 one when you don't have that you don't have a safeguard then you get keep getting uh, cell divisions even for mutated genes uh, small interfering rna uh, usually derived from exogenous double-stranded rna source for example virus once inside a cell uh, small interfering RNA requires complete nucleotide pairing, leading to highly specific mRNA targeting. Results in mRNA cleavage prior to translation can be produced by transcription or chemically synthesized for gene knockdown experiment. Uh, SIRNA, okay. Small interfering RNA, usually derived from exogenous double-stranded RNA source or virus. Once inside a cell, what does it do? SIRNA requires complete nucleotide pairing, leading to highly specific mRNA targeting. Results in mRNA cleavage prior to transmission. It can be produced by transmission. So I guess uh, with the help of these, you can modify genes and how they express. So. That's what it was. We are done with leptic. Uh, I don't know how much time do we have. I think we have like 10 more minutes. So I'll continue for 10 more minutes. Um, biochemistry genetics and genetic terms. Uh, we're going to do terms, definition, and examples of them. Codominance. Both alias contribute to phenotype of the heterozygote. Uh, so blood groups A, B, A, B, alpha 1 antitrypsin deficiency HLA group. All of these have two. For A it would be A and O, B would be B and O. A, B, alpha 1 antitrypsin deficiency. Okay. I guess uh, both the genes that make antitrypsin, they both are gone. So that would be both alleles contribute to the phenotype of that. Uh, same thing with HLA. 
people in terms of expressive, uh, variable expressivity. Patients with the same genotype have varying phenotypes. So two patients with uh, neurofibromatosis type 1 may have varying disease severity. Incom okay, so that is called variable expressivity. Uh, so maybe like two uh, uh, aunt has morphin and uh, another child has a mar morphin, but they both have varying severity of morphin syndrome. One might not have lens dislocation and the other does, kind of like that. Uh, incomplete penetrance. Not all individuals with a disease show the disease. Uh, 100, uh, the percent of penetrants times probability of inheriting genotype equals risk of expressing phenotype. Uh, just because someone has BRCA1, BRCA1 uh, gene mutation do not, does not mean that it will always show. Do not always result in breast or ovarian cancer. Yeah, uh, that's straightforward. Uh, theotropy. One gene contributes to multiple phenotypic effects. One gene can contribute to uh, multiple phenotypic effects. So that would be your untreated phenylketonuria uh, manifests with light skin, intellectual disability, muscular. Side note, let's do that right now. That is very next to here so that would be your phenol ketonuria right here let me take that out uh, so here they are giving us light skin intellectual disability for pqu pku that's this thing right here. Uh, Untreated from the manifestant light skin, intellectual disability, and musty odor, body odor. That's the buzzword, musty body odor or musty odor. Here we have multiple retard mental retardation, musty odor, diet low in uh, phenylalanine, avoid aspartame, diet important during pregnancy, microcephaly. Uh, it can be congenital and it does have a heart defect uh, seizures and early death can happen with this as well okay so anticipation uh, that is anticipation is increased severity or ir earlier onset of disease in succeeding generations trinucleotide repeat disease for example, Huntington disease. Uh, therefore, I think we'll go over that right somewhere here. That would be there. So, trinucleotide repeat diseases are important, uh, and they happen because of anticipation. So, increased severity of earlier onset of disease in succeeding generations. So, say a mother has Huntington. The daughter or son, I guess, will have increased severity, and the Huntington onset of age will be earlier than the mother's. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, loss of heterozygosity. If a patient inherits or develops a mutation in a tumor suppressor gene, the wild type allele must be, wild type is the normal one. Uh, allele must be deleted, mutated, eliminated before cancer develops. This is not true of oncogenes. So there's this thing called uh, loss of function and gain of function. It's It happens with these. Uh, retinoblastoma and the two-hit hypothesis. Uh, Lynch syndrome. Lynch syndrome, sorry. Uh, that's your hereditary non polyposis colorectal cancer, uh, Lee Frumini syndrome. So, 
here basically what they're saying is you need to lose if a patient inherits or develops a mutation in tumor structure. Okay, yeah. So you need to lose both the genes to have a disease developed because of uh, loss of heterozygosity. If you lose one and the other one is normal out of the two, then it's still going to function normally, but the chances of mutation increases the risk as well. Both of them get increased. Okay. Uh, epistasis. The allele of one gene affects the phenotypic expression of alleles in another gene. Albinism, alopecia. So allele of one gene affects the phenotypic expression of alleles in other gene. So albinism and alopecia, they both affect each other, yes. Epistasis, uh, enucleoidy, an abnormal number of chromosome. That's your, uh, due to chromosomal non-disjunction during mitosis or meiosis. Uh, that's Down syndrome, Turner syndrome, oncogenesis. Enucleoidy is just uh, abnormal number of chromosomes. Uh, genetic terms continued term definition example dominant negative mutation exhibits a dominant effect a heterozygote produces a non-functional altered protein that also prevents the normal gene product from functioning a single mutated p53 tumor suppressor gene results in a protein that is able to bind dna and block the wild type p53 from binding to the promoter. Okay. A single mutated P53 gene results in a protein that is able to bind DNA and block the wild type. Okay. 10 minutes left, okay. I think we can make it. Uh, okay, so dominant was exerts a dominant effect, a heterozygote produces a non-functional altered protein that also prevents the normal gene. Okay, so a non-functional protein has been changed, but this all, that also prevents the normal gene product from functioning. But that affects something that was already normal. Okay, that's what it is. It's after lunch and I think I'm zoning out now. <laughs> uh, linkage disequilibrium. Tendency for certain alleles to occur in close proximity on the same chromosome more or less often than expected by chance. Measured in a population, not in a family, and often varies in different populations. They test you on this uh, linkage disequilibrium. So let's do that again. Tendency of certain alleles to occur in close proximity on the same chromosome more or less often than expected by chance. So you have a population where uh, that population has 2% more chance of having Alzheimer uh, compared to a population that's somewhere else. So that is called the linkage disequilibrium, kind of like that. Or uh, by itself, uh, gene A, expresses 2% of the time, whereas gene B expresses 2% of time by itself as well. But in a population, uh, gene A and B are expressing together 6% of the time. That would also be disequilibrium because by itself it's 2% and now together it's 6%, which doesn't make sense. So there's some kind of disequilibrium right there. Measured in a population, it's always measured in a population, not in a family and often varies in different populations. Mosaicism, presence of genetically distinct cell lines in the same individual. Uh, somatic mosaicism, mutations arise from mitotic uh, errors, this is after fertilization, and propagates through multiple tissue or organs, which is okay. Germline gonadal, Mosaicism is mutation only in egg or sperm. Uh, if parents or relatives do not have the disease, suspect gonadal or germline mosaicism. Okay, so 
McEwen Albright syndrome due to GS protein activating mutation presents with unilateral cafe alert spot with ragged edges, polycystotic fibrous dysplasia, bone is replaced by collagen and fibroblasts, and at least one endocrinopathy, precocious puberty, lethal if mutation occurs before fertilization, affecting all cells, but survival in patients with mosaicism. Okay, I'll leave it here as important. Uh, presence of genetically distinct cell line in the same individual. So you're going to see something like this. This is called cafe allowed spot. Uh, okay, so it can happen for two reasons. It could be somatic mosaicism or germline mosaicism. If it's somatic, it's because of mitotic fact, uh, errors or factors, uh, which happens after fertilization, right? Uh, but if it happens uh, before fertilization, uh, then it's going to be germline. It's going to be because the mutation happened in the egg or the sperm. If this happens, how would you know how to differentiate the two? Uh, they're going to give you the family history. And if the family history doesn't have any disease of sort, uh, then you suspect the gonadal. Hello, uh, Gar, turn off your mics, guys. I'll just do it from here. All right. Uh, all right. So that's how you differentiate between the two. Uh, McEwen Albright syndrome is also important. It's the same thing. Uh, you're going to have ragged edges, you're going to have polycystotic fibrous dysplasia. Bone is replaced by collagen and fibroblasts, uh, and at least one endocrinopathy, uh, like precocious uh, puberty, precocious, uh, precocious, precocious puberty. Lethal if uh, mutation occurs before fertilization, because that's in uh, egg and sperm. So it's going to be lethal, like, yeah, if. The fertilization goes on to becoming an embryo and everything they're gonna die but survivable in patients with mosaicism <clears throat> if they have uh mosaicism, so if they have like a cell line that is normal along with the mutated they could survive and it's probably gonna look like this uh, locus uh, heterogeneity Mutations at different loci results in the same disease. So albinism, retinitis, um, pigmentosa, familial, uh, hypercholesteremia. Okay. Then you have allelic heterogeneity. And that's different mutations in the same locus. Uh, results in the same disease. So you have different types of mutations, but they all result in beta thalassemia. So you have uh, different mutations at different locations giving you the same disease. And then you have different mutations in the same location giving you the same disease. For the uh, heteroplasmy, uh, that's presence of both normal and mutated mitochondrial DNA. Sorry. Uh, resulting in variable expression in mitochondrially inherited disease. Uh, mitochondrial DNA passed from mother to all children. When they're talking about mitochondrial diseases, they're going to use the buzzwords uh, myoclonic epilepsy with ragged red fibers also known as MER this 
So this is the buzzwords when they're talking about this. And when you see this, it's because of heteroplasmy. Uh, you have uniparental disomy. Uh, this is the easiest one. Offspring receives two copies of a chromosome from one parent and no copies from the other parent. So that is called heterodisomy or heterozygous indicates a meiosis one error. Isodisomy is homozygous indicates a meiosis two error or postzygotic chromosomal duplication of one of a pair of chromosomes and loss of the other of the original pair. Uh, all of this is not important. What is important is this part. Uh, uniparental is euploid. Uh, correct number of chromosomes. Uh, most occurrence of uh, uniparental disomy or UPD has normal phenotype. Consider isodiasomy is an individual manifesting a recessive disorder when only one parent is carrier. So this thing, uh, you'll see the phenotypes, uh, abnormal phenotype, if they have uh, prader willi and Angelman syndrome. So prader willi is uh, kind of sounds like Padre uh, and Padre is father. So this is like the father one and Angel is like, a, your mom is an angel. So Angelman would be a mother one. So if the paternal or maternal uh, chromosome indicates that they have this, then when they lose or gets mutated, it gets mutated, you get this is basically what it is. We'll learn about it uh, later. But that's what uniparental disomy comes in to question. Uh, Hardy-Weinberg population genetics. Okay, if P and Q represents the frequencies of alleles A and A respectively in a population, then P plus Q equals one. Okay. Uh, there are some rules to this when you're doing this. Okay, so P plus Q is always gonna be one. So let's type out. Let's type this out. It's already given, but let me do that. P. F. Plus Q. P. Q. Plus Q squared. is equal to one okay where p2 frequency of homozygosity for allele a okay so that's this uh q2 frequency of homozygosity for allele a okay so that's your recessive gene this is your dominant gene, this is your recessive, that makes this your carrier, 2PQ. So that's this thing. You have two of uh, PQ, PQ. So frequency of heterozygosity, carrier frequency, if an autosomal recessive disease. Then it's this, okay. Therefore, the sum of the frequencies of these genotypes is equal to one. The frequency of X-linked recessive disease in males is Q, and in females, it's Q squared. Okay. If they're talking about allele frequency, uh, let me write that out. frequency, which is your Q, you're going to have to do uh, 
you're gonna have to square it. So you do square. That's if they're talking about allele frequency. But if they're talking about disease frequency, then you don't need to square it. You don't square it. Then it is Q2 because it equals to Q2. Here, all these frequency is Q because that's what one Q is basically. Okay. Hardy Weinberg law assumption include no mutation occurring at the locus. Natural selection is not occurring. Completely random mating. No net migration. Uh, large population. If a population is in Hardy Weinberg equilibrium, then the value of P and Q remain constant and generation to generation. Uh, since this is something that is important, I'm going to look at some, a few questions. Let's go over it because they test you on this and it does come up on steps. Is going to go through the whole thing. Okay, here's a question. So question says, a healthy 27 year old female presents to the physician for genetic counseling with her husband. They would like to become pregnant in the near future, but have concerns that their offsprings may develop cystic fibrosis. The wife's sister has cystic fibrosis. That means uh, it is a carrier state. The One of the parents had it. So both the parents have it, right? That's how you get cystic fibrosis but that's the sister so the wife would be a carrier since she doesn't have cystic fibrosis so she okay the carrier would be this right here uh an autosomal recessive disorder it's always going to be autosomal recessive we are now going to be concerned with p2 uh okay so autosomal recessive disorder with an incidence of approximately one in ninety thousand in this particular population, the husband's history is non-contributory. Uh, what is the probability of the husband being a carrier? Okay. So they gave us the incidence of uh, autosomal recessive disorder with the incidence of 1 in 90,000. So that is your Q2. Right, because like I said, disease frequency, that's what disease frequency is. So you don't have to square it. You're gonna have to uh, to figure out Q for the carrier. When you have carrier, you can figure out the P because P plus Q equals one. So if they give you uh, disease frequency, you have Q squared. So you can figure out Q from that, right? So that's the first step you're gonna do. You're gonna figure out Q. So Q squared is equal to 1 to 1,000. So square root of that will give you what Q is, which is 1 divided by 300. Uh, you need to know how to do this with a normal uh, calculator that is given in the U world because that's what's going to be given in a uh, step as well. So if you don't know how to figure this out, uh, learn it on U world. 
so you, now you have Q, then you have to figure out what P is equal to. Because we already know that P plus Q is equal to one and we have Q, we can solve for P by putting this to the other side. So one minus Q will give you P, right? So that's what you do. Uh, P plus Q is equal to one. P equals to one minus Q. So the Q is one divided by 300 is going to give you P. So 0 0.9967. Now they're asking about the probability of the husband being a carrier. So the carrier is this middle part right here. This is your dom uh, autosomal dominant. This is your autosomal recessive. So this is your uh, carrier. The carrier would be 2PQ. You have the P, you have the Q now. All you have to do is multiply uh, 2 and multiply it by 2. So that's what they did. 2PQ equals 2P, uh, which is 0 0.9967 times 1 over 300 gives you 2PQ. So 0 0.006587 is your answer. So that is the probability that the husband is a carrier. That's how this, these questions are done. Uh, let me see if there's another one. Yeah, they're never going to give you this easy. Yeah, what's going on? Okay, you know what? What was that? Yes, I'm not. Uh, okay. Okay. Uh, I guess it's a similar question, but it's not given as well. Uh, we'll just score it. Uh, if it comes up on the block, we'll go over it then. But I think that cleared up the questions a bit, uh, hopefully. Uh, so remember, this is important when you have to square it and when you don't. When it's talking about individual allele frequency, they might give you that. Then you have to square it. Or they'll just tell you in the population, the incidence is this. So that is the disease frequency. Then you don't have to square it. And then you have to solve for Q. Uh, most of the time, this is all it's going to concern you with and they'll ask you for carrier or they might give you carrier and then you have to uh, figure out what p is p is always going to be one they will give you that uh and then it's uh, you just do you know you use this okay p is not going to be one but it's going to be close to one that's what it is uh disorder of imprinting Okay, here we go. This is the Padre Village and Angelman syndrome. Uh, disorder of imprinting. Imprinting, one gene copy is silenced by methylation and only the other copy is expressed, uh, which leads to parent of origin effects. The expressed copy may be mutated, may not be expressed, or may be deleted altogether. That's what imprinting is. Imprinting is one gene copy, which is silenced by methylation. So here, the normally, you would have this this and this or this and this from the parent you get this from the mother you get this like that so one gene copy is silenced by methylation so the gray is methylation and only the other copy is expressed so the green ones are expressed uh, and parent of origin effects the expressed copy may be mutated so the green one when that is mutated in uh, the parent chromosome that's called Padre Villai syndrome or Predator Villai, but I call it Padre because that's the father, father is father. So it helps you remember it that way. Uh, if it's the mother gene then it, uh, and that gets silenced or mutated, then you get Angelman syndrome. 
uh, I remember that because Angel is like a mother and uh, we get Angel Moon because of that. Uh, which gene is silent? Uh, signs and symptoms, chromosomes involved and nodes. For preter uh syndrome, which gene is silent? Maternally derived genes are silenced. Disease occurs when the paternal allele is deleted or mutated. So maternal is normally silenced anyways, but when the paternal gene gets mutated, that's when you get this. Uh, so what happens in this? So if you have done uh, sketchy, they showed it like a low fat baby <laughs> under a beanstalk. So he'll, he keeps eating, so hyperphagia. So if you keep eating, you're gonna get obese. Uh, they, yeah, they have uh, intellectual disability, hypogonadism, and hypotonia. But normally, if hi there is hyperphagia, there's not that many things that does this. So if you have hyperphagia, uh, you're going to think about DDing this pretty real life. Uh, okay. Or Billy. And hypotonia, okay. So if he's obese and he eats a lot, uh, it's a thing. It's gonna be this. Uh, okay, now uh, chromosome involved. So it's gonna be chromosome, uh, chromosome 15 of paternal origin. Uh, notes, 25% of cases are due to maternal uniparental disomy. So when this happens, uh, this would be the case of in this. Which this one will be the paternal unipetro disomy. POP, predominantly uh, obesity or overeating and paternal allele deleted. Okay, I think that's sorted. Now, Angelman syndrome, paternally derived UBE3A is silenced. Disease occurs when the maternal allele is deleted or mutated. Uh, Okay, so disease occurs when the maternal one gets deleted or mutated right there. Uh, signs and symptoms for angel menace, seizures, ataxia, severe intellectual disability, and inappropriate laughter. This is the buzzword here. Uh, they laugh a lot and it's even like at inappropriate times when it doesn't require, when something is not funny, they still laugh. They get a lot of seizures. Uh, ataxia is like iffy. That happens in a lot of things, so that won't give away. This happens in a lot of things. Uh, severe intellectual disability, that happens in this as well, so that doesn't help. But this thing right here, inappropriate laughter, is what's going to give it away. Or they can just tell you what the mutation is. Uh, UBE3A on maternal copy of chromosome 15. They might even tell you that it's a uh, mutation on chromosome 15. Then you think of these two. I uh, know 5% of cases are due to paternal unipental uh, disomy. Mamas, maternal allele deleted. Angelman syndrome, mood, ataxia, and seizures. <coughs> okay. Modes of inheritance, autosomal dominant. Uh, often due to defects in structural gene, many generations, both males and females, are affected. So if uh, if the mother has it, okay, so it's autosomal dominant, so it will show up if that uh, gene is there. So often due to defects in structural gene, I mean allele, sorry, not gene. Many generations, both males and females, are affected. Often pleiotropic, multiple apparently unrelated effects, and variable expressivity, different between different between individuals. Family history crucial to diagnosis. With one affected heterozygous parent, each child has a fifty percent chance of being affected. Okay, so like it says, uh, since this person has the allele and this person doesn't have the disease this person does that means this person can be either a a or um, big a big a or big a and small a this one is always going to be a a and a a uh, recessive ones so when uh 
they have a child together. Uh, normally, if this one wasn't there, it would have been big A and small A. Uh, and that's how you know that this is big A, big A. But since there is this one, you know this is big A and small A. Because uh, then there's a chance that the small A from this one combined with small A from this one to make recessive gene that doesn't express the disease. That's how you know that this, if this wasn't there, you can't differentiate if this one is big A, big A or big A and small A. Uh, okay, so 50% uh, of chance of having it being affected, a child being affected when you have head, uh, autosomal dominant heterozygous. When it's homozygous, it's going to be 100%. Autosomal recessive. Okay. With two carriers, heterozygous parents on average, each child has a 25% chance of being affected, 50% chance of being a carrier, and 25% chance of not being affected, nor a carrier. Uh, when you're doing a Hardy Weinberg disease, I mean, uh, questions, they do combine it with this, and uh, they might tell you that the you might have to go backwards into the question, like they might give you the answer, and then you have to figure out what the Q is, or what uh, P is, or PQ is, sorry, carrier. Uh, so when you're doing that, you need to remember not to do uh, one over three and have to do two over three. It does get confusing, so I'm just pointing that out here. You'll see when you come across it. Because uh, the chan if they don't have the disease, that is this, uh, then you're gonna do, uh, uh, and he might have one of these, right? So you're gonna do, okay, so, it could be either AA or AA, but you forget that there are two, um, big A, small A, big A, small A. So that's why the three is there. And uh, the chances of having out of the three is two because you, he can either have big A, big A, or he can have big A, small A, but he won't have small A, small A because he doesn't have the disease. So they're gonna ask you, what are the chances of being a carrier? So it's two out of three probability of being a carrier. That's what I was going on and on about. Okay, X-linked recessive. Son of heterozygous mother have a 50% chance of being affected. No male-to-male -male transmission and it uh, skips generation. Okay, so X-linked, uh, only the sons will have it, the daughters won't. Uh, so sons of heterozygous mother. So the mother ha is a carrier and the father doesn't have it. So she can spread to this and spread to that. I mean, spread to this, this, this. Wait, no, sorry. I got something wrong here. Let, let me finish reading. Commonly more severe in males. Females usually must be homozygous to be affected. Okay, that's why it's not expressed there. Usually they need to be homozygous if it is X-linked recessive. So when they give you a question like this or they give you a diagram like this, only the sons will have uh, expressed the disease, but the daughters won't. That's the easiest way of figuring it out when the disease is not shown in either of the parents, but the sons have it, it's always, most likely going to be X-linked. That's how they present it. How does it work? Uh, it comes from the uh, it comes from the mother. So it comes from the mother. There it is. Uh, X X, and it can go into X Y. Since the mother has two X's, uh, or a girl can have two X's. Uh, she'll express the normal X instead of the uh, disease-associated X. So that's why you don't see it in the females. But in the males, they only have one X, so it will show up because of that. Uh, so when you have XY, 
and then you have a female that is not a carrier, then you have chances of passing it on to a girl as a carrier, but not to guys. It does not go from a guy to a guy. It only goes from a mother to a son. Hopefully I didn't confuse you more than it needs to be. Okay. Um, X-link dominant is uh, transmitted through both parents. Children of affected mothers each have a 50% chance of being affected. 100% of daughters and 0% uh, of sons of affected fathers will be affected. Okay. So X-link dominant, transmitted through both parents. Uh, children of affected mothers have each have a 50% chance because the X is going to be passed on. 100% uh, of the daughters and 0% of the sons of affected fathers because fathers don't give the X, they give the Y. So fathers cannot transmit it to the uh, son, but they will 100% give it off to daughters. So you have a, here you have a father. And here you have a mother that's affected. The father affected, you see the X, it's going to both daughters, but none to the uh, sons because the X is coming from the mother. And since it's X linked. Uh, so here you have a mother that's affected. So the X can come from the mother here and here for the daughter and the son. But here the X is normal on both sides. Here and here, so that's why it's fifty percent. Mitochondrial inheritance. Uh, okay, uh, transmitted only through the mother. All offsprings of affected female may show signs of the disease. It could be the son or the daughter, both. They both show it. Uh, variable expression in a population or even within a family due to heteroplasmy. It can differ in expression uh, caused by mutation in mitochondrial DNA. For example, mitochondrial myopathies, uh, liver hereditary optic neuropathy. Uh, yeah, when they're talking about something about mitochondrial DNA, uh, gotta remember this. This is ragged red fiber. They might or might not give you myoclonic epilepsy, but they will give you ragged red fibers when something is involved with mitochondrial DNA. But nowadays they just tell you that uh, the DNA is circular. That could be also a thing because uh, mitochondrial DNAs are circular. So, yeah. I think that's all there is to that. Uh, when you have autosomal dominant diseases, uh, they are these. And I do have, I'm trying to look for it, just give me a second. Again, it's not showing up here. Okay. 
Oops, let me go. Wait. Okay. Okay, okay, okay. Got it. Okay, hopefully you guys are still here with me. Uh, for X-linked, uh, this is how I remembered it. I made a thing. I don't know if I made it or I got it from somewhere. But, oh, as an ocular, uh, it's CBT Hunters. Name was Lynch Febri or Lish Febri. Uh, he shot Minky, Wasp, Wasp is Westcott Elridge syndrome, and G6P. Uh, up came Burton, what a douchey guy. A and B are X linked, and don't forget DI. So it goes, Oh, it's CBC Hunter's name was Lynch Febby. He shot Minky, Wasp, and G6P. Up came Burton, what a douchey guy. A and B are X linked and don't forget DI. Okay, so douchey guy with uh, Duchenne's muscular dystrophy, that's what it was. Okay, so you have ocular albinism, hunters, uh, Lish Nihan, uh, Febreze, Minkies, Viscott, G6P, D uh, Burton's, Duchenne's, uh, Hemophilia A and B and DI for X linked recessive. For uh, mitochondrial, they already went over it, but uh, that's liver hereditary optic neuropathy, myoclonic epilepsy with rugged red fibers. Uh, Millas, that's what it's called. My, uh, um, Millas is mitochondrial encephalopathy with lactic acidosis and stroke like episodes that's what that is so that happens in this then we have uh, autosomal recessive the mnemonic for that is what fussy game what fussy game so that was your Wilson's disease hemochromatosis alpha 1 antitrypsin deficiency thalassemia Frederick's ataxia you know, urea, phenylcutinuria, alcaptonuria, homocystinuria. Then you have your storage diseases, lysosomal storage, uh, sickle cell anemia, uh, storage diseases also, glycogen storage. I had a few more H's in there, but we'll just figure that out here. Okay, uh, so autosomal dominant disease is achondroplasia. You have to remember these. Uh, if I find out where the acronyms for that I have is, I'll upload it to the group. Uh, achondroplasia, autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease, that's in the name. Familial adenomatous polyposis, familial hypercholesterolemia, hereditary hemorrhagic telangiectasia, osler weber rendu syndrome, hereditary spherocytosis, Huntington disease, leaf remini syndrome, Marfan syndrome, multiple endocrine neoplasia, mitotic uh, muscular dystrophy, neurofibromatosis type 1, 1 uh, Renklinghausen disease, neurofibromatosis type 2, tuberous sclerosis, 1 Hippolindau disease. All of these are autosomal dominant diseases. Uh, autosomal recessive diseases are mostly consists of enzyme defects, oculocutaneous albinism, phenylketonuria, uh, cystic fibrosis, sickle cell disease, Wilson's disease, uh, sphingolipidosis, except Febreze disease because that's an X linked. Uh, uh, hemochromatosis, glycogen storage disease, thalassemia, mucopolysaccharides, except hunter. There, up came the hunter. What a douchey guy. 
uh, Frederick Ataxia Cartagner syndrome and autosomal recessive polycystic kidney disease. Uh, I don't do that, so you guys can read that. Uh, cystic fibrosis. Okay, uh, this is also heavily asked. Huh? So this is one of the most important ones that comes in a lot of chapters. As questions. Cystic fibrosis genetic autosomal recessive. Uh, defect in CFTR gene. They have that here. Okay. On chromosome 7. Uh, commonly a deletion of gene on chromosome 7. Uh, change in F508. Uh, you'll see that a lot. Most common lethal genetic disease in patients with European ancestry. Uh, pathophysiology, CFTR encodes an ATP gated chloride channel that secretes chlorine in lungs and GI tract. And reabsorbs chloride in chloride or chlorine? It's one of those two. I don't want to pronounce it wrong. Chlorine. Okay, so I'll refer to it as chlorine then. Chlorine channel that secretes chlorine in lungs and GI tract and reabsorbs chlorine in sweat glands. Uh, C508 deletion which leads to misfolded protein this is important uh, CFTR is because of misfolded protein uh, which leads to improper protein trafficking and protein retention in RER protein which leads to protein absent from cell membrane which leads to decrease in chlorine and H2O secretion increase in intracellular chlorine results in compensatory increase in sodium reabsorption via epithelial sodium channels. ENAC, which leads to increasing H2O reabsorption, which abnormal causes abnormally thick mucus secreted in the lungs and GI tract. Increase in sodium reabsorption also causes more negative transepithelial potential differences. Difference. Okay, so when you have misfolded protein, and all that stuff, okay. What are you gonna get? You get decrease in chlorine secretion, increase in intracellular chlorine, results in compensatory increase in sodium reabsorption. Okay. So here you have a normal uh, CFTR channel, chlorine goes in, uh, sodium goes in, and through the EMAC, there's a sweat duct, okay. Uh, in cystic fibrosis, Chlorine does not go through this. Uh, so sodium, there's no requirement for sodium to go through it either. Uh, in normal, you have normal mucus because it has uh, chlorine in it. It has water which gets absorbed as sodium goes in. But here, now you, have, you don't have chlorine in it. So it's dehydrated when uh, sodium and H2O comes out. So you have dehydrated mucus all over the uh, skin. So they're gonna sweat out the chlorine and sodium, but chlorine is not gonna get it reabsorbed. So when chlorine doesn't get reabsorbed, sodium doesn't get reabsorbed either. Uh, that's what it's saying. I'll read that again. CFTR encodes an ATP gated chlorine uh, channel that secretes chlorine in lungs and GI tract and reabsorbs chlorine in sweat glands. Uh, that's the normal. Uh, function of it. C508 deletion, which is misfolded protein, improper protein trafficking, and protein retention in rough endoplasmic reticulum leads to protein absent from cell membrane, which leads to decrease in chlorine and H2O secretion. Increased intracellular chlorine results in compensatory increased sodium reabsorption via epithelial sodium channels. ENAC leads to increase in H2O reabsorption which leads to abnormal thick mucus secreted into lungs and GI tract. Increased sodium reabsorption also causes more negative transepithelial potential difference. Uh, diagnosis. 
Or just remember this. When you have increased sodium reabsorption, it also causes more negative trans epithelial potential difference. Because in one of the question stems, they tell you uh, that all the patient went to a lot of doctors, but they never checked. Uh, they did like a test, but it didn't show up that it ha they have CFTR, uh, cystic fibrosis. So this one doctor, he does the test again, but this time he puts salt water on top of uh, epithelium. Uh, and then he checks the trans epithelial potential difference. And then they ask you what, uh, what will they find? Because the patient has all the symptoms of cystic fibrosis, but none of the doctors picked it up except for this one. So when he does this, he checks with this, what should you see? You should see more negative trans epithelial potential difference. That's what it is. Uh, diagnosis, increase in chlorine, concentration in pilocarpine. Uh, induce sweat test and diagnostic is diagnostic. Increase in chlorine concentration and pilocarpine induced sweat test is diagnostic. Uh, can present with concentration, contraction, alkalosis, and hypokalemia. Uh, ECF effects analogous to a patient that taking a loop diuretic. Extracellular fluid effects analogous to a patient taking a loop diuretic. Okay, it's going to be similar to that. Okay, so when you have increased chlorine concentration in the same sweat, it can present with contraction alkalosis because everything is being brought out. So when it's brought out, there's a lot of more stuff in the extracellular fluid than. Uh, hydrogen ions will go into the cell, I guess, which is why it causes alkalosis. No, 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 that's not it. Because hypokalemia happens because the potassium goes into the cell when something is outside. It's okay, we don't get tested on it, so I'm just going to move on. Uh, because of ECF, H2O, sodium loss, loses losses via sweating and concomitant renal, uh, potassium and hydrogen wasting. So I guess they both get released and get flushed out. Okay. Increase in immunoreactive trypsinogen, newborn screening, due to clogging of pancreatic duct. Uh, this is important. This is one of the major complication of cystic fibrosis. Increase in immunoreactive trypsinogen, newborn screen, due to clogging of pancreatic duct. It clogs up the pancreatic duct because everything has mucus on it, so nothing functions properly. Uh, complications. Oh, 10 minutes left, okay. Recurrent pulmonary infections. For example, SREs, infancy and early childhood, Pseudomonas arginosa. Pseudomonas is the most common one that they'll, you'll see in the question stems, but don't forget about SREs. Uh, allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis is also there. So these three things uh, for the recurrent pulmonary infection. Then you're gonna also have chronic bronchitis and bronchiectasis. Uh, reticular nodular pattern on uh, chest x-ray, opacification of sinuses, nasal polyps, nail clubbing. Nail clubbing is, uh, I think, a uh, symptom of bronchiectasis as well. Pancreatic insufficiency, most important one. Malabsorption and steatorrhea, because if you don't have pancreas functioning, then you're not going to have... Uh, fat absorption. So fat is going to get released in stool. So you have steatorrhea. And fat soluble vitamin deficiency, since it, you don't have bile to absorb the fat. So you're going to have fat soluble vitamin deficiencies. That's your ADEK. Progressing to endocrine dysfunction. Uh, 
cystic fibrosis related diabetes, biliary cirrhosis, liver disease, meconium alias in newborn. Infertility in males. This is because of absence of vas deferens. Spermatogenesis may be unaffected. So the, they do have sperm, but what they don't have is vas deferens to transfer the sperm uh, through to the urethra. And self-fertility in females, uh, amenorrhea, abnormally thick cervical mucus. So remember, you have to differentiate between cystic fibrosis and cartilage nerve when it comes. They don't give you cystitis into inter inverses or whatever, because that would be too easy. They give you this, they give you this. But if they give you this, then you know it's uh, cystic fibrosis, pancreatic insufficiency. <clears throat> because uh, you don't get pancreatic insufficiency in car uh, Okay, so treatment. Multifactorial, chest physiotherapy, uh, albuterol, aerosolized, Dornis alpha, alpha, DNAs, and inhaled hypertonic saline facilitates mucus clearance. Azithromycin used as anti-inflammatory agent, ibuprofen slows disease progression, pancreatic enzyme replacement therapy, pancreolipase for pancreatic insufficiency, combination of lumicofactor and tesofactor. Each corrects misfolded proteins and improves their transport to cell surface with alicofactor. Opens chlorine channels leads to improved chloride transport. I don't think this is that important in for step one. It's probably asked in step two. So, but I definitely learned this in this pathophysiology and complications and how to diagnose it. Treatment is, uh, I haven't come across anyone asking how to treat cystic fibrosis. Okay, I'll take a break here. Uh, okay, so. I kind of skipped this bit here in the recording. Okay, so again, grower sign. Patient uses upper extremities to help stand up. Classically seen in Duchenne muscular dystrophy, but also seen in other muscular dystrophies and inflammatory myopathies, polymyositis. Uh, Duchenne is deleted dystrophin. That's the main thing right here. Dystrophin gene, DMD, is the largest protein-coding human gene, which leads to increased chance of spontaneous mutation. Dystrophin helps to anchor, yeah, dystrophin helps to anchor muscle fibers to the extracellular matrix, primarily in skeletal and cardiac muscles. Loss of dystrophin is, leads to myonecrosis. Increase in CK and L delays. Uh, you're going to have increase in CK whenever there is something to do with skeletal muscles or muscles by itself. For cardiac muscle, you get CK and B. For skeletal, you get CK. So if any muscles is damaged, you're going to get increase in CK. And L delays. Uh, genetic testing confirms diagnosis. So the grower sign is patient uses upper extremities to help stand up. So that would be this pushing on the leg to stand up. They start by this, you have big caps. They use their hands and knees to stand up. You're gonna get low doses, thigh atrophy. Uh, Becker. Becker is X-linked recessive disorder typically due to non-shift, frame shift deletion in dystrophin gene. Uh, so if it's frame shift or nonsense, it's gonna be Duchenne. But if it's any other uh, mutation, like non frame shift deletion in dystrophin gene, it's going to be Becker. Partially functional instead of truncated, less severe than Duchenne, Becker is better. Onset in adolescence or early adulthood. Deletions can cause both Duchenne and Becker muscular dystrophies. Uh, two thirds of the cases have large deletions spanning one or more exons. Uh, then we have myotonic dystrophy that's autosomal dominant onset 
is uh, 20 to 30 years uh, CTG that's uh, cataract to pay and gonadal atrophy okay I think oh yeah can't terminate group this is dirties when I say dirty I mean dirty medicine the YouTube channel It's helpful. Why? Because uh, when they give you a uh, question stem for this, it's going to be a guy who opens doors, but then he can't let go of the handle. So they can't terminate the grip. And that's the buzzword for myotonic dystrophy. Uh, autosomal dominant onset 20 to 30 years. Uh, CTG, can't terminate grip. Trinucleotide repeat expansion and the DMPK gene. Abnormal expression of myotonin protein kinase uh, leads to myotonia. Difficulty releasing hand from handshake. Muscle wasting, cataracts, testicular atrophy, and frontal balding and arrhythmias. So you have testicular atrophy, so that's your gonadal atrophy. You have uh, frontal balding, that's for the toupee, and you have cataracts for cataracts. And that's how they did it. But like testicular atrophy, you're not going to think of myotonic dystrophy from that or from muscle wasting. You're not going to think of this. What you'll think of this is when they give you that they can't let go of a handshake or they can't get let go of a door handle. And that's when you think of this. Uh, mitochondrial diseases. Uh, rare disorder arising secondary to failure in oxidative phosphorylation. Tissue with increased energy requirements are preferentially affected. For example, CNS and skeletal muscles. Uh, mitochondrial myopathies includes Miller's. We already went over this. Mitochondrial encephalopathy with lactic acidosis and stroke-like episodes. And MRF, which is myoclonic epilepsy with ragged red fibers light microscopy with stain ragged red fibers due to compensatory uh, proliferation of mitochondria electron microscope mitochondrial crystalline inclusions liver uh, hereditary optic neuropathy mutations in complex one of electron transport chain uh, leads to neuronal death in retina and optic nerve subacute bilateral vision loss in teen and teens and young adults, males more than females, usually permanent, may be accompanied by a neurological dysfunction like tremors or multiple sclerosis like illness. So in this, uh, they do test you on this. Sometimes they give you everything that seem, points towards multiple sclerosis, but then they'll tell you that they also have subacute or uh, bilateral vision loss, even if it's not subacute. Uh, so when you have bilateral vision loss and everything else looks like it's pointing towards multiple sclerosis, think of this. Uh, mitochondrial disease would be the answer then. Or mutation in uh, electron transport chain or something like that. Uh, yeah, this is very subtle. Bilateral vision loss. But bilateral vision loss, because it also happens in uh, vasculitis. Uh, giant cell vasculitis you get vision loss but it's uh, unilateral not bilateral so don't confuse the two uh, red syndrome sporadic disorder seen almost exclusively in females uh, affected males die in utero or shortly after birth most cases are caused by de novo mutation of uh, mecp2 or mecp2 on x chromosome uh, this is what it's going to look like. Symptoms of red syndrome usually appear between ages 1 to 4. The patient is going to be 1 to 4 and are characterized by regression or return in motor, motor verbal, and cognitive abilities, ataxia, seizures, growth deacceleration, and stereotyped uh, hand wringing. 
so they'll be like uh the child was able to he's um, between one ages one to four and then he was able to clap uh at age four but now he doesn't clap anymore uh he used to be able to stand up by himself but he can't stand up or walk or you know uh all he does is rings his hand so hand ringing what is hand ringing it's just shaking it i think okay like that i guess uh so basically what the things they could have could do uh, they're not able to do it anymore like previously so they're regressing so that's what red syndrome is uh this is very important they test a lot on your world about this uh so it could be regression in motor verbal cognitive abilities they could suffer from ataxia or seizures and growth deceleration and stereotyped hand wringing uh fragile x syndrome x linked dominant inheritance trinucleotide repeats and fmr one so fragile x is they have a pretty classic presentation so this is what they would look like uh well that's horrible hold on Okay, we'll just look at these guys. Okay, so hypermethylation of cytosine residue, decrease in expression, most common inherited and ca inherited cause of intellectual disability. Down syndrome is the most common genetic cause, whereas the mutation cause for this would be this, fragile X. Wait, genetic cause, this is excellent dominant inheritance. Try nuclear type PP. Okay. So Down syndrome is the most common genetic, but most cases occur sporadically. Uh, Try nuclear type repeat expansion. So that's CGG. That's congenitally giant gonads. That's the one for that. And this photo. Uh, premature premutation fifty two two hundred repeats will lead to tremor, ataxia, primary ovarian insufficiency. Full mutation more than two hundred repeats will cause uh, post pubertal macro orchidism. Uh, so that's why congenitally giant gonads or CGG for fragile X and large testes. They have long face, they uh, with large jaw, uh, large averted ears like that. Uh, autism, uh, mitral valve prolapse. Uh, that's also in uh, Marfan's and hypermobile joints. That's also in LR Danlos so they are tall as well so you have to differentiate between the three when you're also homocystinuria so yeah but they'll give you large jaw or averted ears something like that or at least uh, when physical examination was done the testes were large self mutilation is common and can be confused with lish syndrome uh, 
but you don't have to remember that because self mutilation is known for lishni hand so don't even have to bother remembering this for fragile x uh, trinucleotide repeat expansion disease Uh, con uh, hunting can okay. So for this, it's can't aim great. Okay, uh, cause okay. So the actual thing Dirty told us was can't aim great when you hunt for an animal. So four is for chromosome four. Can't aim great when you hunt for. And put that here. So, uh, can't aim great as CHEVP. Uh, hunt is for Huntington's, 4 is for chromosome 4, and animal AN is for anticipation. That's how you remember, because when we did anticipation, they talked about trinucleotide repeat. Uh, this autosomal dominant caught it has decreased acetylcholine and GABA. Uh, let me also bring that up. So. There it is. Okay, that was uh, uh, hopefully not a waste of time. <laughs> okay, so Huntington, that's this thing right here. So Huntington has a decrease in acetylcholine, like this one says, uh, and decrease in GABA. It also has an increase in dopamine. Uh, so, yeah, that's all. It's a good recall if you are done CNS. Or the, yeah, okay, we'll do that later. Uh, okay, then we came across myotonic can't terminate grip already. Oh, for Huntington, uh, signs and symptoms are aggression, psychosis, chorea, and dementia. Uh, again, aggression, psychosis, chorea, dementia is known for Huntington. For myotonic uh, dystrophy, you have microorchidism, intellectual disability, long face, long ear, uh, congenitalic giant gonads. Sorry, no, I did that wrong. I was reading for fragile X, sorry. For myotonic, it's uh, distal extremity weakness. 
findings are cataract and testicular atrophy. Uh, GABA, a globinemia, gamma, sorry, gamma, a globinemia, and can't terminate crib. That was your list. So you have cataract, you have baldness, uh, gonadal atrophy in males, reduced fertility in females. 80. Already read the fragile X. That's microorganism, intellectual disability, long face, long ear, congenitally giant gonad. Phetric ataxia, uh, it's ga, like Lady Gaga. And you know how she walks on stage. That's what the Phetric ataxia is like <laughs> in high heels, I guess. Autosomal recessive, uh, ataxia gate. That's how this one remains. But I remember it like Frederick Ataxia. The walk is different, like Lady Gaga. Uh, you have Ataxia, Staggered Gait. You have Hammer Toes. You have Pest Cavus, Scoliosis. Most common cause of death is hypertrophic cardiomyopathy for Frederick Ataxia. Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. All right. Hopefully you want to read the book now. Okay, uh, autosomal trisomies. We have 10 pages to go. Autosomal trisomy. Autosomal monosomies are incompatible with life due to a high chance of expression of recessive traits for that chromosome. Incidence of trisomy. Down more than adverse than more than uh, fatal. You should know these because this will come again in. Uh, I think repro. Uh, okay, so Down syndrome, trisomy 21, single panel cleaves. Uh, finding is intellectual disability, flat faces. Uh, prominent epicanthal fold is the giveaway. So that's the buzzword. Uh, single palmar crease is also a buzzword. Uh, incurved fifth finger. Gap between first and second toe, duodenal atresia. They won't give you that as a buzzword, but they might just if they give you this, they probably already give you other stuff from which you could tell. Uh, Hirschsprung disease, congenital heart disease, brush field spots, whitish spot at the periphery of the iris. So Uh, Hirschsprung was, or Hirschsprung disease is when the neurons have not migrated all the way through to the intestine. So where it hasn't been uh, migrated, that part of the intestine is going to be dilated because it doesn't have, the muscles there don't have intervention. Um, so it doesn't contract or whatever. So that's what Hirschsprung is. You get uh, sometimes uh, the new neonate doesn't or a newborn doesn't uh, pass the stool so then you put plug in your finger so when you take your finger out it's going to be explosive that's how you know it's hard spun uh, congenital heart disease uh, atrial septal defect happens in down syndrome that's what it's known for uh, brush field spot, whitest spot of the periphery on, of the iris. Iris uh, associated with early onset Alzheimer's disease, chromosome 21 code for amyloid precursor protein. So increased risk of, uh, there's also an increased risk of AML and ALM. Acute myeloid leukemia and acute lymphoblastic leukemia. 95% uh, of the cases due to meiotic uh, non-disjunction, most commonly during meiosis one. This is the most important. Uh, you just need to know meiotic non-disjunction is the cause for Down syndrome. They don't test you which stage, but if they do, then most common is meiosis one. Increases with you know, advanced maternal age from one to one fifteen hundred, sorry, in females. Less than 20 to one by 25 in females, more than 45. 4% of cases due to unbalanced Robertsonian translocation, most typically in between chromosome 14 and 21. Only 1% of cases are due to post-fertilization, 
uh, mitotic error but it does happen and they do test you on that on these so 4% of the cases can happen because of unbalanced Robsonian translocation. You might look for this, but they don't give you that in the option. Then uh, you're gonna go for this one. Most typically between chromosome 14 and 21. But if they don't give you this, they don't give you this, then you're gonna go for uh, mitotic error or post-fertilization uh, mitotic error. Uh, that's the most they will ask you about this for biochem. For uh, CVS, they do test you on other stuff. And even Alzheimer's is common, so you should know that too. Okay, and drinking age is 21, so Down syndrome 4D. Uh, most common viable chromosomal disorder and most common cause of genetic intellectual disability. First trimester ultrasound commonly shows increased knuckle translucency and hypoplastic nasal bone. Markers for Down syndrome are high up. Uh, this is important. Increase in HCG, increase in inhibin. We'll come across this in pre-pro as well. Increase in risk of umbilical hernia, incomplete closure of umbilical grain. That's the reason. Uh, the five A's of Down syndrome, advanced maternal age, atresia for duodenum, atrial ventricular septal defect, Alzheimer's disease, AML, less than five years, uh, versus ALL for more than five years. Uh, Edward syndrome, uh, Prince Edward, uh, he's pretty metal, so he plays guitar, he rocks and rolls, that's how I remember it. And the rock and roll sign you do with hand is like the pinky and the pointing finger and the thumb is, you know, outwards while the middle two fingers is like downwards. That's the rocker sign, like rock and roll sign. So Prince Edward rocks pretty hard. That's how I remember that. Cause they give you this rocker bottom G and they also give you the clenched fist like this. So when they give you that or this, and they have, uh, which one? Yeah, small jaw, then you know it's Edward syndrome. So prominent occiput, uh, rocker bottom G, uh, feet, sorry, uh, intellectual disability, non-disjunction, clenched fist with overlapping fingers, low set ears, myrognithia, small jaw, congenital heart disease, for example, uh, ventricular septal defect, uh, omphalocele. Uh, here we only had a hernia, here we have an omphalocele. Myelomeningocele, that's smile. Um, Milo is for myelin, so that's your uh, spinal cord along with the meninges going out of the seal so that's out of the spinal cord cavity uh death usually occurs by age one election age is 18 so uh okay second most common autosomal trisomy resulting in live birth most common is down syndrome in adverse syndrome every prenatal screening marker decreases Uh, Patau syndrome, trisomy 13. Uh, this is the classic presentation for Patau. Uh, it's called cutis aplasia. Finding severe intellectual disability, rocker bottom feet, microphthalmia, microcephaly, cleft lip or cleft palate, holoprosencephaly, polydictyly, cutis aplasia, that's the buzzword because everything else can happen in other things too. Congenital heart disease, uh, polycystic kidney disease, and omphalocele as well. Death usually occurs by age one. Uh, puberty at uh, age 13. Defect in fusion of precordial mesoderm, midline defects. 
So it's uh, normally the question stem will have cleft lip or cleft palate, but if they don't, they might say there's a bald spot on the top of the head. And since he's young, it shouldn't be there normally. Or they might just give you outright that it's cutis as aplasia. Then you need to think of this. Uh, trisomy 13. Okay, so that's non disjunction in meiosis 1. That's basically you have chromosome on this side, chromosome on this side, the cells split. Here you only have one set of chromosome. Uh, here you have two sets right here. So meiosis 1 happens. They split. Then you were here, then meiosis 2 happens. So when meiosis 2 happens, these two split and you only get n minus 1, n minus 1 instead of 2. And here you get n plus 1 and n plus 1 instead of 2. So you have trisomy and monosomy. Uh, for non disjunction in 2, it's uh, the first separation was normal, but during the second separation, uh, the chromosome here failed to detach and it went along with this one so now you have n plus one here and minus one here but you have two normal ones on this side first trimester screening trisomy uh beta hcg and pa pp uh n21 they said uh inhibit and hcg increases so ACG increases in that, everything else decreases. But when you come here, you see it have an increase in only 21. Uh, nothing else. Mm -hmm. When they're giving you this, they're normally gonna ask you about Down. They're not gonna ask you about Patel or uh, Edwards, uh, Patel and Edwards. For Patel and Edwards, it's gonna be the classic presentations that you're gonna differentiate a bit. Uh, know this though, non disjunction in meiosis 1 and meiosis 2. What happens and when it happens, what happens? Okay, uh, genetic disorder by chromosome. Uh, I'll go through it once. Three is a three letter word. One, Hippolinda disease or renal cell carcinoma. Four is uh, polycystic kidney disease, autosomal dominant or achondroplasia or Huntington disease. Five is Kreidichet syndrome, uh, familial edematous polyposis, that's FAP, it's from JT. Kreidichet is, uh, I think we're gonna do that here. Uh, six, hemochromatosis. Uh, seven is Williams disease, I mean Williams syndrome. And cystic fibrosis, that's the important one. Uh, nine is Fedris ataxia and tuberous sclerosis. That's also important. Uh, by the end of FA, you will probably memorize this without even bothering memorizing right now. Uh, Eleven is Wilms tumor, uh, beta globin gene defects, sickle cell disease, beta thalassemia, MEN1. All of these happen there. At 13, we just did that, Patel syndrome, Wilson's disease. Uh, Wilson's is the one where, I think it's the one with the ears. Excess copper, okay. And I'm thinking of William. Just let me check this one. Yeah, that's the one, okay. They look like elf. What helps? But uh, Wilson's the copper one, retinoblastoma and BRCA2. Oh, that one. Uh, chromosome 15 is Freder Valley. Uh, syndrome, Angelman syndrome, Marfan syndrome. We already did this, so we should know that one. 16 is uh, autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease, one. 
this was 2 and number 4, 5. 4 times 4 is 16. So when you do it two times, then you get 16, I guess. Alpha globin gene defect gives you alpha thalassemia. Tuberculosis, this is, again, we already did tuberculosis over here at 9. <coughs> You flip it, you get six. You got a one in front of it. <laughs> you get two of those. Tuberous sclerosis, TSC2. Uh, 17 is neurofibromatosis type 1, BRCA1, TP53, uh, Lee Firmini syndrome. 18 is Edwards, we did that. 21 is Downs, we did that. Uh, 22 is neurofibromatosis type 2. So 2-2, two, two, you get that and you get DeGeorge syndrome. That's the one with uh, abnormal thymic gland. Uh, X is fragile X syndrome, X linked A gamma, gamma globinemia, and Klein factor syndrome, uh, which is trisomy of sex chromosome. Uh, Robertsonian translocation. Uh, that was 4% for Down syndrome. So what happens here is chromosome translocation that commonly involves chromosome pairs 21, 22, 13, 14, and 15. One of the most common type of translocation occurs when the long arms of two acrocentric chromosome or chromosomes with centromeres near their ends fuse at the centromere and the two short arms are lost. So here we have normal ones uh, right next to each other. Uh, Robertsonian translocation, what happened was where the gaps are, those two get attached. So this will replace this. So now you have the long arm of this attached to the long arm of this, where the short arm was. So now you have unbalanced gamut precursor. Occurs when the long arm of two acrocentric chromosome, chromosomes with centromeres, near the ends fused at the centromere of the two short arms are lost. So the short arms are lost, basically it's gone away, shoot. Uh, balanced translocations, no gain or loss of significant genetic material, normally do not cause abnormal phenotype. Unbalanced translocations, missing or extra genes, can result in miscarriage, stillbirth, and chromosomal imbalance. For example, Down syndrome and Patau syndrome. Unbalanced translocation missing or extra gene can result in miscarriage in chromosomal imbalance. Okay, so that's why you have Down syndrome and Patau syndrome. Robertsonian translocation as well. Cryduchette uh, it has a very typical presentation as well. Uh, it is a cry of the cat. So it sounds like a cry of the cat. Congenital deletion of the short arm of chromosome 5. We already went through that. Uh, 46XX or XY, 5T, whatever, is missing. Uh, findings are microcephaly, moderate to severe intellectual disability. These are still wake. These are still wake. Uh, high pitch crying is the buzzword for this. Uh, epigenthal folds, that's also vague. Uh, normally, it's going to be for Down syndrome when they give you epigenthal fold. But if they give you epigenthal with high pitch crying, you know it's this one. Uh, cardiac abnormalities, VSD, that also happens with Down. I cry when I'm very sad. Williams, okay, there it is. So, Williams is seven. Uh, they look like elves. Um, if you know the movie uh, Elf, it has Will, uh, Will Ferrell in it. That's his name. So Will Ferrell in Elf. So that's how I remember Will William's disease. Congenital a micro deletion of long arm of chromosome seven. Deleted region includes elastin gene, finding distinctive Elfian facies, intellectual disability, hypercalcemia, well-developed verbal skills, extreme friendliness and with strangers. 
uh, cardiovascular pro uh, problems like supravalvular aortic stenosis or renal artery stenosis. <coughs> okay. Hey, now we are in nutrition. Fun. Uh, let's take a break here. Essential fatty acids. Polyunsaturated fatty acids that cannot be synthesized in the body and must be provided in the diet. Nuts, uh, for example, nuts and seeds, plant oils, seafood. Uh, there's linoleic acid, that's omega-3, uh, uh, sorry, omega-6, which is metabolized to arachidonic acid, which serves as the precursor to leukotrienes and prostaglandins. Linolenic acid, uh, omega-3, and its metabolites have cardioprotective and anti-hyperlipidemic effects. In contrast, consumption of trans unsaturated fatty acids found in fast food promotes cardiovascular disease by increasing LDL and decreasing in HDL. Uh, so that's not good. We want the opposite of that. Okay. Uh, linoleic acid is omega 6, linoleic acid is omega 3. It has cardioprotective. I don't think this is test on, as far as I remember, but PUFA, that's what you have. Okay, vitamin fat soluble. Uh, we already know this, ADEK. Uh, we read it now uh, in cystic fibrosis. Uh, it, get, it does pancreatic insufficiency, so uh, you don't have fat soluble vitamins anymore. You have the deficiency of these. Absorption, dependent on bile emulsification pancreatic secretions, and intact ileum. Toxicity more common than for water-soluble vitamins because fat-soluble vitamins accumulate in fat. Uh, malabsorption syndromes with stetria. If fat is not being absorbed, it's going to get uh, excreted out in the stool. So you're going to see fat in stool. For example, cystic fibrosis and celiac disease. Uh, sometimes you have to, when you're talking about uh, GIT causes, you have to differentiate between these two when you see fat in stool. Or uh, mineral oil intake can cause fat-soluble vitamins deficiencies. It's fairly easy to differentiate between these two because you won't have recurrent ear infections like you do in this. this. Uh, Okay, or mineral oil intake can cause fat soluble vitamin deficiencies. Uh, okay, so vitamins. Water soluble vitamins are thymine uh, for B1, B2 is riboflavin, that's your tongue one, uh, B3 is your uh, sun sensitive skin, uh, polyalgeria or whatever, uh, B5, panto pantothenic acid, uh, it's involved in coenzyme A. Uh, I mean, it's involved in a lot of things. Uh, B6 is also involved in a lot of things. B7, uh, B6 is pyridoxin. B7 is biotin. Uh, you probably know about that. It's good for your hair, but too much of it is not. Uh, B9 is folate. You know about that. B12 is cobalamine. You know about that as well. Vitamins, uh, Vegetarians have deficiencies of these. Uh, C, ascorbic acid. Wash out easily for from body except B12 and B9. Why? Because B12 is stored in liver for approximately three to four years. Uh, and B9 stored in liver for approximately three to four months. Uh, B complex deficiencies often result in dermatitis, glossitis, and diarrhea. So if you have these three, you're going to think of a B-complex deficiency. It's going to be one of these. Uh, for dermatitis, it's going to be most likely niacin. Glossitis, most likely going to be riboflavin. For diarrhea, it could be any of them. Diarrhea is anyways very vague. Can be coenzymes. Uh, for example, ascorbic acid or precursor to coenzymes like FAD or NAD. We'll go over that. Uh, 
another thing I wanted to go over was was this thing. So when they say that B12 is stored in the liver for approximately three to four years and B9 is stored in liver for three to four months, it's important because uh, many symptoms of these two deficiencies overlap each other. So when you have someone who's newly turned into a vegan or a vegetarian, uh, you're going to see neurologic symptoms uh, sometimes if Sorry, you're going to see, what are you going to see? <laughs> you're going to see anemia, right? So for the anemia, you're going to then think of, okay, so it could be B12 anemia or it could be B9. How do you differentiate? You look how look at how long they have been a vegetarian or a vegan for. If it's been only like a few months, it most likely it's going to be B9 deficiency. But if it's been uh, for a couple of years, then it's going to be B12 deficiency because the symptoms only come in after that. Another way is if they're hinting towards B12, they're going to give you some kind of neurologic symptoms, like they feel vibrations in their hands or they stop feeling temperature in some parts of the body or they don't feel pinprick or, you know, they have ataxia or something like that. Uh, anything that tells you there's a neurologic symptom. Um, megaloblastic anemia is common between the two. Uh, homocysteine is also increased in between the two. Uh, methylmelanoic acid is increased for B12, but not B9. Why? Uh, when you look at the thing right here, Okay, so when you are uh, homocysteine, why is there a uh, buildup of that, right? Increase in that. When you have B12 deficiency, homocysteine is not going to get converted to methionine anymore, right? Because there is no B12. That's why you have buildup of this homocysteine. Uh, uh, so homocysteine, with the help of these, will go and make methylmelanoic coenzyme A. So you'll have methylmelanoic acid uh, urea, basically, right here, methylmelanoic acid urea, making methylmelanate. That's why you have increase of that in here. But however, in B9, you don't have uh, that. But why do you have increase in that over here? Because uh, you need B9 in one of the things here I think why I don't know I'm skipping on that right now we'll come across it when we do anyways uh, another thing that seems similar to this is they're gonna have some kind of deficiency they're gonna have uh, you're gonna pick up on that but uh, they're gonna have anemia as well but then you're gonna uh, they're gonna have neurologic symptom as well but they don't have megaloblastic anemia. They don't have hemocysteine buildup or homocysteine buildup or methylmalonic acid buildup. Then you're going to go for vitamin E. So that's how you differentiate between the three. That was the overview. Now let's go over it. Vitamin A includes retinol, retinol, and retinoic acid. This is also just like the other one I said, vitamin C. Uh, you use vitamin A for acne. Uh, so for severe cystic acne, you use isotrenitoin. For normal acne, uh, retinolis serum is good enough. Uh, if you want to do a skincare routine for that, so you would get 
uh, retinoceral function antioxidant constituent of visual pigments uh, retinol essential for normal differentiation of epithelial cells into specialized tissue uh, pancreatic cells mucus secreting cells prevent squamous metaplasia this is important uh, they'll ask you what uh, what is the first thing you give in something that has uh, squamous metaplasia uh, so you give vitamin E retinol is a vitamin A so think ret retin A used topically for wrinkles and acne so there you go uh, found in liver and leaf vegetables supplementation in vitamin A deficient measles patients may improve outcomes supplementation in vitamin A deficient measles patients may improve outcomes so if they have measles vitamin A deficient measles and you give this the outcome will be improved okay use oral isotrenitoin to treat severe cystic acne the thing about isotrenitoin is that it's really harsh and if someone of um, a woman of reproductive age is prescribed isotrenitoin before she's prescribed she's going to be prescribed to two pregnancy tests they have to make sure that she's not pregnant uh, so they do two pregnancy tests and then they prescribe oral isotrenitoin because it's very teratogenic uh, use all trans retinoic acid to treat acute promyelocytic leukemia. Uh, that's APL, uh, PML, sorry, acute PML. Uh, that's the only one they test you on when it comes to uh, ELL, I think. ELL? Sorry, AML? Yeah, AML. <laughs> it's in the name. Uh, so yeah for EML that's the only one they test you on uh, and they ask you what would you give to treat this then you would give vitamin A okay so say you don't have vitamin A what happens you get night blindness you get dry scaly skin remember scaly skin uh, xerosis cutis dry eyes xerophthalmia conjunctival uh, squamous metaplasia Bited spots, that's these things. Keratin debris, foamy appearance on conjunctiva. Corneal degradation, uh, sorry, degeneration. Uh, keratomalacia and immunosuppression. Uh, fairly easy. Everything gets dried up. You're gonna feel like uh, something, some kind of a debris in your eye. Uh, if you have a lot of vitamin A. Uh, I think it happens when you eat uh, animal liver, you get vitaminosis. Acute toxicity, nausea, vitamins, oh, uh, sorry, acute toxicity. So for that, you would have nausea, vomiting, increase in intracranial pressure. Uh, for example, vertical or blurry, blurred vision. Chronic toxicity, alopecia, and dry skin. This is the most common one that they'll uh, test you on. If they have dry skin, dry eye. It's something to do with uh, vitamin A. For example, scaliness, uh, hepatic toxicity and enlargement, arthralgia, and idiopathic intracranial uh, hypertension. Scaly skin, we saw that somewhere else as well. I'm trying to remember what it was. This is 64, okay. Oh yeah, we saw it in Refsum disease. Okay, so back to this. Let me just write that for next time.
Uh, okay, so chronic toxicity, alopecia, dry skin, for example, skillness, hepatic toxicity and enlargement, atheralgias, uh, idiopathic intracranial hypertension, teratogenic, cleft lip, cleft palate, cardiac abnormalities, therefore, a negative pregnancy test and two forms of contraceptions are required before isotretinoin. There you go. Okay, so you therefore a negative pregnancy test and two forms of contraception. Never mind, I got that backward. You do one pregnancy test and two forms of contraception are required before isotretinoin vitamin A derivative is prescribed because isotretinoin is teratogenic. There you go. Uh, okay, I'm back. What a B one. B one is thymine. Uh, its function is in thymine pyrophosphate. PPP. Uh, call factor for several dehydrogenase uh, enzyme reaction. So brand chain. So let's go through each one of those. So there's brand chain right here. Uh, brand chain keto acid. So that's timing is required for that. So I didn't that there. That's this one that goes into this. Uh, with the help of this, it goes into uh, propanyl coenzyme A, into methanyl, into succinyl coenzyme A. So when you see citric acid cycle, if I have this. Uh, when it comes here, you see R chain, carbon fat chains, uh, fatty acid right here, into succinyl coenzyme A. Uh, it says it required for dehydrogenase right here, uh, alpha ketoglutrate dehydrogenase, time independent next thing as well. So we did alpha ketoglutrate, we did branching. There's pyruvate dehydrogenase links glycolysis to TCA. So that's this thing right here. Uh, pyruvate dehydrogenase. I also leave it there. Uh, so after this whole thing happens, pyruvate with uh, in presence of oxygen goes into mitochondria uh, with the help of PDH and becomes acetyl coenzyme A. And but this thing it requires time. So did that and transketolase HMP shunt. I don't think I have HMP shunt. Okay. I don't have each of the shunt. Uh, this is just the thing. But uh, transketolase is the one that's uh, responsible for the conversion of ribose to the other derivatives of glucose, I think. I can just switch it. This one. Okay, there you go. Transketolase. So ribose five p with uh, transketolase uh, becomes fructose six p or glyceraldehyde three p or yeah. When after it becomes glyceraldehyde three p, it go. You can go from here glyceraldehyde three p right there. Uh, back into glycolysis, or it can go the other way and go into the triglyceride formation of fatty acid formation with TAP. But yeah, so this thing also requires timing. So if you see HMP shunt with transketolase, you know timing is required. If you see citric acid cycle, uh, you know uh, in dehydrogenase, it's required in alpha keto dehydrogenase.
so you know that requires timing uh, any dehydrogenase most probably requires it like isocytrate dehydrogenase um, another dehydrogenase but what we get tested on is on this one upper cuticle uh, so prior dehydrogenase when you're talking about glycolysis uh, you know you're talking about that it requires that and transcutulates okay so deficiency of thymine impaired glucose breakdown atp depletion worsened by glucose infusion highly aerobic tissue uh, for example brain heart are affected first okay so impaired glucose breakdown so when the glycolysis doesn't happen properly ATP depletion worsened by glucose infusion when you put in more glucose. Uh, highly aerobic tissues like brain and heart are affected first. In patients with chronic alcohol overuse or malnutrition, give thymine before dextrose to decrease the risk of precipitating Wernicke encephalopathy. This, this question is asked a lot. Uh, this question is asked a lot. Uh, a person is found unconscious or in a drunken state and then uh, he's brought in. They do a blood test and he's hypoglycemic. So they give him dextrose. But then he worsens after a few minutes. Why? It's because he needed to. You need to give him time because he's suffering from when he came to uh, Yeah. There's also a similar one where they give them uh, aniseline, uh, but the reason he becomes worse is because of the degeneration of myelin fibers because of the amount that was given in short duration. Uh, you're supposed to give it very slowly if you're going to give it in that case to avoid uh, myelin degeneration. Okay, uh, so we did that. Deficiency impaired glucose breakdown will cause this, this, this. Give timing before dextrose to decrease risk of precipitating Wernicke and supposedly diagnosis made by increase in RBC transcutylase activity following vitamin B1 administration. Okay, uh, disorder and characteristics of Wernicke encephalopathy. So what is Wernicke encephalopathy? It's acute, reversible, life-threatening neurologic condition. Symptoms are confusion, ophthalmoplegia, nystagmus, ataxia, or corona. Corona is associated with a lot of things these days. But uh, C for confusion, O for ophthalmoplegia, nystagmus, ataxia B, coronal B, okay. But anyways, you know, like someone who drinks a lot, they're going to start getting confused. Uh, you'll see their eyes uh, twitch. You're going to see their gait, walking gait is different. So that's what this is. Uh, then you have Korsakoff syndrome. This was mostly physical stuff. This stuff and this, but this can be, I guess, neural stuff. Yeah, this is gonna be mostly neural stuff. So you get amniotic uh, disorder due to chronic alcohol overuse, presents with confabulation. That's just making up stories and keeps talking about random stuff. Personality changes. Uh, and memory loss, permanent memory loss. So it's all about amnesia and neuro symptoms. Uh, Wernicke Korsakoff syndrome is a combination of both. There's a damage to medial dorsal nucleus of thalamus, uh, which is responsible for a lot of things. Uh, memory bodies. Uh, that's the one you might have to point this out in a diagram where memory 
disciplinary body is. So let's look at that. So that's where it is. That's the easiest diagram. Go to Bing. Bada Bing. Okay. So there you have seven minutes. So it's zero to B eight zero. That's the one thing they don't have on this diagram. Perfect. That thing right there. So now uh, this is your hypothalamus. This is your thalamus. Hypothalamus right under it, and right under hypothalamus you have memory body. So don't get it confused with uh, pineal gland. Uh, we'll do that in CMS, but pineal gland is somewhere here. Okay, okay. okay so damage to medial dorsal nucleus of thalamus, mammillary bodies, medial dorsal nucleus. I'm just trying to remember what this was. Let me go back to CMS. Okay, they haven't given it. But basically what it is, is part of this. So it's responsible to, for the movement of afferent and efferent fibers, I guess. Afferent fibers, not efferent. Oh no. Okay. Okay, so presentation is combination of Wernicke, encephalopathy, and Corsal syndrome. Dry beriberi is polyneuropathy. Uh, symmetric muscle rest wasting. When the heart is not uh, involved, it's called dry bleeding. When you have high output cardiac failure, so you have a lot of hypertension or something, uh, blood volume, you have high output uh, cardiac failure due to systemic vasodilation. That's why. So that's called wet beriberi. Dry beriberi is uh, neural. So polyneuropathy, you have, you either don't sense stuff in your limbs or it pains. Symmetric muscle wasting. Spell very, very as bear one, bear one to remember vitamin B1. So all of this was for thymine. Now we do B2, riboflavin. That's the tongue one. Because uh, it has ribs. Uh, and you eat ribs and you taste it with your tongue so uh, and your mouth so it's gonna that's what riboflavin is for b2 function components of flavins fad and fmn uh, used as cofactor in redox reaction for example the succinate dehydrogenase reaction in the tca let's go to tca Uh, redox reaction, the succinate dehydrogenase uh, 
in the thesis. So FAD and FMN are derived from riboflavin uh, B2, two ATPs, it gives out two ATPs. Everything usually gives out two ATPs for the curve. Uh, so FAD right there, FAD is riboflavin. That's the only thing that makes that, uses FAD. So that's main dehydrogenase. Uh, if you don't have riboflavin, uh, the deficiency you're gonna get chilosis. That's inflammation of the lips, scaling and fissures at the corner of the mouth. You're gonna get magenta tongue. Like uh, say you have ribs with barbecue sauce on it and you get a magenta tongue then. Uh, and corneal vascularization. I may be wrong because I'm a vegetarian myself, so I don't know, but that's how I imagine magenta tongue with riboflavin. Corneal vascularization, the two C's and B2s. Okay. Then we go on to niacinamide, uh, sorry, niacin. Uh, vitamin B3. Okay. So that's your nicotinic acid, uh, constituents of NAD, NADP. So that's this thing right here, NAD, NAD. P would be in, uh, what's in HMP shown, by the way. So it's used in redox reaction and as cofactor of dehydrogenase. Uh, it's here, isocyclic dehydrogenase, alpha beta dehydrogenase, and malate dehydrogenase all use this. Uh, okay, derived in uh, derived from tryptophan. Uh, synthesis requires vitamin B two and B six. That's pyridoxin. Uh, used to treat dyslipidemia. Uh, so it decreases ELDL and it increases HDL. That's why you would use it. And indeed, derived from niacin. Uh, this is what's usually tested on. The giveaway here would be your this thing right here, the rash. So deficiency of this will give you glossitis. Uh, severe deficiency of B3 leads to pellagra. That's the, the presentation of pellagra is the buzzword for vitamin B3 or niacin deficiency, which can also be caused by heart and up disease, malignant carcinoid syndrome because then you have increased tryptophan metabolism. Uh, increase in tryptophan metabolism uh, causes increase in serotonin synthesis and isoniazid also causes uh, niacin deficiency. It causes decrease in vitamin B6. Uh, we'll come across that later, but let me see if I can find it. There it is. Okay, so tryptophan makes serotonin uh, in the presence of B6. And it also makes niacin in the presence of B6. Right, but say you don't have uh, B2, then it's not gonna make niacin, it's gonna make this instead, serotonin. And when you have more serotonin, you're gonna get melatonin, right? So that's what they're talking about. Wait, B2, they're talking about B3. Okay, so you need B2 and B6 to make B3, okay. So what are they saying? When you have, uh, acid and dependent B6, okay. Symptoms of B3 deficiency, pellagra, the three Ds. The three Ds are diarrhea, dementia, and hallucination, uh, and dermatitis. So when you have these three things, it's deficiency of niacin. Uh, C3 and C4, dermatome, circumferential, 
border collar rash. They're gonna have the rash right here. Uh, it's usually because it's sun exposed area. And that's how they're gonna explain it in the presentation, sun exposed area rash. Uh, hyperpigmentation of sun exposed limb, limbs. Uh, heart and diseases, autosomal recessive, deficiency of neutral amino acid, uh, for example, tryptophan. Uh, transporter in proximal renal tubular cells and on enterocytes, which leads to neutral as amino aciduria and decreased absorption from the gut, which leads to decrease in a tryptophan for conversion to niacin, which leads to pellagra like symptoms. Treat with high protein diet and nicotinic acid. Pellagra equals D3 yellow star. Okay, so here what they were saying was. In malignant carcinoid syndrome, uh, it's known for serotonin uh, synthesis. Like you get increased level of serotonin in carcinoid syndrome. That's what it's known for. But it doesn't just make it. It makes it with the use of tryptophan. So if tryptophan is being used up for serotonin, it doesn't. there's no tryptophan left to make niacin from. So that's why you have niacin deficiency in carcinoid syndrome. Okay. Uh, access facial flushing induced by prostaglandin, not histamine. Uh, okay, can avoid by taking aspirin with niacin. Hyperglycemia you get with excess uh, niacin and hyperuricemia. Podagra that is vitamin B3 overdose. OD for podagra. Okay. What is podagra? Well, arthritis, I said your pain is good. Okay, it just means gout. It's the big toe, okay. So you get that in hyperuricemia as well, okay. Uh, YMB5, also called pentothenic acid. B5 is pentothenic acid. Function is component of coenzyme A. Uh, coenzyme A, uh, cofactor for SR transferase and fatty acid synthase. Deficiency of this is going to cause dermatitis, enteritis, alopecia, adrenal insufficiency may lead to burning feet sensation, burning feet symptom, uh, distal paresthesia, and dysthesia. So the buzzword over here is the obviously burning sensation of feet or abnormal. That's mostly what they're going to give uh, burning feet syndrome. Or they feel like their feet are burning, the patient describes it that way. But they could say that uh, they don't feel stuff in their limbs or feet or, you know, like that. But this is going to be a buzzword for this, none of this will help you because you can see this in other stuff too. Uh, vitamin B6, uh, also called pyridoxin. Function, converted to pyridoxal phosphate, a cofactor used in transamination, uh, ELT and EST, decarboxylation uh, reactions, glycogen phosphorylase, uh, synthesis of glutathione, uh, cytokine, uh, heme, niacin, histamine, and neurotransmitters, including serotonin, epinephrine, and neuroepinephrine, dopamine, and GABA. So this thing is used in almost everything you can think of. And so I don't think it's useful to remember which things B6 is used, but the chart that we use for niacin uh, will come across it. Uh, that will go over the mo majority of B6 juices. Uh, deficiency of this will cause convulsions, hyperactivity, peripheral neuropathy, deficiency inducible by isoniazid and oral contraceptives, citroplastic anemia due to impaired hemoglobin synthesis and iron access.
fibroblastic anemia because due to impaired hemoglobin synthesis and iron. Since iron is used for hemoglobin, when you don't have hemoglobin being made, then the iron is just going to stick around. Okay, um, B7, uh, also called biotin, cofactor for carboxylation enzymes, which adds a one carbon group. So you use this for gluconeogenesis and pyruvate carboxylase, gluconeogenesis, pyruvate 3C will help make oxaloacetate. So let's look at that. Uh, it's even written, pyruvate carboxylase, biotin, B7. Uh, SL coenzyme A carboxylase, fatty acid synthesis, uh, SL coenzyme A, and melanyl coenzyme A. fatty acid synthesis so in fatty acid synthesis melanin coins i mean you need uh since co2 is being added carboxylation is going to happen you need biotin for that right there you need it for what else when okay so the coins i mean two goes to melanin coins so when this thing goes into this okay you need this uh, melanin coenzyme A, side note, it's important because it inhibits carnitin acetyl transferase. So when synthesis is happening, you don't want degradation to happen as well. So uh, it's prevented by melanin coenzyme A. It will inhibit carnitin acetyl transferase, so degradation doesn't take place. That is being asked on you world, so that's it. Um, Propionyl coenzyme A carboxylase, fatty acid oxidation, and branch chain uh, acid, amino acid breakdown. So, propionyl, we already went over that. Amino acid, we looked at this chart. So, there's your propionyl coenzyme A. It makes methyl melanyl coenzyme A in the presence of biotin because propionyl coenzyme A carboxylase needs it. Uh, yeah, these three things require biotin. Almost anything that has uh, carboxylase will need biotin. So deficiency of biotin, uh, it's relatively rare, uh, but it will cause, again, same thing as this, what, this thing right here, dermatitis, enteritis, alopecia. Dermatitis, enteritis, alopecia. Uh, caused by long-term antibiotic use or excessive ingestion of raw uh, egg whites. So they might, they don't usually test us on this, but they might say that there's a trainer who eats raw eggs uh, after workout. And he's been suffering from a few rashes and upset stomach or something. Then you're gonna, they're hinting towards biotin that way. Uh, B9, that's folate. Uh, converted to tetrahydrofolic acid or THF, a coenzyme for one carbon transfer methylation reaction. Important for the synthesis of nitrogenous bases in DNA and RNA. We already looked at that, the P1. This one. Right there, dihydrofolic reductase uh, to make THF. Uh, okay. And folate deficiency timing reduces apoptosis. Look at this, okay. Uh, converted to tetrahydrofolic acid, a coenzyme for one carbon methylation. Important for the synthesis of nitrogen bases in the DNA and RNA, found in leafy green vegetables, also produced by gut microbiota. Uh, folate observed in uh, geninum, thank foliage in the gin, June gill. Okay, jejungle. Foliage in jejungle. Mm -hmm. Small reserve pool stored primarily in the liver for three to four months. Deficiency in macrocytic megaloblastic anemia, hypersegmented. Polymorphonuclear cells, PMNs, glossitis, 
no neurologic symptoms as opposed to vitamin B12 deficiency. Labs, increased homocysteine, normal methylmalonoic acid levels seen in chronic alcohol overuse and in pregnancy. So the deficiency of folate, you get a lot of things like macrocytosis, megaloblastic anemia, hypersegmented polymorphonuclear cells, PMNs, glossitis. Uh, the PMNs, you see it in this as well. Here we go. Hypersegmented polymorphonuclear neutrophils, sorry. Uh, so you see it in vitamin B12 as well, as in folate acid. Oh. Deficiency, okay. Uh, glossitis, no neurologic symptoms as opposed to B12. That's how you differentiate between the two. In labs, you're going to have increased homocysteine, normal methyl melanoic acid levels. You're going to have increased as normal lab. Let me just bring it up here. Okay, so seen in chronic alcohol overuse and in pregnancy, the deficiency of folate. Deficiency can be caused by several drugs, for example, phenytoin, trimethorphine, methotrexate. That's the one that they use in this in use to inhibit uh, methotrexate, trimethorphine by methotrexate. So, trimethorphine, methotrexate. You don't have pyrimethamine because that's for protozoa, but phenytoin, okay. Uh, supplemental folic acid at least one month prior to conception and during pregnancy to decrease risk of neural tube defects. So supplement folic acid at least one month prior to conception and during pregnancy to reduce the risk of neural tube defects. That is important. Give vitamin B9 for the nine months of pregnancy and one month prior to conception. So this is usually not that easy, but if it's planned, then this can happen, but it's you should do it for the nine months of pregnancy though. Uh, vitamin B12. Oh, I think we are 10 minutes left. Yeah. Uh, B12, also called cobalamin, functions uh, cofactor for methionine synthase. Uh, transfer CH3 groups as methyl cobalamin and methyl melanyl coenzyme A mutase, important for DNA synthesis. Uh, deficiencies macrocytic megaloblastic anemia. Uh, megaloblastic anemia. Hypersegmented uh, polymorph neutrophils, uh, paraspasias, and subacute combined degeneration, degeneration of dorsal columns, lateral corticospinal tracts, and spinocerebellar tracts due to abnormal myelin associated with increased serum, homocysteine, and methylmelanoic acid levels, along with secondary folate deficiency. Prolonged deficiency leads to irreversible nerve damage. Uh, we already went over that, so here you have B12 for methionine synthase. Then THA equals THF and homocysteine goes on to become methionine. From homocysteine, you need B6 to become cysteine. Uh, Methylmelanoic coenzyme A, B12 makes succinyl coenzyme A, B6 is heme. Okay. Found in animal products, synthesized only by intestinal microbiota, site of synthesis in humans. Site of synthesis in humans is distal to site of absorption, thus, B12 must be consumed by animal products. That's why uh, deficiency happens in 
vegetarians. Very large reserve pool, several years, stored primarily in the liver, deficiency caused by malabsorption, uh, for example, sprue or enteritis, uh, diphylobotrium latum, achlorhydria, bacterial overgrowth, or alcohol overuse, lack of intrinsic factor, pernicious anemia, gastric bypass surgery, absence of terminal ileum, surgical resection, for example, for Crohn's disease. Certain drugs like metformin or insufficient intake, for example, veganism, B9, folate supplementation can mask the hematologic symptoms of B12 deficiency, but not the neurologic symptoms. We'll run over that too. Fatty acids with odd number of genes. Okay. I'll take a break here and then we only have one. So vitamin C, also called ascorbic acid. Uh, function as antioxidant, also facilitates iron absorption by reducing it to Fe2 plus state. Necessary for hydroxylation of proline and lysine and collagen synthesis. Necessary for dopamine beta hydroxylase. It converts dopamine to NE. Dopamine to NE. Okay. Uh, it's found in fruits and vegetables, pronounced ascorbic, absorbic acid. Ancillary, ancillary treatment for methemoglobinemia by reducing Fe3 plus to Fe2 plus. Uh, deficiency of this causes scurvy. That's what's tested on mostly. So you have swollen gum, easy bruising, pateshi, uh, hematrosis, anemia, poor wound healing, perifollicular and subperiosteal hemorrhages, corkscrew hair. Okay, so corkscrew hair, you have that here. Uh, weakened immune response. Deficiency may be uh, precipitated by tea and toast diet. Vitamin C deficiency causes scurvy due to collagen hydroxylation defect. So, quote, screwed hair. This is what cork screw hair looks like. Okay. Uh, if you have access of vitamin C, what happens? Uh, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, fatigue, calcium, oxalate, nephrolithiasis, access, uh, oxalate, oxalate from vitamin C metabolism. Can increase iron toxicity in predisposed individuals by increasing dietary iron absorption. For example, can worsen hemochromatosis or transfusion related iron overload. Nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, fatigue, calcium, oxalate, and nephrolithiasis excess oxalate from vitamin C metabolism can increase iron toxicity and predisposed individuals by increasing dietary iron absorption. That is, it can worsen hemochromatosis or transfusion related iron deficiency overload. Vitamin D. Okay, so vitamin D. D3 is cholecalciferol from exposure of skin, stratum basal uh, to sun. From exposure of skin to sun, you get D3. Uh, ingestion of fish, milk, and plants. D2, argocalciferol. From ingestion of plants, fungi, and yeast. Both converted to 25 hydroxyl uh, D3 uh, storage form in liver and to active form 125 OH2 D3, which is calcitriol in kidney. This is the active form. Calcitriol is the active form. And storage form is 25. So if you have one in front of it, it's active. 
function increase in intestinal absorption of calcium and phosphate increase in bone mineralization at low levels and increase in bone resorption at high levels so at low levels vitamin d uh, builds the bone but at high level vitamin d reabsorbs the bones regulation is uh, it's regulated by increase in pth decrease in calcium or decrease in phosphate they all lead to increase in active form of vitamin d production 125 uh, oh2 d3 or calcitriol feedback inhibits its own production increase in pth leads to increase in calcium reabsorption and decrease phosphate or reabsorption in the kidney uh, deficiency will lead to rickets in children deformity such as genoverm bow legs osteomalacia in adults bone pain and muscle weakness hypocalcemic titany caused by malabsorption decreased sun exposure poor kid poor diet chronic kidney disease advanced liver disease give oral vitamin d to breastfed infants darker skin and prematurity predisposed to deficiency excess hypercalcemia hypercalciuria loss of appetite stupor seen in granulomatous diseases increase in activation of vitamin d by epithelioid macrophages uh, so you have diet here uh, either by that or by by sun you get d3 they all go to the liver uh, in storage form and then it gets activated in the kidneys uh, in the so calcium okay so the active form uh, it gets activated by one alpha hydroxylase so if there's low calcium or low phosphate group or even increase in PTH they all will cause uh, activation of one alpha hydroxylase. Oh. Okay. Uh, one alpha hydroxylase. So then you have this in bone, intestine, renal tubular cells. Bone, uh, vitamin D, it causes increase in calcium and phosphate release from bone, increased absorption of calcium and phosphate, and reabsorption of increase in calcium, increase in phosphate. Urine, uh, you have decreased calcium and decreased phosphate in urine. So they all will result in increase in calcium and phosphate. Uh, seen in granulomatous disease, increase in activation of vitamin D by epithelioid macrophages. Vitamin E includes tocopherol and tocotrienol. Function antioxidants, protects RBCs and neuronal membranes from free radical damage. And deficiency, hemolytic, if you have uh, deficiency of vitamin E, you get hemolytic uh, anemia, acanthosis, acanthocytosis muscle weakness demyelination of posterior columns uh, decrease proprioception and vibration senses and spinal cerebellar tract or ataxia neurologic presentation may appear similar to vitamin b12 deficiency but without megaloblastic anemia hypersegmented neutrophils and increase in serum methylmalonic acid levels access risk of enterocolitis in infants with access of vitamin e so risk of enterocolitis in infants with access of vitamin e high dose supplementation may, may alter metabolism of vitamin k which leads to enhanced anticoagulant effects of warfarin high dose supplementation may alter metabolism of vitamin k so enhanced anticoagulant effect of warfarin Vitamin K includes phytomenidione, phyloquinone, phytonidione, menaquinone, 
function uh, activated by epoxide reductase to reduce form, which is a cofactor for the gamma carboxylation of glutamic acid residue on various proteins required for blood clotting, synthesized by intestinal microbiota. K is for coagulation. It's necessary for maturation of uh, clotting factors 2, uh, 7, 9, and 10, and protein CNS. Porphyrin inhibits uh, vitamin K uh, dependent synthesis of these factors and proteins. Uh, deficiency neonatal hemorrhage with increased uh, prothrombin and activated prothrombin time but normal bleeding time uh, neonates so that's how you differentiate between this and any other cause of bleeding uh, for hemorrhage so you have increase in PT and increase in ABTT but normal bleeding time uh, Neonates have sterile intestines and are unable to synthesize vitamin K. So you give them vitamin K. Uh, you administer vitamin K when they're born. Can also occur after prolonged use of broad spectrum antibiotics. Uh, it's not in breast milk. So breastfed infants don't know about vitamin D and K. Neonates are given vitamin K injection at birth to prevent hemorrhagic disease of the newborn. Uh, zinc. Uh, function. Mineral essential for the activity of 100 plus enzymes. Important in the formation of zinc fingers. Transcription factor motif. Uh, deficiency. Delayed wound, wound healing. Suppressed immunity. Male hypogonadism. Decreased adult hair, axillary facial pubic, dysgeusia and anosmia, associated with acrodermatitis, enteropithica, uh, that's this, defect in uh, intestinal zinc absorption, may predispose to alcoholic cirrhosis. Uh, for this, uh, they ask about the zinc fingers, and I already went over it, but I'll do that again. Uh, it's this thing, uh, the zinc finger binding domains on DNA. They bind directly to progesterone, estrogen, uh, steroid, thyroid hormone, fat soluble vitamins, and aldosterone. Uh, other than that, I don't think they ask about zinc deficiency that much. Uh, protein energy malnutrition. Uh, Quasha core. Protein malnutrition resulting in skin lesions you have edema due to decreased plasma oncotic pressure due to low serum albumin liver malfunction fatty fatty change due to decreased lipoprotein synthesis and deposition clinical feature picture is small child with swollen abdomen so that's what the stem question stem is going to have as well uh question core results from protein deficient meals uh, malnutrition edema anemia fatty liver and skin lesions uh, hyperkeratosis or dispigmentation uh, mermis is malnutrition not causing edema diet is deficient calories but no nutrients are entirely absent so it's just the calories for mermis you give them food and it'll fix, uh, it'll basically treat it. Uh, Mermis results in muscle wasting. MB. Okay, uh, in this one, they seem healthy, but when you look into it, you'll find that they're suffering from cholesterol. They look healthy because of edema. Uh, okay, ethanol. Metabolism. Uh, we'll go over this. Uh, increase in NADH or NAD ratio inhibits TCA cycle, which leads to increase in ester coenzyme A used in ketogenesis, uh, ketoacidosis, lipogenesis, hepatocystis, 
steatosis. Female are more susceptible than male to eff to effects of alcohol due to decreased activity of gastric alcohol dehydrogenase, decrease in body size, decrease in percentage of water and body weight. NAD is the limiting reagent. Alcohol dehydrogenase operates via zero order kinetics. Uh, oh, sorry. Okay, NAD is the limiting reagent. Alcohol dehydrogenase operates via zero order kinetics. Ethanol metabolism increase in NADH and NAD ratio in liver causing uh, one lactic acidosis. So increase in pyruvate conversion to lactate to fasting hypoglycemia uh, decrease in gluconeogenesis due to increase in conversion of oxaloacetate to malate uh, okay so for this i think i have I don't have the NADH and NAD. Okay, we'll just go through it then. Uh, for lactic acidosis, increase in pyruvate conversion to lactate. You already know that over here. Uh, let me just send, take a photo and send it to myself. Okay, so when you have alcohol and uh, alcohol dehydrogenase, it makes acetaldehyde uh, in presence of NAD. So NAD will turn into NADH, and acetaldehyde will turn into acetate. Again, NAD turns into NADH. So you will have a lot of NADH. Since you have a lot of NADH, it's going to affect a certain amount of functions. Uh, while we're here, Fomipizole inhibits alcohol dehydrogenase. Acetaldehyde, uh, it's converted by cytochrome P452. And acetaldehyde dehydrogenase, it's inhibited by disulfiron. Uh, it discourages drinking by increasing uh, hangover symptoms, disulfiron. Okay. So now from this, we learned that there will be a lot of NADH. So how does that affect everything else? So in glycolysis, uh, when you have a lot of NADH, what's going to happen is it's going to make more and more pyruvate because NADH gets converted to NAD and NAD will make more and more of this. Also, NADH gets converted to NAD here as well. So it will turn pyruvate into lactate. So this is why you get lactic acidosis as explained here. Lactic acidosis, increasing pyruvate conversion to the lactate. Then you have fasting hypoglycemia, uh, decreasing gluconeogenesis due to increased conversion of oxaloacetate to malate. So let's look at that. Gluconeogenesis. Uh, oxaloacetate is right here. Okay, so and it's converted to malate. Malate will then get converted to oxalacetate, PEP, pyruvate, and here NADH gets converted to lactate. Here NADH gets converted to glycerol 3P again. So I guess that's what they mean. Uh, let me see. fasting whatever, so what's our idea thing? Okay, so from PEP, it gets converted to oxaloacetate to malate again. Okay. Oh, so we should look at that then. Citric acid. 
Okay, so okay, so when you have NADH, uh, oxaloacetate will get reversed and go reverse, make NAD and turn into malate, and then it will go into gluconeogenesis from there. Okay, that's what they mean. Uh, ketoacidosis, diversion of acetyl coenzyme A into ketogenesis rather than TCA cycle. Okay, so when you have acetyl coenzyme A, it might come from here, from fatty acid, or it can go into fatty acid synthesis, acetyl coenzyme A, right there. Uh, but the, I mean, put that over here. Ketogenesis. Okay, there you go. So here, in the presence of NADH, acetoacetate becomes 3-hydroxybutyrate. And similarly, okay, that's it. Over here. This is not reversible. So you have that there. So ketogen ketoacidosis, diversion of isocoenzyme into ketogenesis rather than TCA cycle. Hepatostatosis. Uh, increased conversion of TAP to glycerol 3P. We went over that one already. And gluconeogenesis over here. From DAP to glycerol 3P. Uh, it's given here too. All of that, but I look at the notes anyways, so I'm not going to go over that. Uh, for a acetyl coenzyme A diverges into a fatty acid synthesis, which combines with glycerol 3P to synthesize triglyceride. Fomipazole, a uh, competitive inhibitor of alcohol dehydrogenase, preferred antidote for overdose of methanol or ethylene glycol. Alcohol dehydrogenase has higher affinity for ethanol than for methanol or ethylene glycol, which leads to ethanol. Can be used as competitive inhibitor of alcohol dehydrogenase to treat methanol or ethylene glycol poisoning. Uh, disulfiram blocks acetaldehyde dehydrogenase, which increases. Uh, let me just bring that here. Okay. So, for me, first of all, we already did that. That's this thing. It inhibits alcohol dehydrogenase over here. Disulfuron uh, blocks acetaldehyde dehydrogenase, increases acetaldehyde, uh, which increases angle syndrome and discouraging drinking. And you're done with that. And now we're on to metabolism. All right. Biochemistry, metabolism, uh, enzyme terminology. An enzyme's name often describes its function. For example, glucokinase is an enzyme that catalyzes the phosphorylation of glucose using a molecule of ATP. The following are commonly used enzyme descriptors. So if you have kinase, it catalyzes transfer of a phosphate group from a high mo uh, energy molecule, usually ATP, to a substrate like phos uh, phosphofructokinase, uh, PFK. That's the PFK1 that we just went over. Uh, phosphorylase uh, adds inorganic phosphate onto substrate without using ATP. Uh, phosphorylase adds inorganic phosphate onto substrate without using ATP. Glycogen phosphorylase. There's phosphatase, removes phosphate group from substrate. Uh, so fructose one six uh, bisphosphatase one, so it takes off the phosphate group from this. So it, then you get over here, and that happens. Uh, it goes into this when you take out the thing here. There's the kinase right there as well. So you have that. Okay. Uh, dehydrogenase. Catalyzes oxidation reduction uh, reactions like pyruvate dehydrogenase. Uh, hydroxylase adds hydroxyl group onto substrate tyrosine hydroxylase. Uh, carboxylase is transfer of 
carbon dioxide groups with the help of biotin, like pyruvate carboxylase. We went over that too. Um, mutase relocates a functional group within a molecule. Uh, vitamin B12 dependent methyl melanyl coenzyme A mutase. Uh, methyl melanyl. Okay, that's the one we went over oh, over here. And amino acid. Okay, so this one right here, that's the mutase they're talking about. Methyl melanyl coenzyme. It requires B12 as well. So that's why I'm saying B12 dependent. Uh, synthase and synthetase joins two molecules together using a source of energy, ATP, acetyl coenzyme A, nucleotide sugar. Uh, these are not really tested on. It's just something you should know for your bases, to be clear. So I'm not going to spend too much time going over it. Uh, rate determining enzymes of metabolic processes. So these are the rate limiting. We'll go over this. This is important. So in glycolysis, it's PFK1. Uh, okay, so let's look at that first. Uh, PFK1 right there. Oh, sorry. Okay. So... PFK1, that's this thing. It's saying that uh, AMP will uh, activate glycolysis uh, or PFK1. So it's the same thing. Uh, glycolysis will go forward. Uh, fructose 2,6-bisphosphate will also activate this or stimulate it. That's this thing right here, fructose 2,6-bisphosphate. So that plus AMP. So if you have too much of AMP, you need uh, more ATP conversion. So that's why you're going to do this to eventually go into TCA cycle. Uh, ATP, if you have too much ATP already, then you don't really need it because you have access of ATP. So you don't need energy. So the uh, breakdown of glucose will stop. You don't really require it. Uh, and citrate is also going to inhibit this. Uh, citrate is from the TCA cycle. Uh, let's look at TCA cycle. So citrate. Uh, so it's known for this fatty acid. So just makes sense of it somehow. <laughs> uh, gluconeogenesis. Okay, let's look at gluconeogenesis. Okay, so you have fructose 1,6-bisphosphate, 1, so that's over here. Okay, there you go. I already knew. Uh, AMP inhibits this, so gluconeogenesis is making of more glucose, right? Uh, okay, so AMP inhibits this. Uh, fructose 2,6-bisphosphate. Okay, that will inhibit it. It's not given here. So you gotta memorize that one. Uh, TCA cycle. No. Okay, uh, TCA cycle. Uh, for people who just joined us, it's uh, this is just a mnemonic to remember it. So can I keep selling sex for money officer? That's what it is. Uh, isocitrate dehydrogenase. That's this thing right here. Uh, ADP uh, activates that. So, okay. And ATP, because you have ATP 
already you don't need more ATV because each one of these conversions uh, gives off approximately two ATPs. So that's what TCA cycle is known for. So if you already have ATP, you don't really need more. So that's going to inhibit it. Uh, similarly, NADH will inhibit it. If you have too much NADH, uh, it's not going to go on and on because here you see if you have too much NADH, it's going to go backwards like that. Uh, yeah. These ones don't go reverse. They're not reversible, but it won't go further than here. Uh, glycogenesis. Okay. I don't. I have the thing for this, but it's not really that good. So uh, this is the metabolism, but if you just look at backwards, <laughs> it's the synthesis. Okay, it might make sense. We'll check it out. Uh, okay, so glycogenesis it requires glycogen synthase so that's glycogen synthase right there uh, so insulin uh, activates it it's already given here what else activates this is uh, glucose 6-phosphate uh, that will activate it that is from HMP shunt well we should look at that since I don't have it So right there. Okay, so where were we? Uh, glucose six phosphate, right? So glucose six phosphate is right there. So that will also activate uh, glycogen synthase right here. Uh, insulin will and cortisol will. So basically, this is uh, break uh, making of uh, glucose. Insulin does what? It takes out the glucose from the bloodstream and into the body, so it gets rid of uh, sugar in the blood. That's what insulin does. So uh, how does it do that? Uh, one, it takes it up in the muscles to use it up right away. Second, if there's too much, it goes into storage. The storage form of glucose is called glycogen. So glyco making of glycogen is called glycogenesis. Uh, so that's what it is. So here, if you see it, it goes from, this is how it does that. It goes from um, glucose to glucose 6P to glucose 1P to UDP glucose to glycogen. That's when you get glycogen. This side is breakdown of glycogen. Breakdown of glycogen is called glycogenolysis. But before we do that, uh, epinephrine, uh, inhibits this because when you give epinephrine everything gets pumped up and if everything gets pumped up you need more energy for more energy you need sugar or glucose so if you need more glucose you're not going to store the glucose which is what this is glucagon glucagon uh, is the opposite of insulin so insulin uh, tries to get rid of it uh, glucose from the bloodstream whereas glucagon will try to bring in uh, sugar our glucose into the bloodstream. So if you have glucagon, uh, either administered or just naturally, that's what this does. So it will inhibit glycogenesis. Uh, glycogenolysis is, uh, it requires glycogen phosphorylase. That's this thing right here. Uh, epinephrine, glucagon, and AMP. Everything is given here. Glucagon, epinephrine, and AMP, they all activate uh, glycogen phosphorylase. So they will all uh, do glycogen metabolism. Uh, again, same thing, epinephrine, uh, you need, uh, when you give epinephrine, you try to, everything gets pumped up, you need uh, energy, you need glucose. So you get glucose from glycogen. Glucagon, you need glucose, you get it from glycogen. Uh, EMP, uh, you need ATP. So you're gonna make get ADP once you get sugar, 
or once you get pyruvate and then pyruvate goes into the uh, TCA cycle. Uh, then uh, glucose 6-phosphate, glucose 6-phosphate, that was this one. This will inhibit it. Uh, insulin will inhibit it and ATP will inhibit it. Same logic applies. Uh, for HMP shunt, now glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase is the, that's this thing right here. That's the rate limiting factor here. Uh, NADP, that's this thing. It will activate it. If you have too much of NADPH, this won't happen because then you don't need this. So this won't convert into this. Okay, so that's done. De novo primitive and purine. Uh, okay. Okay, so here, carbamyl phosphatase 2, that's this thing right here. That's the rate limiting for that. And for de novo purine, it's uh, glutamine, glutamine uh, phosphoribosyl pyrophosphate, or PRPP, to make it easier on me, amidotransferase. So that's what this is, PRPP amidotransferase. That's the uh, rate limiting for purines. Okay, so... Uh, for primitive synthesis, ATP uh, activates it because it requires ATP to make it anyways, so it requires it. Uh, for this one, you need PRPP. Uh, that will activate, well, that thing right there, synthase, I guess, to make this, but hmm. there should be synthase here. Okay, so that will activate uh, purine salvage or base production or whatever. Uh, UTP, UTP, which one is that? Not sure, um, but that will inhibit this primitive right here. Oh, never mind. sorry. This is for primitive. So PRPP will activate it. Yeah, so you need PRPP to make this as well. So if you have a lot of this, you'll have more chances of making UMP. Okay, I was confusing the two. Uh, and de novo purine synthesis, um, uh, this is the one, the rate limiting. And AMP will inhibit it, uh, IMP will inhibit it, and GMP will inhibit it. So if you have any of the byproducts of these, and too much of it, it will start inhibiting the process. So you won't have this. I guess there's a feedback loop, uh, feedback loop here. Uh, then you have your cycle. That's oh, I thought I had your cycle on here. Oh, there it is. Okay, this one is pretty straightforward. It's carbamide phosphate synthase one. That's rate limiting. And it's activated by N acetylglutamine or stimulated by it. So you need that to activate this to make carbamide phosphate. I already told you about it. I'll go over it again. Uh, deficiency of ornithine transcarbamylase will give you increase in ammonia and increase in auritic acid. Why in auritic acid? Because now you have more carbamyl phosphate to make our uh, auritic acid over here in purine and primitive and primitive. Sorry. So when you have more carbamyl phosphate coming in here, and because it can go in on to become citrulline uh, by combining to ornithine, because you don't have ornithine transcarbamylase. So the carbamyl phosphate then gets used up in the primitive base production. And here you'll get auritic acid buildup and that's called acid urea, auritic acid urea. Okay. Uh, next one is 
fatty acid synthesis. I already did this one, but so that. Okay, uh, acetyl coenzyme A, carboxylase. Uh, so that is this thing right here. That's your rate limiting factor here. Uh, insulin will activate it. Citrate will activate it uh, or stimulate it. Uh, glucagon will inhibit it. And palmitoyl coenzyme A will inhibit it. Uh, palmitoyl coenzyme A, that's not given here, but it's in somewhere in this process. I promise you. Uh, okay. Makes sense. Glucagon is like, you know, uh, trying to get sugar in. So if you're going to use sugar for energy, you don't need fatty acid, right? So that's why it inhibits it. You don't want energy from fatty acid. You need it from glucose that because that's what glucagon does. That's why it inhibits the making or uh, synthesis of fatty acid. Uh, fatty acid oxidation, uh, carnitine acetyl transferase 1. Uh, I don't think I have it. So it might come here. But if not, it's fairly simple. Actually, why don't we just look it up? No, these are good, but I guess this one will work. Comes. Basically, there is mitochondria, so there is like the outer outer membrane and inner membrane, and between the membranes, there is carnitine uh, shuttle. So in that, okay, so right here, so this would be the outer membrane. This would be the inner membrane. And right between it, you have carnitin shuttle. This is what it's called. So uh, it transports fatty chains from uh, outside to inside of the mitochondria. That's what it does. So that's what this is. Uh, so it transform, uh, transports fatty chain, uh, long, very long, and short ones. The very long ones... Uh, I guess it will come when we get to it. Right. Um, melanin coenzyme A will inhibit this, which makes sense, right? Because we just saw that melanin coenzyme A uh, is used in synthesis of it. So when you're trying to do oxidation, right, uh, right here, it's going to inhibit it. So when oxidation is basically just degradation of this, beta oxidation, it's called of uh, metabolism of fatty acid. So melanin coenzyme A, it's very important that you know this. It is tested on that it inhibits carnitine acyl transferase. That's what it inhibits. It doesn't inhibit uh, beta oxidation, so don't pick that, or acyl coenzyme A dehydrogenase. It inhibits carnitine acyl transferase, which is the reason why this doesn't happen. So this is the carnitine shuttle for the degradation, but to make it, it's citrate shuttle for the synthesis. Okay. Uh, ketogenesis, HMG coenzyme uh, synthase and cholesterol synthesis as HMG coenzyme A reductase. I went over that too. Uh, so that's HMG coenzyme A synthase. That's rate limiting for this ketogenesis. So after beta oxidation, you get acetyl coenzyme A and acetyl, acetyl coenzyme A will come here and then into the mitochondria of liver. And in mitochondria of the liver, it will make this. 
HM, it will go on to make HMG coins. I mean, with the help of HMG coins, I mean, synthase. From where then it splits into three things, either uh, acetoacetate, which goes into acetone or 3-hydroxybutyrate, or it can go out into the cytoplasm through the blood uh, as acetoacetate and then through the cytoplasm again into the mitochondria matrix where it will then go back into making two SR coins I made to use up in the citric acid cycle. Okay, so out of all this, this is the thing we were doing. <laughs> HMG coins, I mean, synthase, it's rate limiting. Uh, for cholesterol uh, is, uh, right there, HMG coins, I mean, reductase. So you have acetyl coins, I mean, starting here as well. Uh, it will go on to make HMG coins, I mean. Uh, and then this is the rate limiting factor right here. Genes repressed by cholesterol. Uh, here you have glucagon inhibiting it, statin drugs inhibiting this, but insulin will make this, uh, make more cholesterol to get used up, right? Because insulin doesn't, you know, use, it tries to avoid using glucose, in, uh, making glucose for energy. So it's gonna try to get cholesterol in the blood to use for other stuff. Uh, okay. So insulin will activate it, thyroxin will activate it, estrogen will activate it, glucagon will inhibit it, and cholesterol, if you have too much cholesterol, you won't make more. So HMG coin is the one for that. Hopefully, you'll remember when you look at these in an answer and know that these are the rate limiting one. This is uh, kind of tough if you don't make sense of it because memorization will only get you so far. Uh, but hopefully when you go over this again and do it how I just did it, it will help you with that. Uh, metabolism sites, mitochondria, cytoplasm or both. So metabolism that happens in mitochondria are fatty acid oxidation, uh, acetyl coenzyme A production, TCA cycle. This is the most important one. Uh, if you don't have mitochondria or your mitochondria is damaged because of some reason like cyanide poisoning or uh, anything of uh, carbon monoxide, then this is not going to happen. And you're going to lose protons in that as well. Uh, oxidative phosphorylation and ketogenesis. All of these happens in uh, mitochondria. So what happens in cytoplasm? You get glycolysis happening there, HMP shunt, and synthesis of cholesterol. Uh, that's in uh, smooth endoplasmic reticulum. You have proteins, ribosomes, and rough endoplasmic reticulum, fatty acids, and nucleotides. Uh, all of this stuff is made outside. Uh, then you have something that uses both, like urea cycle or heme synthesis. Uh, do I have heme synthesis? I do have heme synthesis, okay. So this is what it is. Uh, and we'll do this in uh, patho, uh, when we come across acute intermittent porphyria or porphyria cutanea tarda. We'll do that. But this thing right here is in mitochondria this process. So after this process is done, it goes out of mitochondria. Uh, this stuff is in the cytoplasm. I think it's up till here that's in cytoplasm and then this goes back into mitochondria. I'm not sure. Hopefully they'll cover that. Uh, urea cycle. Uh, I'll show you. So after it becomes cit citrulline, where'd it go? After it becomes citrulline, it goes out of mitochondria into the cytoplasm. Uh, then it goes uh, on to become arginine, and then uh, with arginase, urea gets goes out. But when it, that happens, it turns into ornithine, and then ornithine goes back into mitochondria to make more citrulline. And gluconeogenesis. Okay. 
Okay, so uh, you have the Malich shuttle that transports between mitochondria and cytoplasm right there. So pyruvate becomes oxaloacetate. Oxaloacetate then goes through from the mitochondria into the cytoplasm. Okay. Uh, this is the summary. It's just all the charts that we just went over uh, squished in together to make sense of it. It's pretty cool, but if you don't know what you're looking for, it gets confusing. Uh, so we already went over all of this and all of this, most of it. So I don't think I'm going to go over that. Uh, we'll do it when we come across the stuff that requires it. Uh, ATP production, aerobic metabolism of one glucose molecule product produces 32 net ATP via melate, aspartate, shuttle, heart, and liver. Okay, uh, 30 net ATP via glycerol 3 phosphate shuttle. Okay, so you get 32 ATP via malate, aspartate, shuttle, and 30 net ATP via glycerol 3 phosphate shuttle. Uh, normally, if you, they ask you this, they're not going to give you these those answers. They'll either give you 30 or 32, but then the other answers will be like 20, 40, something like that. Uh, anaerobic glycolysis produces only two net ATP. So that's the one where it bypasses. Uh, where'd it go? So, and that's when it bypasses this right here. So when you do that, it's anaerobic, so you don't have oxygen. So it's not going to go into TCA cycle. So it's going to go into lactic, uh, lactates. Uh, so you'll have buildup of lactate, causing lactic acidosis for that. Uh, anaerobic glycolysis produces only two net ATP for a glucose molecule. ATP hydrolysis can be coupled to energetically unfavorable reactions. Arsenic causes glycolysis to produce zero net ATP. So remember that. Activated carriers, carrier molecules, ATP, carried in active form, activated form, phosphoryl uh, groups, NADH, NADPH, FADH2, they're carried by electrons, uh, as electrons, uh, coenzyme A, lipomide, uh, SI group, biotin, carbon monoxide, uh, carbon dioxide, sorry. Because it does, it's required for carboxylase reactions. Uh, tetrahydrofolate, one carbon uh, unit. Uh, tetrahydrofolate. Okay, that's the folate ones. Uh, SAM. Uh, that's uh, carried as CH three groups, and TPP is aldehydes. They don't test you really on this, so it's not really that important to know, but just know, you know, when you look at it, you should know that this is, this goes with this, this goes with this, kind of like that. Uh, universal electron acceptors. Uh, okay. Nicotinamides, uh, NAD, NADP, and vitamin B3 and flavin nucleotides, FAD for vitamin B2. NAD is generally used in catabolic processes to carry reducing equivalents via away, sorry, as NADH. NADPH is used in anabolic processes, for example, steroid and fatty acid synthesis as a supply of reducing equivalent equivalents. Uh, NADPH is a product of HMP shunt. NADPH is used in anabolic processes respiratory bursts, cytochrome P450 system, and glutathione reductase. Okay. Uh, these, you should know. This is important. They do test you on that. Uh, so NADPH is very important because only HMP shunt makes it, and you don't get that from anywhere else. Uh, so NADPH right there, NADPH, NADPH, uh, and we looked at the thing somewhere here, right there, okay, and it's gone, okay, we'll wait for that, but yeah, 
So it's used in anabolic processes, respiratory bursts. This is important. Uh, it comes in microbio as well. Uh, cytochrome P450, uh, again, very important. It's the reason we are alive. Uh, glutathione reductase, it's okay. It doesn't really matter. This is the most important one. Cause, but this one, glutathione reductase, is attached to respiratory burst. Uh, we'll see how that is. Okay, so anabolic processes. Uh, basically, also, since they haven't spelled it out, I'll spell it out for you guys. Uh, okay, so... Fatty acid synthesis biosynthesis and cholesterol biosynthesis. That's what these things are used in when they say anabolic processes. But it's kind of confusing or you won't figure it out when you see it in a question stem, when you had to figure it out in like under 40 seconds. You might not recall it, but just add that to your notes that it's fatty acid biosynthesis, cholesterol biosynthesis as well. Uh, exokinase versus glucokinase. Okay, so that's over here. Hexokinase and glucokinase. So when glucose goes, uh, transports and uh, glucose goes into glucose 6P, to make that, you need one ATP and you also need hexokinase uh, and glucokinase for liver. So hexokinase is everywhere else, but for liver, you need glucokinase. Uh, so phosphorylation of glucose to yield glucose 6-phosphate is catalyzed by glucokinase in the liver and hexokinase in other tissue. Hexokinase uh, sequesters glucose in tissues where it is used even when glucose concentrations are low. At high glucose concentrations, glucokinase helps to store glucose in liver. Glucokinase deficiency is a cause of maturity onset diabetes of the young or modi and gestational diabetes. So this is important because if you don't have it, you have uh, diabetes. Okay, hexokinase and glucokinase. Uh, what are the similarities? It's location, most tissues except liver and pancreatic beta cells. Here, you have it in liver and beta cell of pancreas. Uh, KM value uh, is lower and higher in this. Vmax is lower and higher in this. Uh, we should go over this, but I'm thinking, yeah, should we go over it here or in pharmacy? We'll go over it in pharmacy. Let's do that. Uh, so KM is lower. Uh, it means it has a increased affinity. Uh, in hexokinase for something. Affinity for what though? Okay. Glucokinase has higher KM value, so it has a decreased affinity, I guess, for the tissue or for the reaction. Okay. Uh, Vmax is uh, lower, so it has a decreased capacity and higher for increased capacity. Okay. Uh, induced by insulin. Uh, hexokinase is not induced by insulin, but glucokinase is. Makes sense because it, it is part of uh, pancreas. Feedback inhibition by glucose 6-phosphate. Glucokinase has fructose 6-phosphate as feedback innovation. Uh, I'm not gonna spend too much time understanding this because they don't test you on it. 
they test you on KM and Vmax, but not for this. It's just for drugs. So just know that it's here and hexokinase is used in uh, other tissues and glucokinase for liver. And it converts glucose to glucose 6-phosphate. Inhibition is done by glucose 6-phosphate for hexokinase and for glucokinase, it's fructose 6-phosphate. Okay, uh, glycolysis regulation, key enzymes. Net glycolysis, cytoplasm, glucose plus 2P uh, phosphate intracellular plus 2 ADP plus 2 NAD can give you two pyruvates, two ATPs, two NADH, two hydrogen ions, and uh, two water molecules. Equation not balanced chemically and exact balanced equation depends on ionization state of reactants and products. Okay, so glucose to glucose 6P requires ATP. We saw that already. Right here, I'll just bring that back. So this one requires ATP. Uh, fructose 6P to fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. That's this thing right here. So that requires ATP as well. Uh, again, glucose 6P inhibits this. Fructose 6P inhibits this. Uh, here, AMP activates this. Uh, fructose 2,6-bisphosphate, that's this, activates uh, PFK as well. Uh, if you have too much ATP already made, uh, you don't need this whole process to happen, so this won't happen. So ATP uh, inhibits it. Uh, similarly in citrate, if you already have too much citrate, you know we already have, because citrate is in TC TCA cycle, so the TCA cycle is for ATP. So if you have a lot of citrate, you don't need other stuff to make ATP. So that will inhibit this. Uh, okay. What produces ATP? That's the lower part of this. So you have 1,3-BPG, that's this, going on to make 3-BPG, uh, phosphoglycerate. Hopefully you guys can see that. Okay, so fructose, uh, okay. And you have phosphoenyl pyruvate going to pyruvate. So that's your PEP right here going on to the pyruvate. You need pyruvate kinase for that as well, uh, right here. And fructose 1,6 bisphosphate will activate it. That's this. Uh, ATP will inhibit it because this produces ATP. Now, if you already have ATP, then it's not gonna make more. Alanine is negative, uh, sorry, inhibits it. And glucagon will inhibit it. Glucagon, again, it tries to make more, so you're not going to do breakdown of glucose while making more glucose. So that's why it inhibits that. Uh, regulation by fructose 2, 6, bisphosphate. So how does that happen? We'll look at this. But in case we need it, we'll just do that. But I don't think the charts have, any of the charts have this. Yeah, so we have to use this one for that. Uh, fructose bisphosphatase 2 or FBPase 2 and phosphofructokinase 2 are the same. I think we have 10 minutes now. Okay. No. Yeah, we'll finish this. Uh, fructose bisphosphate 2 and fructokinase 2 are the same. Bifunctional enzyme host function is reversed by phosphorylation by protein kinase A. Okay, so here fru uh, fructose 6-bisphosphate going into either uh, gluconeogenesis or glycolysis. Uh, when it goes into glycolysis, you need PFK1 to go into fructose 1,6-bisphosphate, then you get glycolysis. Uh, for PFK1, you need fructose 2,6-bisphosphate, uh, right? So to go from that to that, uh, that's this process right here. Fructose 6 bisphosphate to fructose 2 6 bisphosphate. 
uh, you need PFK2 and PFK2 you require ATP over there too. So that's this. Then when this happens, okay, I'm breaking it. Where is I'm going back and forth? So yeah. So when you have fructose six bisphosphate, and you want to make uh, go into glycolysis, you need to get to fructose one six bisphosphate, and you require uh, fructose two bisphosphate for that. And for that, you require PFP2 over there. So it's this little triangle right here. Uh, similarly, for gluconeogenesis, that's right here. But uh, this one doesn't have it, but okay. Or it does. Uh, it's this thing right here. Uh, fructose 6. Uh, so to go into gluconeogenesis, you need to go from fructose, sorry, for that you need to go from fructose 2, 6 bisphosphate. You have fructose 1, 6 bisphosphate here uh, into fructose 6P. So that's fructose 6P right here. And for that, you require uh, FBPAs 2. That's FBPAs, we have one here. Uh, but okay. And then you have gluconeogenesis. It's similar. But uh, you need to know this. This does get tested on. Uh, okay, so I'll read that again. Fructose bisphosphatase 2 and phosphofructokinase 2 are the same. Bifunctional enzymes whose function is reversed by phosphorylation by protein kinase A. Uh, in fasting state, you'll have increasing glucagon because fasting state, you don't have glucose in blood, so you need more energy and more energy requires more sugar and ATP. So uh, everything that produces all of that will get increased. Uh, increase in glucagon, increase in CAMP, increase in AT, uh, in protein kinase A, increase in BPAs2, decrease in P PFK2, less glycolysis, more gluconeogenesis. Uh, less breakdown of glucose, more making of glucose. Uh, fed state is increase in insulin will lead to decrease in CAMP. You don't need it, so it, it tries to get rid of glucose. So any, everything that gets rid of it. So increase in insulin, decrease in CAMP, uh, decrease in protein kinase A, decrease in FBPAs2, increase in PFK2, more glycolysis, less gluconeogenesis. Um, pyruvate dehydrogenase complex. Uh, that's PDH, that's the one where it goes into the, that's the thing right here. Once it's pyruvate. Okay, so mitochondrial enzyme complex linking glycolysis and TCA cycle. So glyco, uh, oh, I did the other way. Okay, I did the wrong one then. There's glucose. Okay. So from pyruvate, it goes into uh, mitochondria and ester coenzyme. You need pyruvate dehydrogenase here. Uh, that thing, it was also the same thing. It's just different thing. This here, I wrote it as well. It goes into oxaloacetate and alanine. It requires B677 for that. Here you need thymine for this uh, and all the other ones, but the most important one is thymine. So differentially regulated and fed active and fasting in active states. Uh, reaction pyruvate, NAD, coenzyme A will lead to ester coenzyme A, carbon dioxide, and NADH. Contains three enzymes requiring five factors, thymine, phosphate, pyrophosphate, lipoic acid, coenzyme A, uh, FAD, and NAD. Activated by uh, so all of these, so coenzyme A requires B5, that's uh, pentothenic acid. Uh, FAD requires B2, uh, riboflavin, NAD. It requires B3, niacin, activated by increase in NAD, NADH ratio, and increase in ADP, increase in calcium. Uh, just know that, don't really need to memorize it. The complex is, uh, memorize this though, these five things. Don't need to know 
that much about what gets that act what activates it the complex is similar to the alpha ketoglutarate dehydrogenase complex same cofactors similar substrates and actions which converts alpha ketoglutarate to succinyl coenzyme tca cycle uh that keeps selling that was the thing for this uh the lovely coenzyme for nerds okay so arsenic uh, inhibits the whole thing we read that here uh, causes glycolysis to produce zero net ATP. Uh, here they mentioned it again. Arsenic inhibits uh, lipoic acid. Uh, arsenic poisoning clinical finding is imagine a vampire pigmentary skin changes skin cancer, uh, vomiting and having diarrhea running away from a QD. That's QT prolongation for garlic breath. All right. Well continue this Wait. activity. Dehydrogenase complex deficiency causes a buildup of pyruvate that gets shunted to lactate via LDH and alanine via ALT. This is X-linked. So pyruvate dehydrogenase complex deficiency. That's what this is. So that's this thing right here that converts pyruvate into SL coenzyme or the one that goes into uh tca cycle so if you don't have pyruvate dehydrogenase you get buildup of lactate because then if it can't go this way it's going to go this way so that way or this way or this way okay uh findings are neurologic def defects lactic acidosis so when you have lactic acidosis you're going to think about this chart right here or this chart right here right because that's the only time you're going to see lactate you don't see lactate anywhere else so lactic acidosis you're going to think about this so that's how you get to pyruvate dehydrogenase but they'll also give you increased serum alanine starting in infancy so when they give you that you know it pyruvate becomes uh like four, it goes into four things, either lactate, oxaloacetate, alanine, or into the TCA cycle, right? So that's what you have. Uh, if it goes into the mitochondria, it becomes oxaloacetate, or it can become acetyl coenzyme A, or with the help of PDH, uh, here, pyruvate uh, carboxylase. Here, you have ALT, uh, and you here you have LDH, or lactic acid dehydrogenase. Uh, okay, so that's how you know that's one of these. Okay, uh, treatment increase intake of ketogenic uh, nutrients. Okay, uh, okay, so sorry about that. Uh, treatment increase intake of ketogenic nutrients. For example, high fat content or increased lysine and leucine. Okay, uh, you need to know what those are, because uh, they might they give you a question about uh, there's a person who's on keto diet, so which amino essential amino acids are important for them to have as supplements? Because since uh, they're keto on keto diet, they won't have ketogenic amino acids. So these are the ones you need to give them lysine and leucine that's how you get to that answer uh, pyruvate metabolism functions of different pyruvate metabolic as uh, pathways and their associated cofactors we just went over it uh, one alanine amino transferase b6 alanine carries amino groups to the liver from the muscles so right there it goes through the chyle uh, cycle. Uh, with pyruvate carboxylase B7, oxaloacetate can replenish TCA cycle and be used in gluconeogenesis. Okay, we already know that. Uh, pyruvate dehydrogenase B1, 2, 3, B5, lipoic acid transitions from uh, glycolysis to TCA cycle. Uh, okay, same thing. Uh, oh, sorry. This one was this oxaloacetate. It goes into oxaloacetate. This one is this number three, right? Uh, lactic uh, acid dehydrogenase B three. 
end of anaerobic end of anaerobic glycolysis, major pathway in RBCs, WBCs, uh, kidney medulla, and lens, testes, and cornea. Okay, so lactic acid dehydrogenase, end of anaerobic glycolysis, major pathway in RBCs, because uh, that's how it generates ATP and when you don't have oxygen. WBC as well, uh, kidney medulla, lens, because uh, lens is isolated, uh, and testes, that's also considered uh, immune privilege there, and cornea. Okay, so that's how they generate energy, I guess, over there. So uh, this is important, know this. Uh, how pyruvate functions. Uh, TCA cycle. We already went over this like a couple of times, but it's also called Krebs cycle. Pyruvate leads to acetyl coenzyme A. It produces one NADH uh, and one carbon dioxide. The TCA cycle produces three NADH, one FADH, two, two carbon dioxide. Uh, one GTP per acetyl coenzyme A, which equals to 10 ATP uh, and or acetyl coenzyme A, two times everything per glucose. Uh, just remember that so you don't have to remember individual values. TCA cycle reactions occur in the mitochondria. Alpha ketoglutarate dehydrogenase complex requires the same cofactors as the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex, uh, vitamin B1, thymine, uh, this was riboflavin, this is niacin, this is pantothenic, and uh, lipoic acid. Uh, this is another one, but again, the one I use is can I keep Selling sex for money officer. To keep it correct. Okay, so uh, we need to know a couple of things over here. Uh, which one generates GTP? You need to know that. Uh, which one generates uh, NADH? That's these, these, and one over here. Let's get the one here. This one's better. Okay, so you need to know about this. What you need to know. Uh, one, uh, which one's cause, uh, which one makes NADH? So that's isocitrate dehydrogenase, alpha ketoglutarate dehydrogenase, and malate dehydrogenase. Then you need to know which one makes FADH2. So that's succinate uh, dehydrogenase. It's made in uh, complex two. That's in the ATC cycle, electron transport chain. Uh, it has four complexes. So in complex two, uh, it makes FADH2. It uses FAD. Uh, in succinyl coenzyme A synthase, that's the one between the two S's. Uh, it uses uh, GDP uh, to make GTP. They ask you about individual ones, so you need to know this by heart. Uh, everything about this is very important. Sometimes they even give you just this diagram, and all of these boxes will be blank, and all of the all of these stuff will be like blank as well. And then they ask you to fill it in, like what is A or what is B, what is C, kind of like that. Uh, here, glucose amino acids go into pyruvate, uh, fatty acid, ketones, uh, extra hepatic alcohol goes into the making uh, acetyl coenzyme A. Fatty acid synthesis uh, uses up citrate. Uh, there's cis acronitase. It used to be important, but no, 
nobody mentions it anymore. So don't need to remember that. Uh, isocitrate dehydrogenase takes out a carbon dioxide. Similarly here, it takes out a carbon dioxide. Uh, this is important because it's thiamine uh, dependent. If they ask you, uh, a person is alcoholic and the TCA cycle is not working, what could be a reason? It could be this. It's because uh, uh, NADH gets uh, released in alcohol uh, metabolism. So there's a lot of this. And when you have a lot of NADH, it gets uh, alpha ketoglutarate dehydrogenase gets inhibited by that. And also it's time independent. So it could be that as well. Uh, our chain fatty acids go into making succinyl coenzyme A uh, just to really drive home the point. So that's this thing right here. Uh, our chains will go into propanyl coenzyme A, uh, succinyl coenzyme A, sorry. Uh, so propyl coenzyme A will go into methyl melanyl coenzyme A to make succinyl coenzyme A. That's what the chain is for this. Oh. I see what I did. We'll just look at it here. Okay, so then uh, here, succinyl coenzyme A also goes into making heme synthesis. So that was somewhere here. There you go. So you have succinyl coenzyme A here plus glycine to make uh, this amino valinic acid or ELA. Okay. Then uh, succinate. Succinate goes into fumarate. Uh, you have urea cycle here. Uh, we already looked at the urea cycle uh, right here. And you have fumarate coming out of here uh, between arginose succinate to arginine with the help of arginose succinate lyase. Lyase is the one that cuts it, and ligase is the one that joins the two for, uh, segments of codons. Uh, so, yeah, okay. So, DNA, sorry, not codon. Okay. A uh, few minutes. Uh, malate goes into gluconeogenesis. Uh, we saw that in oxaloacetate and using the this thing goes into this to this so that's where malate is used in gluconeogenesis uh, and that's it so you have malate dehydrogenase uh, this thing is important because it is reversible so if in alcohol you have too much NADH this cycle will not continue it will actually go back into making NAD and making going into malate so you'll have more gluconeogenesis then Okay. You have electron transport chain and oxidative phosphorylation. Uh, NADH electrons from glycolysis enter mitochondria via the malate, aspartate, and glycerol 3P shuttle. FADH2 electrons are transferred to complex 2 at a lower energy level than NADH. The passage of electrons uh, results in the formation of protein proton gradient that coupled to oxidative phosphorylation drives the production of ATP. So here, the most important and, uh, thing is the proton. You cannot have protons leak. So when do you have the protons leaking? It's when you have things like cyanide or carbon dioxide, you'll have protons leaking straight through instead of going through the channel. Uh, why do you need it to go through the channel? It's because it's required to make uh, ADP into ATP. Okay, that's the most important thing. Uh, complex one is inhibited by uh, retinone uh, metformin. Uh, then you have 2,4-dinitrophenol aspirin overdose. All of this will cause leakage of uh, hydrogen ions or protons into this. So in complex one, you get NADH into NAD. In complex two, you get FADH2 to FAD. Uh, this is also called the succinate dehydrogenase. 
in the mitochondria. Uh, you have all of this. So complex three is inhibited by actinomycin. Uh, then you have cytochrome C. Uh, that's complex four. It's inhibited by azides, cyanide, and carbon monoxide. And you have oligomycin inhibiting complex five. Uh, okay, so that's your mitochondrial matrix, inner mitochondrial membrane, and intermembrane space. Uh, then ATP produced via ATP synthase. A one NADH will make give you uh, two point five ATP, one FADH, uh, and one point five ATP. Uh, know these numbers where it differs it's not the same and they might ask you this question right here like how much will one atp make or what can it make like that uh, oxidative phosphorylation uh, poisoning or poisons electron transport inhibitors directly inhibits electron transport causing an decreased proton gradient and block of atp synthesis so retinon complex one inhibitor and three mycin or antimycin uh, complex three inhibitor cyanide carbon monoxide azides the ides and spore letters so inhibits complex four i remember it by itself and i look at it uh, but you can memorize that if you need to atp synthase inhibitor directly inhibit mitochondrial atp synthase causing an increase in proton gradient. No ATP is produced because electron transport stops. Uh, oligomycin is the ATP synthase inhibitor. That's this one right here. Uh, uncoupling agent, increased uh, permeability of membrane causing a uh, increased permeability of membrane causing a decreased proton gradient and increased O2 consumption. ATP synthesis stops, but electron transport continues. So it does produce heat. Uh, these are not good because then you're just burning up without having any energy. Uh, two for dinitrophenol, used illicitly for weight loss. Uh, aspirin, fevers often occur after overdose. Uh, thermogenin in brown fat has more mitochondria than white fat. Okay. Uh, gluconeogenesis, irreversible enzymes. All enzymes may be subject to activation by glucagon in fasting state. Pathway produces fresh glucose. Give me a sec. Okay, gluconeogenesis, irreversible enzymes. All enzymes may be subject to activation by glucagon in fasting state. Okay. All of these. So pyruvate carboxylase in mitochondria, pyruvate to oxaloacetate to make more, uh, again, same thing, gluconeogenesis. You have Pyruvic carboxylase making going into this uh, to make oxaloacetate. So when it becomes oxaloacetate, it goes into making more glucose because that's what this is. Uh, requires biotin, ATP activated by acetylcholine, acetylcholine. Uh, that's this thing right here. So acetylcholine will activate this and inhibit more. Uh, inhibit PDA so it doesn't come over here anymore because you already have more as much as you need for you. So uh, this pathway is going to go this way then. Uh, Phosphoenol pyruvate carboxyl kinase and cytosol oxaloacetate to 
GDP. It requires GDP right here. So GDP, uh, it requires GDP to make PEP right there. It also gives in a crop box, uh, carbon dioxide, okay. Carbon dioxide is adds the carbon dioxide, okay. Uh, fructose one six uh, bisphosphate is one, and cytosol fructose one six bisphosphate will lead to fructose six phosphate. Uh, we saw that too, right here. Uh, citrate activates it, AMP activates it, fructose 2, 6, this phosphate, uh, deactivates fructose 1, 6, this phosphate, 1. Okay. Uh, then you have glucose 6 phosphatase that's up here, uh, making glucose 6 P into glucose. So that's in endoplasmic reticulum, this happens. Okay. Uh, so gluconeogenesis occurs primarily in liver, serves to maintain euglycemia during fasting. Enzymes are found in kidney, intestinal epithelium. Deficiency of the key gluconeogenic enzymes cause hypoglycemia. Muscles cannot participate in gluconeogenesis because it lacks glucose 6 phosphatase. Okay, so muscles do not have glucose 6 phosphatase, so it cannot participate in making more glucose. It's because of this. So, remember that. Our chain fatty acids yield one profile coenzyme A during met metabolism, which can enter the TCA cycle as succinyl coenzyme A. Undergoes gluconeogenesis and serves as a glucose source. Uh, we already seen that. So, even chain fatty acids cannot produce new glucose since they yield only acetyl coenzyme equivalents. Okay, so even chain fatty acids cannot produce new glucose. Odd chains can, but not even chains, because odd chains go through this. Even chain fatty acids does not produce this since they yield only acetyl coenzyme equivalents. Uh, now, HMP shunt or pentose phosphate pathway, also called HMP shunt, uh, provides a source of NADPH. This thing right here. Provides a source of NADPH uh, from abundantly available glucose 6P. So, NADPH is required for reductive re reactions, for example glutathione reduction inside RVCs, fatty acids, and cholesterol biosynthesis. Uh, this is the thing I made you guys add. Uh, additionally, this pathway yields ribose for nucleotide synthesis, two distinct phases, oxidative and non-oxidative, both of which occur in cytoplasm. No ATP is used or produced. So in this whole thing, no ADP is used or is or produced. Okay, uh, important thing it yields ribose for nucleotide uh, synthesis. You see this ribose, radulose 5P becomes ribose 5P, and then when you go into your purine and primidine one, you see that here you have ribose 5P. So. It goes into that. Two distinct phases, oxidative and non-oxidative, both of which occur in the cytoplasm. I know what you use. Sites lactating memory gland, liver, adrenal cortex, sites of fatty acids or steroid synthesis, and RBCs. So in these places, and these are the only places where you'll find pantose phosphate pathway. Uh, lactating memory gland, liver, adrenal cortex uh, and RBCs. In adrenal cortex, the sites of fatty acid or steroid synthesis. Uh, reaction. 
oxidative, this is irreversible. So when glucose 6P goes to 6 phosphogluconate to make a uh, ribulose 5P, you have NADP, NADPH, FP. This one. I like this one better. Uh, glucose goes to glucose 6p glucose 6p then goes into 6 phosphogluconate uh, then it makes uh, ribulose 5p so it goes into co2 nadp goes into nadph again nadp this is the only one that makes nadp no other uh, cycle makes nadp or nadph the nadph is used other places as well so this will this is reversible now so everything up till here was irreversible and now everything else is going to be reversible so the ribose 5p goes into nucleotide synthesis that's this thing right here uh, then you have uh, ribose 5p also go into making this stuff uh, with the help of transketolase transketolase is very important because it requires timing as well uh, they should have it somewhere here. They don't, but you need timing for this as well. Transketolase. Uh, then you have uh, fructose 6P here, uh, glyceraldehyde 3P, and from here you can go into that, that or fructose 1, 6, 6 phosphate, into like fatty acid or whatever, glucose, uh, glycolysis as well process or even making gluconeogenesis because in gluconeogenesis you get DAP right here and it's reversible so from glycerol 3P it goes to DAP and then it goes back up to making glucose or we can go down all the way into this into making fatty acid uh, oxidation to make acetyl coenzyme and then that goes into that as well. Okay, glucose 6, uh, so what happens when you don't have this enzyme right here? Glucose 6 P dehydrogenase. So they're gonna go into that. Um, glucose 6 P uh, dehydrogenase deficiency or G6 P D deficiency. NADPH is necessary to keep glutathione reduction reduced, which is which in turn does detoxifies free radicals and peroxides. Decrease in NADPH in RBCs lead to hemolytic anemia due to poor RBC defense against oxidizing agents. For example, fallow beans, uh, sulfonamides, nitrofurantoin, uh, primaquine, chloroquine, antituberculosis uh, drugs. Infection most common cause can also precipitate hemolysis. Inflammatory response produces free radicals that diffuse into RBCs causing oxidative damage. So that's why this is important. Because inflammatory response will produce this and diffuse into RBCs causing oxidative damage. So we need to take care of that. So that's what this thing does. Uh, there is a respiratory boost. That, that that this is attached to so this is attached to okay uh, x-linked recessive disorder most common human enzyme deficiency more prevalent among descendants of population in the malaria endemic regions for example sub-saharan africa or southeast asia heinz bodies uh, denatured globin chains precipitate within rbc's due to oxidative stress then you get white cells. It results from the phagocytic removal of Pine's body by splenic macrophages. Uh, that's what spleen does. It uh, filters, the, filters the blood. So if you have uh, something that's not 6 phosphate dehydrogenase deficiency, NADPH is necessary to keep glutathione reduced, which in turn detoxifies free radicals and peroxides. 
uh, this is why it's important, this uh, whole process. Decreasing NADPH in RBCs leads to hemolytic anemia due to poor RBC defense against oxidizing agents. Oxidizing agents are fava beans, sulfonamides, nitrofurantoin, primaquine, chloroquine, anti-tuberculosis drugs. So infection, most common cause, can also precipitate hemolysis. All of these reasons for uh, hemolytic anemia. Uh, inflammatory response produces free radicals that diffuse into RBCs causing oxidative damage. So this is why NADPH is necessary to keep glutathione reduced. Uh, X-linked recessive disorder, most common human enzyme deficiency, more prevalent among uh, descendants of population in malaria endemic regions, for example, Sub-Saharan Africa or Southeast Asia. Heinz body, denurtured globin chains, precipitate within RBCs due to oxidative stress. You need to know what Heinz bodies are. So, Heinz body. So that's these things. Uh, then when it goes to spleen, uh, these things get removed in spleen. And then you get white cells. That. So those are the bite cells. It looks like on the spleen ate the hind bodies. So you're left with bite cells. <coughs> uh, how the glutathione is reduced is here too, but this is the one I'm used to, so I'll go over this one. So you have superoxide going into uh, O2. Uh, into H2O. So you need NADPH oxidase over here, and then you need superoxide. So O2 becomes superoxide, sorry, right here. So that's superoxide ion. That's just O2. How does O2 go into, uh, onto becoming superoxide? With the help of NADPH oxidase, uh, NADPH goes into NADP. Uh, then you get H2O2. Uh, with the help of superoxide dismutase. With H2O2, it can either go this way, where it becomes H2O plus O2. Uh, you need catalase for that. Uh, or it can go into this pathway right here. H2O and H2O. H2O2, sorry, will become H2O. So that's this thing right here. H2O2 becomes H2O. Uh, then... Uh, Fourth is glutathione peroxide peroxidase, so that right there will make 2GSH, which is the reduced form into oxidized right here, GSSG, with glutathione reductase right here. Uh, both of these require selenium uh, with glutathione reductase. You get and and NADPH, you make NADP. Right there, same thing. And that's how you get glucose 6-phosphate into 6-phosphate glucolactone. So that's how you reduce glucotathione uh, with the help of glucose 6P dehydrogenase. Okay. Uh, this H2O2 can also go on to making uh, bleach or hypochlorite. Right there. Uh, with the help of chlorine, uh, so bacteria then gets destroyed. Uh, okay. Uh, disorder of fructose metabolism, uh, essential fructose urea, involves a defect in fructokinase. Uh, kinase is always kinder for this as well as for this. Kinase is going to be kinder. Uh, what that means is the other one is going to be horrible. It, the symptoms are going to be really bad. So essential fructose urea involves a defect in fructokinase, autosomal recessive, a benign or asymptomatic condition. It's asymptomatic, so symptoms aren't there, which is why it's kinder. Fructokinase deficiency is kinder. 
Since fructose is not trapped in cells, hexokinase um, becomes primary pathway of converting fructose to fructose 6-phosphate. Uh, okay, so symptoms. Uh, over here, we have, we don't have fructose phosphate given here, okay. Symptoms, fructose appears in blood and urine. That's how you know. So they'll do a urine test for sugar. Uh, it will come back positive, but it won't come back positive for glucose. That's what it is. Disorder of fructose metabolism uh, causes milder symptoms than analogous disorders of uh, galactose metabolism. So disorder of this is much milder than disorders of this, is all it says. Hereditary fructose intolerance, hereditary deficiency of aldolase B. This is the harsher one. So that's the conversion of fructose 1 P to this. Why? Because if you don't have fructokinase, well, fructose can go into other pathways to make fructose 1 P. Uh, but if you have aldolase B, deficiency then it's much harsher because now even this is going to get affected uh, in glycolysis because this also uses okay that's just aldolase no my my bad uh fructose one phosphate accumulates causing a decrease in available phosphate which results in inhibition of glucogenolysis okay yeah that was right then and uh, gluconeogenesis. Symptoms presents following consumption of fruit juice or honey. So when a child has any of these things, that's when the symptoms arise. Urine dipstick will be negative, test only for glucose. Okay, so never mind. Urine dipstick will be negative. Reducing sugar can be detected in the urine. So that's basically what they will give in the questions then that they did the urine dipstick, uh, it came back negative, but uh, there were presence of reducing sugar. So as soon as you hear that, you know it's gonna be fructose. Non-specific tests for inborn errors of carbohydrate metabolism. Symptoms, hypoglycemia, jaundice, cirrhosis, vomiting. Uh, treatment is decreased intake of fructose. You have fructose deficiency or you can't metabolize it so don't have fructose or don't have sucrose uh, which is also glucose plus fructose or and sorbitol because it's metabolized to fructose okay so what's that? <laughs> okay uh Okay, so fructose, fructokinase, uh, fructose 1P. With elderlies, it comes dihydroxytone P, uh, glyceraldehyde, uh, goes down to become glycerol. This goes to uh, this train. Just know this, that eventually it reaches glyceraldehyde 3P and goes into glucose, uh, glycolysis. Definitely remember this though up to here that first you get uh, fructokinase then you get the other uh the other thing for that was this i'll go over it again fructose bypasses pfk one a major rate limiting factor in glycolysis so when you have glycolysis it goes directly into this so it bypasses that there you go TFK1, so it bypasses this thing right here and goes directly into this. Okay, uh, disorder of, okay, so there's a better one. So sucrose, fruit, honey, all of this will make fructose. Uh, sucrose is made up of glucose and fructose. So with sucrase, we can split it. The fructose in blood, other tissues phosphorylate fructose slowly than hexokinase, through hexokinase. Uh, so 
when the fructose gets to liver or kidney fructokinase uh, becomes makes uh, fructose one p uh, with other lace b it makes a tap and glycerol dehyde uh, with glycerol dehyde three p and that it can go into glycolysis glycogenesis and gluconeogenesis uh, fructose deficiency is benign. LDLSB, LDLSB, fructose 1P, LDLS activity deficiency includes these are the symptoms, which is why it's not that cool. Lethargy, vomiting, liver damage, hyperbilirubinemia, hypoglycemia, hyperuricemia, lactic acidosis, renal proximal tubule defect, Fanconi's. Okay. Now we'll do uh, this. Also remember sorbitol, because it metab when sorbitol metabolizes, uh, it makes fructose. Over here we have uh, disorder of galactose metabolism, galactokinase deficiency, hereditary deficiency of galactokinase. Galactitol accumulates if galactose is present in diet, relatively mild condition. Autosomal recessive symptoms are galactose appears in blood, galactosemia, and urine galactosemia. Infantile cataracts. So anything to do with cataracts is usually going to be with because of galactose. Okay. So hereditary deficiency on this galactose accumulates in if galactose is present in diet, relatively mild, common this. Okay. Okay. May present as failure to track objects or to develop a social smile. Uh, they're not going to give you this in question stem because uh, then you're going to think it's like some kind of spectrum. Uh, galactokinase deficiency is kinder, benign condition. However, classic galactosemia. So here it's you don't make this basically if this is uh the deficient one so galactose doesn't make galactose 1p similarly here with the fructose doesn't make fructose 1p but this is the one that you need to remember they test you on this fever dial transferase uh, absence of galactose 1 phosphate uridyl transferase autosomal recessive damage is caused by accumulation of toxic substances including galactitol, which accumulates in the lens of the eye. Uh, this is why you get cataract or because uh, there's buildup of this. Damage is caused by accumulation of toxic substance, including galactitol. So when it can make more of this, it's going to go back and make more of this instead. Okay. Uh, symptoms develop when infant begins feeding. Lactose present in breast milk and routine formula. And include failure to thrive, jaundice, hepatomegaly, infantile cataracts, in intellectual disability. Can predispose to E. coli sepsis and neonates. They don't really add that. What they will add is that the person uh, started uh, breastfeeding and the infant has cataracts or jaundice uh, some kind of deficiency is there uh, some kind of sugar deficiency so they'll give you all of that and then you have to figure out uh, they might even give you that there's cataracts so infantile cataracts whenever that is mentioned you're going to think of this because that's like the buzzword for this and if they add hibernomegaly, then you know it's something to which, uh, well, not really, but because that could be anything. It's really vague. Uh, intellectual disability. But if they give you this, this is, I guess, the buzzword. That's how you're going to know. And then they will ask you about this. What would cause classic galactosemia? It's the absence of galactose 1 phosphate uridyl transferase. Uh, Galactitol causes the cataract, but it doesn't cause this. So don't confuse the two. 
treatment is exclude galactose and lactose, galactose plus glucose from diet. Fructose is aldolase is to aldolase B as galactose is to uridyl transferase. The more serious defect leads to phosphate depletion. Okay. Sorbitol. Sorbitol makes fructose when metabolized. Uh, okay. An alternative method of tapping glucose in the cell is to convert it to alcohol counterpart, sorbitol, by aldolase reductase. Some tissue then convert sorbitol to fructose using sorbitol dehydrogenase. Tissues with an insufficient amount uh, activity of this enzyme are at risk of intracellular sorbitol accumulation, causing osmotic damage. For example, cataracts, retinopathy, and a peripheral neuropathy seen with chronic hyperglycemia and diabetes. High blood levels of galactose also results in conversion to the osmotically active galactidol via aldolase reductase. Liver, ovaries, and seminal vesicles have both enzymes. They lose orbital. Okay. So, lens has primarily aldolase reductase. So, retina, kidney, and Schwann cells have all aldolase reductase or large. Uh, you can think of it like when you have diabetes, you get retinopathy, you get nephropathy, you get neuropathy. So it's all of those places that have aldolase reductase. Okay. Uh, lactase deficiency. Uh, People confuse this one with uh, celiac disease sometimes. Uh, lactase deficiency is insufficient lactase enzyme. Dietary lactose, which leads to dietary lactose intolerance. Lactase functions on the intestinal brush border to digest lactose in milk and milk products in glucose and galactose. Primary age-dependent decline after childhood absence of lactase persistent allele. Uh, absence of lactase persistent uh, allele, common in people of Asian, African, or Native American descent. Secondary, loss of intestinal brush border due to gastroenteritis, uh, for example, rotavirus will cause this. Autoimmune disease, congenital lactase deficiency, it's rare and it's due to a defective gene. Still demonstrates uh, decreased pH and breath, sh breath shows increased hydrogen content. With lactose hydrogen breath test. Hydrogen is produced when colonic bacteria ferment undigested lactose. Intestinal biopsy reveals normal mucosa in patients with hereditary lactose intolerance. Intestinal biopsy reveals normal mucosa in patients with hereditary lactose intolerance. Okay. Because it's not going to cause any problem with the brush border. That's why. Uh, how, for the lactose deficiency, they'll give you this. Uh, the stool demonstrates decreased uh, pH. And uh, bread shows increased hydrogen content. They'll give you one or the other. If they give you both, that's even better. Uh, with not lactose, but hydrogen breath test. That's what they always say. Uh, they might say that they, the person had rotavirus infection when they were younger. Uh, or they might even say that in their diet, whenever they eat or drink uh, dairy products, that's when uh, they get the cramps or whatever. So findings, what do they have? The findings are bloating, cramps, flatulence, all due to fermentation of lactose by colonic bacteria, which leads to gas. Uh, and osmotic diarrhea is because of undigested lactose. Treatment is avoid dairy products and add lactase pills to diet. Uh, drink lactose-free uh, milk. 
amino acids. Uh, only L amino acids are found in protein. Okay, so essentials. Essentials are phenylalanine, valine, tryptophan, threonine, isoleucine, methionine, histidine, leucine, lysine. Uh, so you need to know the essential ones. Just know them because they do test you on something out of this. So glucogenic are uh, methionine, histidine, valine. Uh, glucogenic, ketogenic are isoleucine, phenylalanine, threonine, and tryptophan. Ketogenic, these are really important They because they'll, like I said, They'll say that uh, the person is on keto diet and then what uh, essential amino acids are necessary to supplement. So then it's going to be one of these in the answers you pick. Leucine and lysine. Uh, acidic, aspartic acid and glutamic acid. Also went over this one earlier, uh, but the person is ha going through uh, metabolic acidosis and then they're like oh, what amino acid should you give if you wanted to give an amino acid then it is it going to be aspartic or glutamic it's going to be glutamic acid that you give it's because of its involvement in making uh, ammonia and ammonium and then excreting out that which will lower the pH uh, increase the pH I guess negatively charged at body pH basic arginine histidine lysine arginine is most basic histidine has no charge at body ph uh, arginine and histidine are required during periods of growth arginine and lysine are increased in histones which bind negatively charged dna uh, i'm not too worried about this one so just remember these and uh, ketogenics and don't confuse it with other stuff. You need to also know uh, what odd chain ones are. So, oh my God. so these are the ones that are used uh, by odd chain fatty acids uh, to make such not going to make. So it's valine and isoleucine. Leucine is not part of it. So with the help of branch chain keto acid dehydrogenase, it's going to make propanol coenzyme A. And then, uh, odd chain, uh, odd carbon fatty acids are going to use that to make melanol, methyl melanol coenzyme A to go into succinyl coenzyme A. Okay. Uh, urea cycle. Uh, already went through urea cycle, but amino acid catabolism generates common metabolites. Uh, pyruvate acetyl coenzyme A, which serves as metabolic fuel. Excess nitrogen is converted to urea and excreted by the kidney. Uh, I'll do it this one. Okay. So you have ammonia uh, and 2ADP, it's like HCO3 uh, coming in to make carbamyl phosphate with the help of carbamyl phosphate synthase 1 which is stimulated or activated by an acetyl glutamine uh, yeah so uh, this happens in the mitochondrial matrix of hepatocytes in the liver uh, with carbamyl phosphate uh, with the help of ornithine transcarbamylase and ornithine, it makes citrulline, and then citrulline gets transported out of the mitochondrial matrix into the cytoplasm to make uh, arginosuccinate. With the help of arginosuccinate synthase uh, and aspartate. Aspartate is used here. That's an amino acid. Uh, ATP, and we'll return to that. So arginosuccinate, arginosuccinate lies will give off fumarate. This is where you get fumarate in the TCA cycle uh, to make arginine. With the help of arginase, uh, you get urea. And then what's left over is ornithine. 
and then Oritenko can transport into the mitochondrial matrix to do the cycle again. Okay, so that's what this is. So you need to remember which part of uh, of urea cycle is inside the mitochondria and which part is outside of it. The inside part is the one where uh, carbon Y-phosphatase synthase one is, and uh, citrulline becomes ornithine, and then sorry, ornithine becomes citrulline, and citrulline then goes out. Okay, this one goes this way. Uh, similarly, aspartate, arginosuccinate synthase, arginosuccinate lyase, fumarate, arginase goes to urea to kidney, and all that. Uh, out of all this, remember uh, this part. Uh, when you have increase in ammonia and auritic acid, that means you have ornithine transcarbamylase deficiency. Um, that's why does this happen is because when you have ornithine transcarbamylase deficiency, you're going to have buildup of this carbamyl phosphate. Then carbamyl phosphate goes into the uh, primitive base production. Uh, there it is. And that will create more and more auritic acid because there's so much buildup of carbamyl phosphate, you're going to have auritic acid. And that's why you get increase in auritic acid. Uh, for both carbamyl phosphate, phosphate synthase are weight limiting, primitive base and uh, urea cycle. Those are the weight limiting factors. Okay. Transport ammonia by alanine. Uh, this is where the glutamate, uh, white glutamate, we give um, glutamic acid. Glutamate uh, turns into glutamate, by the way. So amino acid uh, makes alpha keto acid, which also converts alpha keto glutamate into glutamate. Glutamate then uh, goes on to become alanine uh, when you have pyruvate. So pyruvate will become alanine with the help of glutamate, which then can, uh, why do you need to do that? It's so that it can tra transport out of the muscles into the blood all the way to the liver. So that's how you transport amino acids in the form of alanine. Uh, in liver, alpha ketoglutarate with alanine, again, will turn into pyruvate and glutamate, and then you get glutamate going into urea. Okay, uh, I think there is... Nope. Okay, I don't have it here, but... Yeah, that's the basis of it. Just know this whole process. That alpha keto glutarate goes into glutamate, not the other way around. <clears throat> Again, even in the liver, alpha keto glutarate combines with amino acid alanine. The same as here, amino acid and alpha keto glutarate, alanine and alpha keto glutarate to make glutamate. Okay. Uh, what happens? Pyruvate becomes glucose. Then with the Cahill cycle, it goes back into this. Okay. Hyperammonia, what happens when you have a lot of ammonia? Uh, Esterexis, that's what you get. That's the buzzword for this. Uh, it can be acquired, uh, for example, liver disease or hereditary, uh, for example, urea cycle enzyme deficiencies. Presence with flap presents with a flapping tremor, that's asterixis, slurring of speech, salmonin, vomiting, cerebral edema, and blurring of vision. Increase in uh, NH3 changes, uh, or ammonia, changes relative amounts of alpha ketoglutarate, uh, glutamate, GABA, and glutamine to favor increase in glutamine. CNS, CNS toxicity may involve decrease in GABA, uh, decrease in alpha ketoglutarate, TCA cycle inhibition, and cerebral edema due to glutamine induced osmotic shifts. Treatment is limit protein in diet. Uh, may be given to decrease ammonia levels. What? Well, Lactulose, um, you should know that. You give lactulose 
to acidify GI tract and transport and trap uh, NH4 for excretion. Antibiotics, for example, rifaximine to decrease amniogenic bacteria, so bacteria that generate ammonia, ammoniogenic, I guess. So you destroy them. Uh, you give lactulose to acidify GI tract. Uh, benzoate, phenyl acetate, and phenyl butyrate to react with glycine and glutamine, forming products that are excreted renally. You have alpha ketoglutarate here, NH3 comes in um, with, into glutamate, so glutamate is combined with NH3. Uh, with the help of B6, it can make GABA, or with more NH3, it will make uh, glutamate and then you have the H ions going away. So it will reduce the, uh, it will increase the pH, but reduce the acidity. When you have increased acidity, you're not gonna have other stuff making more, uh, have H ions absorbed. So it's gonna be trapped in the trap. Ornithine transcarbamylase and deficiency. So if you have, oh, this is the one that I was talking about, okay. So let me put it here a second. Okay, so if you have this deficiency of this thing right here, most common urea cycle disorder, X-linked recessive versus other urea cycle enzyme deficiencies, which are autosomal recessive, interferes with the body's ability to eliminate ammonia, often evident in the first few days of life, but may present later. Excess carbamyl phosphate is converted to orotic acid, part of the primidine synthesis, path synthesis pathway. Let's go to that one too. Okay, so if there's buildup of fear, it's gonna go into this pathway from your base uh, production. Your carbon phosphate buildup, that's what they're saying, and which goes into with the help of aspartate to make uh, oritic acid. Uh, oritic acid is part of the primary pathway. Findings are increase in oritic acid in blood and urine, decrease in blood urea nitrogen, symptoms of hyperammonium, uh, hypo, hyperammonemia, no megaloblastic anemia versus aortic uh, aciduria. So when you have aortic aciduria, uh, I guess you would have megaloblastic anemia. So increase in aortic acid is not the same as aortic aciduria, I guess. Okay, that's weird. I don't want to go into that. Okay, you know that now. Amino acid derivatives. This is important. They ask a lot about this. Especially you need to know what tetrahydrobiotarine is. So I'll refer to that as BH4. Uh, phenylalanine with uh, BH4. We're going to making tyrosine. Tyrosine makes dopa. Dopa makes dopamine. Dopamine makes uh, norepinephrine which also makes epinephrine. Uh, the intermediates are, you need BH4 to make tyrosine. You, uh, tyrosine can make tyroxine, but when you have BH4, then you can make also DOPA. Uh, DOPA makes melanin. Uh, melanin is the pigment. Uh, and melatonin is the sleep. I think. Yeah. Uh, DOPA, B6. You need uh, pyridoxine to make dopamine. You need vitamin C or ascorbic acid to make any. You need SAM to make epinephrine. Tryptophan. Tryptophan with the presence of uh, riboflavin and B6 pyridoxine, you make niacin. So, and 
yes, it goes down to the insanity and we need that for energy and everything. Uh, with pH 4 and B6, uh, you make serotonin. Serotonin goes on to make melatonin. Uh, melatonin is what people take when they have insomnia or they can't sleep. Uh, histidine, B6, with the presence of B6, you make histamine. Uh, glycine, with B6, porphyrine. Porphyrine goes on to make heme. Let's look at heme synthesis real quick. So right there. So we were talking about porphyrine. So that's your this stuff right here. You need B6 for this stuff. Uh, glutamate B6 will make GABA. Or if you don't have B6, it will go on to make glutathione. Arginine goes on to make creatine, creatine, uh, urea, and nitric oxide. Uh, BH4. Creatine is useful for muscles. Uh, people take that as supplements, uh, trainers. Uh, urea is good to take out. Uh, waste and nitric oxide, also known for vasodilation. Uh, yeah, so don't forget about this. Uh, deficiency of this and this tetrahydrobiopterine uh, will cause phenylketoyuria. That's why it's important. It causes PKU. PKU is, our uh, buzzword is musty odor. So then I need to tyrosine. So this thing right here don't happen. Okay, uh, catecholamine synthesis. Don't stay like this. Okay. Catecholamine synthesis, tyrosine, catabolism. <coughs> I am getting tired. Okay, we have like 10 pages to go. Uh, Catecholamine synthesis, tyrosine catabolism, phenylalanine, tyrosine, uh, BH4, phenylalanine hydroxylase, PKU. Just told you guys about that one. Uh, with the tyrosine, it can go into this uh, homogenic uh, acid where you get melanyl acetoacetic acid and fumarate to go into TCA. But when you don't have uh, homogeneous cetate, Days, you get l urea. For l urea, the buzzwords are dark urine, uh, some kind of pigment on the ear, or just dark ear by itself. Uh, that's what arthrosis is, and then arthritis. Uh, black ear cartilage, that's what it was, and black sclera is this. Okay, okay. So, black your cartilage, black sclera, arthritis, dark urine. They might say the toddler uh, forgot to flush the urine. So in the morning when they checked, it was dark. Then you know it's l urea. And it happens because of deficiency of homogeneity state uh, oxidase. Okay, uh, so that's done, that's done. Now, when you have tyrosine hydroxylase to make dopa with B4, dopa makes melanin in presence of tyrosinase. You don't have tyrosinase, then you don't have melanin, the pigment, so you get albinism. Uh, okay, so dopa carboxylase is what carbidopa blocks. We'll learn about that in neuro. Uh, dopamine makes homovalinic. This is a, just a breakdown of dopamine. It's like a metabolized product. Uh, norepinephrine makes vinylmelanolic acid. That's also like a metabolized product. Uh, Catacoomethyltransferase and monamine oxidase. Uh, phenylalanine and methyltransferase. Sam, English, English. Okay. 
Uh, Sam is important. Because this thing right here, and it's involved with this. This is Sam right here. Is it? I think it is. I'm not sure now. Almost the same. Yeah, that's what this looks like. Now I forgot what I was looking for. Yeah, okay. Uh, let's just go over the deficiencies for this. So you need uh, B12 for this, for SAM to go into homocysteine, and homocysteine to go to methionine, you need B12. And you need B12 to go into methionine so you can uh, have THF. Uh, THF is important for many things, uh, but you also need B2 for you have to go into this so this cycle to happen but you also need b6 to go into cystathione uh, and b6 for cystine okay so b12 and b6 are very important when it comes to that so you'll be tested on these three things on this i guess uh, phenyl ketone urea, okay. Caused by, okay. caused by decreased phenyl alanine hydroxylase or pH. Tyrosine becomes essential. Increased phenyl alanine. So if you don't have uh, phenyl alanine hydroxylase, you can just supplement tyrosine. But then it becomes essential. Uh, increase in phenyl alanine leads to increase in phenyl ketones in urine. Uh, BH4 deficiency, if you have BH4 deficiency, it's essential cofactor for pH. BH4 deficiency leads to increase in phenyl alanine because you need that to go into tyrosine. So if you don't have that, you're just going to have build up like this. Uh, leads to increase in phenylalanine, varying degrees of cl clinical severity. Untreated patients typically die in infancy. Phenylalanine embryopathy. Increase in phenylalanine levels in pregnant patients with untreated PKU can cause fetal growth restriction. Microcephaly, intellectual disability, congenital heart defects can be prevented with dietary measures. So it's all about diet here if you don't have it. Uh, autosomal recessive screen occurs two to three days after birth, normal at birth because of maternal enzyme during fetal life. Findings are intellectual disability, microcephaly, seizures, hypopigmented skin, eczema, musty body odor. Treatment here is decreased phenylalanine and increase in tyrosine in diet. For example, soy products, skin, uh, sorry, soy products, chicken, fish, milk. Tetrahydropterine supplementation, phenyl ketones, uh, phenyl acetate. Wait, ten minutes. Need the break. Phenyl acetate, phenyl lactate, and phenyl pyruvate. Disorder of aromatic amino acid metabolism leads to musty body odor. Buzzword. This they will give you this, or synonym of this. Uh, patients with PKU must avoid the artificial sweetener aspartame. This is very important, which contains phenylalanine. So they might say that uh, the person is avoiding sugar, but they had a sweetener, and most of the sweeteners include aspartame. So uh, then the symptoms arise. Symptoms are this. Uh, hypopigmented uh, or eczema, sorry, and musty body odor kind of thing. 
So you have dietary protein uh, or aspartame or endogenous protein, phenylalanine, phenylalanine, uh, going into tyrosine, uh, phenylalanine hydroxylase. All of this stuff needs this. All of this stuff needs this. Pretty straightforward. Now, maple syrup urine disease. That's when you have uh, deficiency of brown chain keto acid dehydrogenase. You get maple syrup urine disease. Urine has odor of maple syrup or burnt sugar smell. We also say that. Uh, or sweet smell to the urine. Something to, that sounds like sweet, because uh, they might not say maple syrup. Um, mental retardation, abnormal muscle tone, ketosis, coma, death. So here the buzzword is this. Urine has odor of maple syrup or burnt sugar smell. Drug degradation of branched amino acids. Isoleucine, leucine, valine. Due to decreased branch chain alpha keto acid dehydrogenase or BN. causes include uh, increase causes increased alpha keto acids in the blood, especially those of leucine. Treatment is restriction of isoleucine, leucine, valine in diet, because that's what they use: isoleucine, leucine, valine, uh, and it branch chain keto acid dehydrogenase is required to metabolize these things. So. Uh, you don't have that, so you don't take it. And really, uh, and uh, in diet and timing supplementation is key for this. Okay. Uh, out of the recessive presentation, vomiting, poor feeding, urine smells like maple syrup or burnt sugar. There you go. They give you that. Causes progressive neurologic decline. l captonuria that's uh, that thing right here, I'll come to you, yeah. uh, Congenital deficiency of homogenicitate uh, oxidase in the degradative pathway of tyrosine to fumarate leads to pigment forming homogenic acid builds up in tissue. Autosomal recessive, usually benign. Uh, findings, bluish black con connective tissue, ear collateral. Uh, cartilage and sclera. So bluish black connective tissue, ear cartilage and sclera. Buzzwords. Uh, Arcanosis. They even, they might even straight out give you this. Arcanosis. But you need to know what that means. So that's just uh, black sclera. Uh, urine turns black on prolonged exposure to air. Again, toddler went to void himself. But then he forgot to flush, and then next morning the parents noticed that the urine is black. May have debilitating uh, arthralgias, homogenicitic acid toxic to cartilage. Okay, let's take a break. Uh, cystathione synthase deficiency. Treatment is decrease in methionine, increase in cysteine, increase in B6, B12, and folate in diet. Before we do that, let's just understand the cycle. So you have homocysteine right here, uh, which goes on to make methionine with the help of methionine synthase and methyl B12. Uh, you need B12 for this. Methyl B12, you get that from methylfolate B12. Right. So then uh, the other side of hom homocysteine or homocysteine is uh, this side was methionine, this side is cysteine. So first it makes cystathione uh, with the help of serine uh, and B6 and cystathione synthase. So cystathione synthase will make cystathione. Cystathione will then go on to making cysteine with the help of B6. So that's the other side. So now say we don't have cystathione synthase, defi uh, synthase right? There's a deficiency for this. Then uh, homocysteine can't make cystathione. Then it's going to go on to making more methionine. So to make more of this and avoid having buildup of this, you decrease this. So this can go on making this. Because if you have a lot of 
of methionine, then homocysteine is going to stop making more methionine. So then you get buildup of homocysteine. So to avoid that, you decrease methionine. Uh, you increase cysteine because you don't have that being made. Uh, you increase B6, so whatever it can make, it will try to with the help of B6. So we have that. Uh, B12 and folate, you give that in diet. So it can make more methionine to avoid getting built up of this. Decrease affinity of cystathione synthase uh, for paradoxal phosphate. Uh, treatment is increase in B6 and increase in cysteine in diet. It's the same thing. Uh, methionine synthase, if you have deficiency of this, uh, homocysteine methyl transferase, you're gonna just flip it. Deficiency, uh, treatment is increase in methionine and diet. So you give more of this, because that's not being made anymore. This will keep on going and making this because you don't have deficiency of B6 or this or this, so you don't need that. But you do need this. Uh, methyl, methylene tetrahydrofolate reductase or MTHFR deficiency. So you don't have this uh, right there, that thing right there, MTHFR. Um, and treatment is folate in diet because that's what it does, right? So you give folic acid to make THF if you can't make it in this cycle. All forms result in excess homocysteine. Uh, homocysteine urea increases homocysteine in urine, osteoporosis, marfanoid uh, habitus. Okay, so when you have homocysteine urea, you got to differentiate it between uh, marfan syndrome because it's similar uh, presentation. So you'll have increase in homocysteine in urine, osteoporosis, marfanoid habitus, uh, ocular changes, downward and inward subluxation of lens, uh, cardiovascular effects or thrombosis and arth arthrosclerosis. It leads to stroke and MI. Uh, kyphosis, that happens in marfans too. Uh, intellectual disability, hypopigmented skin. In hemocysteine urea, lens subluxes down and in versus marfan up and fans out. Because fan is on the ceiling, so it goes up like that. So the other one goes down. Oh, okay. Done with that. Cysteine urea. So when you have hereditary defect of renal PCT, uh, an intestinal amino acid transporter that prevents reabsorption of cysteine, ornithine, lysine, and arginine. If you have a problem with one of them, like a deficiency of one of them, chances are you have deficiency for all three, uh, all of these as well. So cysteine, uh, ornithine, lysine, and arginine. Cysteine is made up of two cysteines. Uh, connected by a disulfide bond. So you have two of these connected to make cysteine. Uh, excess cysteine in the urine can lead to recurrent precipitation of hexagonal cysteine stones. Okay, that's the what it looks like. We'll go over this uh, again in uh, renal. Uh, treatment is urinary alkanization. Uh, for example, potassium citrate or acetazolamide and chelating agents like penicillamide. Uh, increase in, it increases uh, solubility of cysteine stones. So good, uh, keep good hydration, uh, diet low in methionine. So homocysteine would go on to making this instead of this. Autosomal recessive, common, one in 7,000. Cysteine urea detected with urinary sodium cyanide nitroprusside test and proton nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy of urine. Organic acidemias uh, most commonly presents in infancy with poor feeding, vomiting, hypotonia, high anion gap, metabolic acidosis, uh, hepatomegaly, and seizures.
organic acid accumulation uh, okay. uh, inhibits gluconeogenesis leads to decreased fasting blood glucose levels increase in uh, ketoacidosis leads to high anion gap metabolic acidosis inhibits urea cycle uh, leads to hyperammonemia uh, propionic uh, acidemia uh, acidemia then okay uh, deficiency of propanol co coenzyme E carboxylase. So let's look at that. So it's this thing right here. So propionic acidemia, when do you get propionic acidemia? When you have a uh, deficiency of propionyl coenzyme carboxylase right here. So you're gonna get buildup of propionyl coenzyme. So increase in propionyl coenzyme and you have decreased methanol um, melanoic acid right here. You won't have that. You have buildup of this because there's a deficiency of this. Uh, then you have methyl melanoic acidemia. Deficiency of methanol coenzyme mutates so methyl melanyl coenzyme A doesn't go on to make succinyl coenzyme A because of this deficiency, either this or deficiency of vitamin B12. So you get buildup of this, which causes acidemia. Treatment is low protein diet, limited in substance that metabolizes into propanol coenzyme A. So that's your, these things right here, valine, uh, isoleucine, and then you have methionine and threonine, so vomit, arginine, fatty acids as well. Uh, it's the same thing here. Uh, glycogen regulation by insulin and glucagon and or epinephrine. So you have glucagon here uh, in the liver, uh, epinephrine, liver and muscles, uh, epinephrine here, and insulin in the liver and muscle over here. Uh, the receptors are tyrosine kinase dimer receptor. Uh, okay. So when you're doing, say you eat food, right? What's gonna happen? Uh, insulin's gonna get released. When insulin gets released, it goes on to activate protein phosphatase, uh, which will go on to uh, induce glycogen storage or synthase, sorry, glycogen synthase to make glycogen, so store glucose. That's what insulin does. Right. So, uh, and it will also directly uh, stimulate glycogen synthase or the formation of glycogen. Protein kinase A inhibits glycogen synthase. It will make sense in a second when we do this because protein kinase A stimulates glycogen phosphorylase kinase, which is essentially breakdown of uh, glycogen. So if you're going to break down glycogen, you don't want glucose making more glycogen then that's just double the work so it's like that uh epinephrine and this okay so glucagon what it's going to do is uh with the help of uh what atp uh you get uh, adin and adenylate cyclase atp converts into camp and then camp uh stimulates protein kinase a Protein kinase A then goes on to stimulate uh, glycogen phosphorylase kinase, which then activates glycogen phosphorylase, to, uh, which converts glycogen into glucose. So this is breakdown of glycogen or gluconeogenesis as well, or glycogenolysis, sorry. Okay. Uh, here we have calcium, calmodulin in muscle during contraction. So when that happens, you also need glucose because muscles use glucose. So that will activate this as well, phosphorylase kinase. Uh, epinephrine in the, with uh, attaching to the alpha receptor will go to, a signal will go to endoplasmic reticulum, which will uh, release calcium. And this calcium will again do the same thing through this path 
or it will directly go and activate um, glycogen phosphorylic kinase to activate those and pick up glucose. So same as protein kinase, activating this and inhibiting glycogen synthase. Similarly, protein phosphatase will activate glycogen synthase but inhibit glycogen phosphorylase kinase. So if you're doing one, you don't want the other. So that's how that is regulated. Glycogen. Glycogen um, branches have alpha 1,6 bonds. Linear linkage have alpha 1,4 bonds. Skeletal muscles, glycogen undergoes glycogenolysis, leads to glucose 1-phosphate to glucose 6-phosphate, which is rapidly metabolized <laughs> during exercise. Hepatocytes, glycogen is stored and undergoes glycogenolysis to maintain blood sugar at appropriate levels. Glycogen phosphorylase uh, 4, okay, so for there, I guess. Okay, that's where it is. Uh, liberates glucose one phosphate residue of branched glycogen until four glucose units remain on a branch. Then four alpha D gluconotransferase D branching enzymes five moves three of the four glucose units from the branch to the linear linkage. The then alpha one six um, glucosidase D branching enzymes cleaves off the last residue, liberating of free glucose. Okay. And then limit dextrin. Two to four residues remain on a branch after glycogen phosphorus have shortened it. Okay. So let's look at this. A small amount of glycogen is degraded by in lysosomes by alpha 1 for glucosidase or acid maltase. So it starts over here. You have glucose. Uh, glucose breaks uh, down into glycogen. How? It goes from glucose to glucose 6P to glucose 1P. Then from here, it goes with the help of UDP glucose phos pyrophosphorylase, right? Uh, it becomes UDP glucose. With UDP glucose um, and glycogen synthase, you get glycogen. That's similar to up till here, we have it this thing so we can follow it on this until there okay so you have glucose glucose 6 p to glucose 1 p then with the help of udp uh, glucose uh, here you have udp glucose pyrophosphorylase would be right here uh, UTP becomes PPA, okay. And then uh, with the help of glycogen synthase, you get glycogen. Then this thing stops working for us. From here, glycogen, how does it get stored in the liver? Like you can't just have long ass chains just, you know, sitting on, in your liver. So what they do is they break it down uh in steps so three branching enzymes right for here where'd it go nope so first you have the branching enzymes making it into this so it's going to attach it with other glycogen products like that then uh you have glycogen phosphorylase it's basically going to cut it down so you have uh one, two, three, and four here and stuff. One, two, three, four, five, six. So it's gonna keep attaching it uh, until you have one left. So it's gonna attach and then cut off and whatever's cut off is gonna go ahead and attach somewhere else and then cut off again until at the end all you have is left one. Okay, uh, so until four glucose, uh, okay. So we reach four, glycogen phosphorylase. Liberates glucose one phosphate residue of branch glycogen until four glucose units remain on a branch. Uh, okay, 
So when they say four or the numbers, like one, six, and four, that's just explaining the location on the rat chain. So four would be like one, two, three, four. So after four or like that. No, this is one, two, three, and four, like that. Okay. So when you have one, six, it's saying that it's one left at the sixth position, like that. It's something like that. It doesn't make sense over here. From but that's what that is. Uh, Debranching inside, uh, cleaves off the last residue, and liberating of free glucose. So that when this goes off, this is cut off by debranching enzyme. Debranching enzyme is the last step. So then you don't have any left. Okay, so First, you have debranching enzyme uh, at 4 alpha D gluconeotransferase transferase right there. Then you have debranching enzyme at alpha 1 6 glucosidase. And then you have alpha 1 4 glucosidase. So now you just have alpha 1 4. Oh, that's over here. Never mind. So 6 is the last step on this side. And then you have lysosomes, but this is going to be your. Uh, Pompe disease. So now we're gonna do. I'll just keep this because now we're gonna do the diseases. So over here you have Van Burke's disease. Over here you have uh, Anderson's disease. Uh, over here you have Pompe's. Here you have McArdle's. Here you have Corey's disease and same thing here, debranching enzymes, so Corey's disease. Okay, uh, glycogen storage disease. At least 15 types have been identified. All results in abnormal glycogen metabolism and an accumulation of glycogen within cells. Periodic acid shift uh, stain identifies glycogen and is useful in identifying these diseases so if they tell you that they're doing the past stain uh, and something showed up then you know it's glycogen diseases but i think it, they use the same one here too. Nope. okay uh for this i'm gonna look at my notes most of it is from dirty medicine Okay, so same thing. Uh, at least 15 types have been identified, all resulting in abnormal glycogen metabolism and an accumulation of glycogen within cells. Uh, periodic acid shift uh, stain identifies glycogen and is useful in identifying those diseases. Vice presidents don't can't accept money. Type 1 to 5 are autosomal recessive. Anderson is branching, Corey is debranching. A, B, and C, D. That's helpful. Understanding is branching here. Corey is deep branching. Uh, one Groves disease. Severe fasting hypoglycemia. Increase in glycogen and liver and kidney. Increase in blood lactate. Increase in triglyceride. Increase in uric acid. Gout. And hepatomegaly. Renomegaly. Liver does not regulate blood glucose. Okay. Because. Uh, why? Because of glycogen storage disease. So that uh, the presentation is going to be that the person is fat uh, with decreased muscle mass, and he's going to have a fatty liver. So instead of one GERD disease, you can think of it like one geek disease. Because uh, that when you think of a geek, you think of him being fat with a fatty liver and decreased muscle mass. Uh, that's basically what the presentation is going to be like as well. You have uh, hepatomegaly, gout, triglycerides, um, blood lactate. Uh, liver does not regulate blood glucose. Okay. Uh, deficient enzyme here is blood um, glucose six phosphatase. Uh, comment treatment 
is uh, frequent oral glucose cornstarch, avoidance of fructose and galactose, impaired gluconeogenesis, and glycogenolysis. Because anything to do with um, glycogen, either breakdown of glycogen or you know, making of glucose. It's gonna have a problem with Pompeii. Pompeii is uh, Pompeii was a Pompeii's Mount Vesuvius, which explodes. That's how Dirty Medicine explained it. So it's something to do with heart that explodes. That's what Pompeii disease is. So pump, you can go to pump like that. Uh, cardiomyopathy, hypotonia, exercise intolerance, and systemic findings lead to early death. This one will will have in the presentation that the person died and it's going to be a young patient. Uh, one of the presentation had enlarged tongue in it. So look out for that. If you have, uh, if they figure, if you figure out it's a glycogen storage disease and then there's an enlarged tongue, it's going to be pompid disease. Uh, the deficient enzyme here is lysosomal acid, acid alpha one four glucose glucosidase. Uh, I'm gonna have to like click go here so we can look at the heat. Okay, so we just did one group and now we're doing Pompeii. That's this one right here. So since uh, this happens only in lysosomes, uh, the deficient enzyme here would be lysosomal acid uh, at alpha 1, 4 glucosidase. So that's alpha 1, 4 glucosidase right there. Uh, acid maltase with alpha 1, 6 glucosidase activity. You will have alpha-1-6 glucosidase, which is debranching enzyme, this will be okay, but this won't. Uh, Pompe uh, thrashes the pump, first and fourth letter, heart, liver, and muscle. Uh, Hepatomegaly. Happens in this as well, okay. So enlarged tongue, hepatomegaly, and a patient who had cardiac early death due to cardiac reasons uh, all lead to pompe disease Cori's disease cd that's deep branching inside uh alpha one gl glucosidase and four alpha d glucotransferase uh you have accumulation of glycogen structure in this one so similar to one GERC disease but milder symptoms and normal but lactic levels can lead to cardiomyopathy. Limit dextrin. This is the buzzword. They might give you this. That they did the stain and then they found uh, limit dextrin like structures accumulate in the cytosol. If they gave you limit dextrin just click on Cori disease because that's what it is. Uh, or they might even ask you what the deficient enzyme is. Right. So Cori disease, where is that? That's this thing, deep branching enzymes. Uh, okay. So you, the way you remember it, it's coral V, because that's what Cori sounds like, and coral V have branch plants. Uh, so deep branching enzyme, but I like the A B C D one better. Okay. Uh, you have enlarged liver here and enlarged muscles as well because you have limit dextrin building up in, in the cells. Uh, gluconeogenesis is intact. That's why it's milder than von GERC. Here, impaired gluconeogenesis and glycosinolysis. Okay, uh, so uh, Anderson's disease, straight to the point, Anderson Cooper. 
uh, if you watch CNN or you know about that, uh, there's a newscaster named Anderson Cooper. He always gets to the point. Uh, most commonly presents with hyperosplenomegaly and failure to thrive in early infancy. Other findings include infantile cirrhosis, muscular weakness, hypertonia, cardiomyopathy, early childhood death. So if you have storage disease with death, it could either be pompase or this. For pompase, it's going to be uh, heart-related death. For here, same thing, heart-related death. But you might even have cirrhosis, infantile cirrhosis. Uh, so branching enzyme. Uh, neuromuscular form can present at any age. I'm trying to figure out why I wrote this. <laughs> At this point, I don't remember, but okay. Anderson drinks, so he has cirrhosis and hypotonia, so he's weak and has heart problems. Okay. So that's how you remember that. Uh, Anderson Cooper, yeah, so that dude will drink. He drinks, uh, so he's weak. Uh, he's hypotonia. He has hypotonia and heart problems. Hypoglycemia occurs late in the disease. Then you have metacardial disease. Uh, this one is uh, Anderson's disease. I don't think it's asked much. They do ask about these three a lot. And they ask about metacardial a lot. Uh, metacardial disease, muscles. Increase in glycogen in muscles, but muscle cannot break it down. Painful muscle cramps, myoglobinuria, um, with strenuous exercise and arrhythmia from electrolyte abnormalities, second wind phenomena noted during exercise due to increased muscular blood flow. So you'll have a patient who was out playing with friends or something, and then uh, it started hurting. So they took a rest, and after a few minutes of rest, they were again able to play. Uh, and then when they pee, when they have that the, the pain, uh, it's going to be red. So this is really easy to identify out of all of them because it's very particular and classic presentation. Uh, you will get it right away. Skeletal muscle glycogen phosphorylase is deficient in this. Myophosphorylase characterized by a flat venous lactate curve with normal rise in ammonia levels during exercise. Blood glucose levels typically unaffected mycardial muscles. Since this is skeletal muscle glycogen phosphorylase uh, deficient enzyme, what about uh, liver glycogen phosphorylase, right? So when you have deficiency of liver glycogen phosphorylase, it's called HERS disease. HERS H for hepatic. So you have hepatomegaly, mild fasting hypoglycemia, and you'll have cirrhosis. So that's it. Done with that. Now on to lysosomal storage disease. Okay, so lysosomal enzyme deficiency uh, leads to accumulation of abnormal metabolic products, increased incidence of Tay-Sachs, name and pick, and some form of Gaucher's disease in Ashkenazi Jews. Uh, okay, so you have disease findings, deficient enzymes, accumulated substrates, and inheritance. Okay, so whenever you have uh, DASH, like that one, in Tay-Sachs or Neyman Pick, uh, you're gonna have a cherry red spot. Okay. Uh, so you have that cherry red spot in Tay-Sachs, you have it in cherry red spot in Neyman Pick. Okay. Uh, progressive neurodegeneration, developmental delay, hyperreflexia, hyperacusis, cherry red spot on macula. Uh, out of all of these, 
they're always going to mention that they have cherry red spot. So you will, uh, you know, cut it down to taste that and name and pick. Then they'll tell you if there is uh, hepatosplenomegaly or hepatomegaly or not. Uh, if they don't have it, it's going to be taste X disease. If they do have hepatosplenomegaly, it's going to be your name and pick disease. Uh, they might or might not give you the other stuff, but this is the buzzword right here. These two things, that and that. Uh, the deficient enzyme is hexaminidase A. So if you look at this thing right here, so that's where it would be that's two that's two So hexaminidase uh, is deficient. So what you get is accumulated GM2 glycoside, gangliosides. Uh, inheritance is AR. So if this is deficient, you're going to get more of GM2, right? So then uh, the mnemonic dirty medicine game came up with was, oh no, a gang of six small Jews kicked me in the sacks. So a gang for gangliosides accumulate six small Jews. It's very common in uh, Ashkenazi Jews. Kick me in the sacks, taste sacks. Uh, a gang of six. Okay, the six is for hex. So that's what six is about, the hex. That's how you remember that. Hex so many days, A. Remember that. All right. On to Febreze. Febreze disease, early. Uh, triad of episodic peripheral neuropathy, angiokeratomas, and hypohydrosis. Late is progressive renal failure, cardiovascular disease. Here you have deficient enzyme is alpha galactosidase A and accumulated substrate as ceramide trihexidase that's this thing right here. So you need alpha galactosidase to make glucocerebroside, but it doesn't. So you have to look up this. Okay. Uh, the classic presentation is hyd uh, hypohydrosis, uh, decreased sweating, angiokeratomas, uh, and renal failure. Renal failure it is. Okay. Uh, peripheral neuropathy as well. Okay, so peripheral neuropathy. Classic presentation. Okay. Now uh, the mnemonic for this is my favorite uh, activity is making a ceramic galaxy. So from galaxy you get galactosidase. Ceramic is for ceramide trihexidase. This one right here. Uh, sorry to keep harping on it. So harping on it is H four. Hypohydrosis, A is for angiokeratomas, R is for renal failure, P is for peripheral neuropathy. Uh, try to get that from that. Uh, metachromatic leukodystrophy, that's right here. For this one, it's central and peripheral demyelination with ataxia and dementia. Uh, the deficient enzyme is aryl-sulfatase A, and you'll get buildup of cerebroside sulfates, so sulfatides. Okay. Uh, the mnemonic he came up with was uh, Metapod is a Pokemon. Uh, the Pokemon is, you know, pretty dumb. It doesn't do anything. So he either has dementia kind of thing peripheral demyelination with the taxia. Just think of it that way. Uh, Metapod is a real broken Pokemon. A real. So that's 
a real Socrates. And you, if you don't have that, then you get the level of Socrates or Socrates. Crab disease. The globe of gooey crab is out of this world. Okay. Uh, peripheral neuropathy. Destruction of oligodendrocytes. Developmental delay. Optic atrophy and globoid cells. So GUI is globoid cells. Uh, out of this world is going to tell you that it's galactocerebrosidase because galacto is the galaxy out of the world kind of thing. And that is who it is. And crabby means GUI out of this world. And glob. Okay, so glob was uh, the word cell. So this one is over here. So it goes from galactocerebroside to make ceramide. So when it can do that, you can build up a galactocerebroside. Uh, this is an easy one because both of them have galactocerebroside and galactocerebroside. And, uh, and the deficient enzyme and accumulation. And Gosh's disease. Uh, the classic presentation is crumbled up tissue paper like lipid lane macrophages. So most common cautious disease. Hepatos you'll have hepatosplenomegaly, pancytopenia, uh, osteoporosis, avascular necrosis of femur, bone crisis, and gaucher cells. What are gaucher cells? Lipid lane macrophages. They resemble crumbling tissue paper. They give you this in the question stamp that it looks like a crumbled tissue paper. So that's over here. Uh, the deficient enzyme is glucocerebrosidase, beta glucosidase side uh, treat with recombinant glucocerebrosidase. And it goes on to make ceramide. The accumulated uh, stuff you get is glucocerebrosidase right here. Okay. So this picture is from gross female head avascular necrosis. Never mind, not the picture, but we'll see that. So for this, the mnemonic is, oh my gosh, he's such a sweet bro. And you're saying that in a crying voice. So since you're crying, you need tissue. So oh my gosh is kosher. O is for uh, something. Osteoporosis, I guess. Uh, just remember avascular necrosis of femur as well. And oh my gosh, you're such a sweet bro. Sweet because it has a glue in the name of glucocerebrosidase. And glucocerebrosidase side. So glue glue is the sweet. Osteoporosis is the most common. Neiman Pick disease. Uh, same thing here. They give you cherry red spot and then they tell you if he has omega or not. If he does, then it's Neiman Pick. Uh, Sphingomyelinase and Sphingomyelin is the accumulated one. So Sphingomyelin makes ceramide uh, with the help of Sphingomyelinase. But if you don't have it, you get built up of Sphingomyelin. The mnemonic is you pick your nose with big foamy finger. So big is for hebrosplenomegaly, foamy because of uh, foam cells, which are lipid lane macrophages. Uh, they might not give you hebrosplenomegaly, they might just give you that cherry red spot with foam cells. So, same thing, name and pick. Yeah, foamy. Pick your nose with big foamy finger. Uh, on to this. You can use that one. Uh, you have mucopolysaccharidosis. Uh, these are your Hurler syndrome and Hunter syndrome. Uh, for Hurler syndrome, you have developmental delay, skeletal abnormalities, airway obstruction, cornea clouding, and hepatosplenomegaly. Uh, for Hunter, you have mild Hurler. Uh, aggressive behavior because you're a hunter you're going to be aggressive and uh, 
no cornea clouding because you need your eyes to aim to hunt. So there is no cornea clouding for hunter, but there is for further. Uh, the deficient enzyme is either alpha L iduronidase or idronate 2, 2 sulfate case. Uh, accumulated is hyperin sulfate or hyperin sulfate dermatine sulfate. Same thing. Uh, for hunter, X marks the spot. So XR. So it's X link recessive. Uh, color is autosomal recessive. Uh, just remember something to do with iduronidase or hydrogen, uh, hydronate. Because uh, they won't give you both of these in the answers. They'll give you one of these. So as long as you know it's one of these, uh, when you figure out that it's one of these syndromes, uh, you can get that right. Hunters see clearly no cornea clouding and aggressively aim for the X or X link. Recessive. Uh, fatty acid metabolism. Uh, fatty acid synthesis requires. How much time do we have? Uh, fatty acid synthesis requires transport of citrate from mitochondria to cytosol. Predominantly occurs in liver, lactating memory gland, glands, uh, and adipose tissue. Long chain fatty acids, LCFA degradation, requires carnitine dependent transport into the mitochondrial matrix. Okay. Uh, citrate is for synthesis. Carnitine is for carnage of fatty acid. It helps because that's what this is. Uh, in degradation, you use carnitine shuttle. For synthesis, you use citrate shuttle. Okay. Uh, for systemic uh, primary carnitine deficiency, no cellular uptake of carnitine. So no, so when you don't have that carnitine deficiency, there won't be any fa fatty acid coins that need being picked up. So no cellular uptake of carnitine, no transport of long chain fatty acids into mitochondria. So then you have toxic accumulation of uh, long chain fatty acids in the cytoplasm or cytosol. It causes uh, weakness, hypotonia, hypoketotic hypoglycemia. This is the buzzword for this. They will give you this. That is, uh, and dilated cardiomyopathy. Uh, so that's how you figure that out. That is this. Uh, okay. Uh, medium chain acyl coenzyme A dehydrogenase deficient. This is a little harder to figure out. Because that's the one they ask about most. Uh, decreased ability to break down fatty acid into acetyl, acetyl coenzyme A leads to accumulation of fatty acyl carnitins in the blood with hypoketotic hypoglycemia, causes vomiting, lethargy, seizures, coma, uh, liver dysfunction, hyperammonemia, can lead to sudden death in infants or children by avoiding fasting so here there will be like uh, they went on hiking a family went on hiking and the kid was walking on the whole time and they didn't eat anything on the trail on the trail uh, so by the time they came back the kid started uh, vomiting and he was tired that so tired that he can't walk and then now uh, he stopped responding uh, that's what the presentation will look like here again, they give you hypoketotic uh, hypoglycemia, uh, but that's how you differentiate between these two. Because if they don't give you any of these, they just give you weakness and hypotonia, but no vomiting, then it's going to be this one. Uh, they might even give you that uh, when they did the stains, uh, they found long chain fatty acids in the cytoplasm. Then you know it's uh, not being transported into the mitochondria so it's because of carnitine deficiency okay ketone bodies ketone bodies are let me go to my notes no.
uh, in the liver, fatty acids and amino acids are metabolized to acetoacetate and beta hydroxybutyrate right there uh, to be used in muscle and brain. In prolonged starvation and diabetic ketoacidosis, oxaloacetate is depleted from gluconeogenesis. Uh, right here. Okay, we have 10 minutes, so we can finish this part. Okay, uh, okay. in prolonged starvation and diabetic ketoacidosis, oxaloacetate is depleted for gluconeogenesis. Because why? Uh, in prolonged starvation, uh, what happens is, uh, or prolonged starvation, you get hypoglycemia, right? Uh, but also in diabetic ketoacidosis, you get buildup of sugar in your blood that uh, the body can't use because in diabetic ketoacidosis, why does it happen? It's because of uh, decreased insulin. So when you don't have insulin working for you or it's not effective, that's when you have diabetic ketoacidosis. So when you have that, the body still thinks it's uh, hypoglycemia, right? It doesn't have uh, blood sugar. So what it's going to do? It's going to go into making uh, uh, using fatty acid uh, for energy. But that, when you break down fatty acid, it's called beta oxidation. Uh, so beta oxidation will then, uh, at some point, you'll have a lot of acet acetyl coenzyme. When you have a lot of that from beta oxidation, uh, it's going to inhibit uh, pyruvate dehydrogenase and it's going to activate pyruvate carboxylase to make more oxaloacetate. So when you start doing that, what's going to happen? It's going to go up into the uh, cycle or through the malic shuttle and then make more glucose. It's going to keep making more glucose. So all your oxaloacetate is going to be used up. That's why it says in prolonged starvation and diabetic ketoacidosis, oxaloacetate is depleted for gluconeogenesis. Uh, with chronic alcohol overuse, high NADH state leads to accumulation of oxaloacetate, uh, down-regulated TCA cycle, uh, shunting to it, shunting it to malate. Uh, or you went over that. So you see oxaloacetate here. Uh, you have too much NADH. This is reversible. So when you have too much of this. NAD is not going to make more NADH, so you're going to get reverse of this. NADH instead is going to make more NAD. In the process, it's going to make oxaloacetate into malate, which will go into gluconeogenesis as well. Okay, uh, then you have ketone bodies, uh, acetone, acetoacetate, and beta hydroxybutyrate. So that's your acetone right there, hydroxybutyrate and acetoacetate. All of these are ketone bodies. Uh, they make your breath smell like acetone uh, or fruity odor. They'll give you this. If you if the classic presentation, uh, I mean the presentation has fruity odor in it in the question stem, it's the classic presentation for diabetic ketoacidosis. Listen. Uh, urine tests for ketones and detect uh, can detect acetoacetate but not uh, beta hydroxybutyrate. So they might do urine tests for ketones and even with the fruity order, but it might come negative. Oh. Uh, we're almost done, out of time. Uh, so I'll do that again. Uh, urine test for ketones can detect acetoacetate but not hydroxybutyrate. Uh, that's because, so the question might have that you smell fruity order uh, then they did urine tests, but no ketones were detected. It's because it was trying to detect acetoacetate, but not uh, beta hydroxybutyrate. So they might ask, uh, what would, what does the blood have? So it has this form of uh, ketone. 
RBCs cannot utilize ketone bodies. They strictly use glucose. HMG coenzyme elase from ketone body production. That's right, this one, uh, HMG coenzyme elase. HMG coenzyme reductase is for uh, cholesterol synthesis. For cholesterol synthesis. That's this one right here again. So don't confuse the two. That's in synthesis of cholesterol to make HMG coenzyme into mavalonate. And since I just did that, I'm not going to do this because that's just going to confuse us. This is fed state. Uh, we have adipocytes fasted and we have adipocyte when we are fed. Okay. Uh, we have triglycerides right here. And triglyceride breaks down to make fatty acids, free fatty acids, and glycerol. Uh, we can see that here. Uh, triglyceride breaks down to make glycerol in the presence of glycerol kinase and fatty acid. Uh, you have hormone-sensitive lipase here as well, which is uh, influenced by decreased insulin, increase in epinephrine, and increase in cortisol. So all of these things will activate uh, hormone-sensitive lipase, which will cause breakdown of TGL into glycerol and fatty acid. Fatty acid then goes into the blood uh, as fatty acid uh, binds to albumin to transport and into liver, where fatty acid then goes under beta oxidation to make acetylcholine uh, with by going through ketogenesis, it makes ketone bodies and uh, acetylcholine also goes into a uh, sartric acid cycle. The ketone bodies then go into the blood and then go into the muscle or brain. The glycerol uh, gets transferred by itself into the liver uh, and goes into gluconeogenesis to make glucose. Uh, gluconeogenesis is influenced by glucagon and increase in cortisol as well here. So cortisol is like a stress drug. So when you're stressed, you need energy. It doesn't matter where it comes from. So that's what this is. Free fatty acid and glycerol goes into the blood here. Uh, epinephrine and glucagon both increase and influence. Sorry. Epinephrine and glucagon. Okay. Because there's decreased insulin, that means increased glucagon also influences this, okay. HVAC and P, uh, they both uh, activate protein kinase A. Goes from HSL to HSLP. I'm not sure what HSL is. Okay, uh, in fed state, it's uh, triglyceride comes in, attaches to the adipocyte uh, via LDL, LPL at EPO C2. Uh, then uh, it releases FFA and makes triglyceride. Or glucose comes in, goes through TAP, makes uh, glycerol 3P and makes Triglyceride right there. Uh, insulin activates both of these things. Okay. Metabolic fuel use. Uh, you need to know this. One gram of carb or protein is equal to four uh, kilocalories. Uh, one gram of alcohol is equal to seven kilocalories, and one gram of fatty acid is nine kilocalories. CRB is four letters, so that's four. Alcohol is seven letters, so that's seven. Fatty acid, again, nine letters, so nine calories. Okay. Uh, remember, for protein, it's four as well. Okay. Here, overall performance is this. First, what gets used up is creating. Nope. What gets used up is this stored ATP in the first two seconds of exercise. Then comes the creatine phosphate. And then comes the anaerobic metabolism, uh, metabolism 
and aerobic metabolism at the end. That's the one that's going to sustain it. Uh, fasting and starving. Remember that ATP is the one that gets used up first and the fastest. Uh, fasting and starvation priorities are to supply sufficient glucose to the brain and to the brain and RBCs and to preserve protein. Priorities are to supply sufficient glucose to the brain and RBCs and to preserve protein. So in fed state after a meal, glycolysis, that's breakdown of sugar or glucose and aerobic respiration. Uh, oxygen so it doesn't make lactic acid. Uh, insulin stimulates storage of lipids, proteins and glycogen. And fasting, between meals, hepatic uh, glycogenolysis, uh, hepatic gluconeogenesis, adipose release of FFA, uh, free fatty acid. So all of these things between meals or fasting state is what's going to sustain the body. There was a question about uh, uh, elderly women who fell down. Uh, and they found her three days later, but her blood glucose was normal. Uh, she was alive and the blood glucose was normal. So then the question is, how was the blood glucose maintained? It's because of these things right here. Hepatic uh, glycogenolysis. This is the major cause of that. Hepatic gluconeogenesis. And adipose release of, of free fatty acids is very minor. Glucagon and epinephrine stimulate use of fuel reserves. Starvation, day one to three. Starvation. Starvation days uh, between one and three. So one to three. What happens? Blood glucose levels maintained by hepatic glycogenolysis. Okay, here we go. So it's going to be hepatic glycogenolysis. Adipose release of FFA, muscle and liver, which shift fuel use from glucose to free fatty acids. Uh, hepatic gluconeogenesis from peripheral tissue lactate and alanine. And from adipose tissue glycerol and propanyl coenzyme A from odd chain fatty acids. The only triglycerol component that contributes to gluconeogenesis. The only triglycerol, okay. That's proponeal uh, coenzyme A. Uh, starvation after day three, what happens is adipose stores, ketone bodies become the main source of energy for the brain. After these are depleted, vital protein degradation, uh, degradation accelerates, leading to organ failure and death. Amount of excess stores determines survival time. Okay, so after these are depleted, adipose stores, vital protein degradation accelerates, leading to organ failure and death. So until then, it's these things that are sustaining the body for up to three days. Glycogen reserves depleted after day one. Uh, RBCs lack mitochondria and therefore cannot use ketone bodies. Uh, stored energy is here. Uh, weeks of starvation. So stored energy, carbohydrate is used up right away uh, in a day. Uh, fat is used up by like day six of starvation. And then you have protein that sustain up to like uh, as long as there's fat but as soon as fat is depleted so is protein gonna go downwards as well because as soon as fat is used up protein is gonna get started using up okay so Lipid transport now. 
uh, dietary fat and cholesterol missiles. Uh, that's just fat uh, cells in lumen. They go into intestinal cells. They go into the thoracic duct, uh, subclavian vein. And once it reaches, reaches uh, subclavian vein, it's going to go through. Uh, into the systemic circulation. Okay, uh, and so here at one, chylomicron enters lymphatics. Right, so that's the that's the initiation. Then uh, at two, HDL transfers epoC two and epoE. So epoC two and epoE is very important because without those, you don't get transportation. So, uh, chylomicron has triglyceride and it has ApoB48 on it, which is also important. So remember these markers. Uh, we learned about ApoB48, uh, ApoC2, and ApoE. Uh, these are in HDL. This is why HDL is considered good because they help uh, bring these markers into uh, chylomicrons. So this will attach to the chylomicron via HDL transfers, C2 and FOE. Okay, it's just the stuff. Then you have chylomicron. Uh, third step is chylomicron C 2 activates LPL. So that's lipoprotein lipase right here. That's the receptor for that. Uh, so the C 2 it's the one that attaches to that receptor. So chylomicron FOC2 activates LPL. So for LPL, it's FOC2 that interacts with it. That's important to know. Uh, if this doesn't happen, it's called type one familial dyslipidemia. When this happens, uh, but when it happens, the triglyceride gets taken up and to adipocytes. Uh, then you have triglyceride with just the ApoE and um, B48, which goes and attaches to, uh, ApoE attaches to the liver cells uh, right here. So when it attaches, it goes in and does the stuff and break down and whatever. Uh, cholesterol plus triglycerides then, when needed, leave the liver cell for liver releases VLDL. So it releases as some VLDL. How do you know it's a VLDL? It's going to have B, ApoB100 on it. That is important as well, ApoB100. So overproduction of VLDL is in type or familial dyslipidemia. Okay, so the fourth step happens in type four. Uh, then you have uh, number five right here. When uh, BLDL and HDL combine, uh, it's gonna make, uh, it's gonna have actually the receptors, ApoC2 and ApoE along with B100. Uh, the ApoC2 will then attach to the adipocyte and do its thing again. VLDL ApoC2 activates uh, LPL here too. Just like number three, C2 activated LPL over there with the chylomicron, but this one is VLDL. Uh, once it's released, it goes on uh, as IDL or intermediate. Uh, Six. So IDL, yeah, IDL, intermediate density lipoprotein, uh, delivers triglyceride and cholesterol to the liver via ApoE. Goes in to put in the ApoE through this. Hepatic lipase, uh, hepatic lipase, with the help of that. Uh, the again. Hepatocyte releases 
but this time it's not going to have triglycerides. Mostly it's going to be contained. Uh, what it's going to contain is cholesterol. Right. So then with what happens is the cholesterol is taken up by peripheral cells. Endocytosis of LDL. So that's what it is. And this marker is still on it, the B100. To be taken up into the peripheral cells or adipo. Yeah, peripheral cells. Okay, so endocytosis of LDL. And this is impaired in type 2 familial dyslipidemia. Okay, let's take a look. Uh, ApoE is required to go into the cell, uh, into the hepatocyte. ApoE uh, on HDL. Again here, ApoE is the one that gets attached to the hepatocyte. So every time the cell goes into this, uh, I mean the chylomicron goes into the cell, it uses ApoE. Uh, apoprotein C2 is always used for lipoprotein lipase. So LPL is always going to be attached to ApoC2. Uh, whenever something gets released by hepatocyte, all the markers are going to have, like all the triglyceride or cholesterol or chylomicron, whatever, is going to have a B100 whenever it gets released from hepatocyte. So if something has B100 on it, it's been released by hepatocyte. If it doesn't have B100, it's not been released by hepatocyte. Uh, if it doesn't have B100, it's going to have B48. B48 is something that hasn't gone to the liver yet. Okay, I think that about covers it. Okay. Uh, key enzymes in lipid transport. Uh, cholesterol ester transfer protein. What does it do? It mediates transfer of cholesterol esters to other lipoprotein particles. So that's your... C2, I guess. Uh, hepatic lipase, it degrades uh, triglycerides remaining in IDL and chylomicron remnants. Hepatic lipase, that's this thing right here. Uh, hormone sensitive lipase, uh, that's from the previous photo that I showed you. I'll show you that again. So the breakdown on TGL has glycerol fatty acid in adipose tissue. So you have hormone sensitive lipase right there. Hormone sensitive lipase degrades uh, triglycerides stored in adipose tissue. Adipocytes uh, promotes gluconeogenesis right here by releasing glycerol. Uh, Lysine cholesterol acetyl acyl transferase. It catalyzes esterification of 2 by 3 of plasma cholesterol that is required for HDL maturation. Listen, I don't think they mentioned that here. Uh, but remember that listen and cholesterol SL transferase. Okay, lipoprotein lipase. Degrades uh, triglycerides and circulating chylomicrons and VLDL, or you know about that one. The lipoprotein like is here for VLDL and here for chylomicrons. Okay, uh, then we have pancreatic lipase. Uh, this is, we're going to do this in uh, GAT. Uh, degrades dietary triglycerides in small intestine. And you have P uh, PCSK9. It degrades LDL receptor, so it increases serum LDL. So, if something increases serum LDL, that's not good. So, if you want to decrease it, you gotta prevent something from. You gotta prevent degrading of LDL receptors, right? So that's what one of the drugs does. It's gonna stop the degradation or recycling of LDL receptors. So 
uh, the LDL can get picked up from the serum. Inhibition of this will increase LDL receptor recycling and decrease serum molecule. There you go, that's what I mean. Um, liver, intestine, uh, nascent, uh, HDL, Hellcat, uh, that's lysine, carnit, what was it? Lysine cholesterol SR transferase makes a uh, mature HDL which will go into liver again, or CETP, that's your cholesterol ester transfer protein. Transfer cholesterol ester to cholesterol esters to VLDL, LDL, and LDL. You need cholesterol esters to transfer cholesterol. Okay. Um, major epilipoprotein is Okay, so we're going to go over apolipoprotein functions, chyla, and its presence in chylomicron, chylomicron remnants, VLDL, LDL, LDL, and HDL. Let's get this photo down here. So epilipoprotein E, it mediates remnant uptake, everything except for LDL. Okay, so everything except for LDL will have uh, E. So that's epilipoprotein E, right? So every time it's been uptaken, it has E. That's FOB, that's, uh, that's FOE, okay. So that's FOE right there. So everything except for LDL. So only LDL doesn't have it. IDL has it, VLDL has it, chylomicron has it, right? So chylomicron has, so anything that HDL has combined with except for LDL, basically. So HDL combines with chylomicron, it combines with VLDL, IDL, and HDL itself has it, right? That's the one that gives it. So what about apoprotein A1? Found only on alpha lipoprotein like HDL. It activates LCAT. So that's this listin cholesterol acyl transferase. It's on HDL. But since it's only on that, they didn't mention it in here. Uh, C2, lipoprotein lipase cofactor that catalyzes cleavage, right? C2 is for lipoprotein lipase right here. That's the one that attaches to that. Uh, chylomicron has it. Again, this is the same thing. Whatever uh, HDL combines with will have it. So it combines with chylomicron, it combines with VLDL, it combines with IDL just not LDL, and HDL itself has it. Chylomicron remnant uh, won't have it. It's because chylomicron gets broken down here because of C2, so that's its function. Uh, B48, it mediates chylomicron secretion into lymphatics. Its function is to, you know, travel through the lymphatics, basically. So you'll see it up to here, B, FOB48 and until it gets picked up by hepatocytes. So only chylomicron has it. None of the other cells, are, uh, other lipoproteins have it. Or, I mean, chylomicron or triglycerides, VLDL. Lipoprotein, yeah. Okay, so medius chylomicron secretion into lymphatics only on particles originating from the intestine. So you'll see it in chylomicrons and chylomicron remnants. Uh, B100, 
It binds LDL receptor only on particles originating from the liver. I hope I live to be 100. Okay, so binds LDL receptors, receptor, the B100. So B100, like I said, everything that comes out of liver will have B100 on it. Uh, and eventually, it, when it becomes what okay so ldl won't have anything else other than just this so that's what it's useful for um uh, b100 is what gets picked up by peripheral cells like that's what attaches its receptors to the ldl receptor okay but its presence in everything uh, from ldl to idl to vldl hdl doesn't have it clearly so you have BLDL, IDL, LDL have B100. Okay. So now, I don't know if we need this or not. Let's do that here. Uh, lipoprotein functions, lipoprotein. Uh, lipoproteins are composed of varying proportions of proteins cholesterol, triglycerides, and phospholipids. LDL and HDL carry the most cholesterol. Cholesterol is needed to maintain cell membrane integrity and synthesis, synthesize bile acids, steroids, and vitamin D. So you need that. You need bile acid, you need steroids, and you need vitamin D. So cholesterol is very important for that. They are composed of varying proportion of proteins, cholesterol, triglycerides and phospholipids. LDN and HDL carry the most. Chylomicron uh, delivers dietary uh, triglycerides to peripheral tissues. You know that from here? Chylomicron right there, triglyceride. So delivers dietary triglycerides to peripheral tissue, delivers cholesterol to liver in the form of chylomicron remnants which are mostly depleted of their triglycerides secreted by intestinal epithelial cells. VLDL delivers hepatic triglycerides to peripheral tissue secreted by liver. IDL delivers triglycerides and uh, cholesterol to liver form for degradation of VLDL. LDL delivers hepatic cholesterol to peripheral tissues formed by hepatic lipase modification of IDL in the liver and peripheral tissue taken up by target cells via receptor mediated endocytosis. LDL is lethal. Just know that LDL is lethal and HDL is healthy. Uh, they don't really test you on this stuff. What they'll test you is um, this and mostly this familial dyslipidemias mediates uh, hdl mediates rivers cholesterol transport from peripheral tissue to liver that's why it's good it takes it out of the system into the liver acts as a repository for epo c and epo e which are needed for chylomicron and vldl metabolism secreted from both liver and intestine. Alcohol increases synthesis of HDL is healthy. That's why they say maybe one glass of wine is good for you. This is where it comes from. Uh, a beta lipoproteinemia. Uh, this is important. They might just straight out give you this diagram and ask you what's wrong with it. And you might think it's gonna be something with like celiac sprue or something like that rotavirus something to do with GI tract but if you see these uh, holes in any part of the organs it's usually going to be fat so when you have fat accumulated like this it only happens in this condition a beat up lipoproteinemia why autosomal recessive mutation in gene that encodes microsomal Microsomal uh, transfer protein or MTP, chylomicron, VLDL, IDL, LDL, absent. So you have absence of all of these. 
there's deficiency in Apple B48 and Apple 100. You need Apple 100 for LDL and you need B48 for chylomicrons. Uh, okay, so containing lipoproteins. So whichever one, so then VLDL would have B100 too. Uh, affected infants present with severe fat malabsorption, uh, steteria, and failure to thrive. This is similar to uh, pancreatic disease or even uh, celiac disease because they both have, give off uh, fat malabsorption and steteria. But in pancreatic disease, you're going to have uh, a colic stool or gray colored school stool uh, and celiac they will give you uh, other stuff as well for epilipoproteinemia they're going to give you straight out this this diagram and then you have to figure it out from that it's pretty easy once you know how to read it so this is like the fresh border and this is the fat in it so the fat is not able to get transported into the system so it's being accumulated inside right here because there's a deficiency of b uh, 48 so b 48 is the one that is required to transport uh, the fat from intestine through to the thoracic duct into the subclavian vein into the system right and get picked up by hepatocyte eventually so that's what you need B48 for that. But since it doesn't have it, it just keeps on building up at the brush border of intestine. Later manifestations include retinitis, pigmentosa, spinocerebellar degeneration due to vitamin E deficiency, progressive ataxia, acanthocytosis. Intestinal biopsy shows lipid laying uh, enterocytes. Treatment is restriction of long chain fatty acids and larger dose of oral vitamin E to prevent spinocerebellar uh, degeneration. Spinocerebellar, so that's the way you, even if you don't know, you know it's something that's uh, connecting spinal cord or spine to cerebellum. Uh, sorry, cerebellum, yeah. So that tract is being degenerated due to vitamin E deficiency. Because of that, uh, you get neurologic, uh, neurologic symptoms, and that's why you might confuse that with uh, vitamin B12 deficiency or folic deficiency. So you had to differentiate between the three when it's given. This one doesn't have PMNs. It doesn't have uh, megaloblastic anemia. It has microcytic or hemolytic anemia, this one. And yeah, so that's how you differentiate that. Uh, familial dyslipidemias. Actually, let me just go over that. So. So you have vitamin E right here. It's a uh, decrease in bile deficiency, right? Uh, you don't have hypersegmented PMNs. Uh, you do have neurologic symptoms like vitamin B12 as well, but you don't have megaloblastic anemia. You have hemolytic anemia here. Uh, you don't have homocysteine buildup. There is an increase of homocysteine in B12 and folate though. And methylmelanoic acid, you have a bit of that in B12, but not uh, folate deficiency. So out of all of this, for vitamin E, you just have the neurologic symptoms. Why you might think there's deficiency with this is because there's fat malabsorption. So you might think since there's malabsorption, there might be deficiency of vitamin E. Because uh, fat malabsorption Oh, sorry. Uh, when... Oh, never mind. Yeah, you would get it from here, fat malabsorption. So fat malabsorption 
you'll have reduced uh, vitamin A, D, E, and K. So those are your fat soluble ones. So if you don't have that, you're gonna have deficiency of vitamin A, D, E, and K. That's how you get it. Familiar dyslipidemias, uh, type one, two, three, and four. There are four types. There is a fifth type, but uh, they don't ask about it, so it's not written here. Hyperchylomicronemia, hyperchylomicronemia. Inheritance is AR. Pathogenesis is lipoprotein lipase and EPO-C deficiency. Okay, so you need EPO-C for it to interact with lipoprotein lipase. So if you don't have this or this, you have type 1 hyperchylomicronemia because now you're going to have buildup of chylomicrons because they can't get uh, cleaved by lipoprotein lipase. Uh, blood level will have increased chylomicrons. Chylomicrons have triglycerides and cholesterols. Uh, there will be build up of cholesterol as well. Uh, clinical, you're going to get pancreatitis. You get pancreatitis in this. You get hematosplenomegaly and eruptive pruritic xanthomas. No increased risk of atherosclerosis. Creamy layer is supernatant. So if there's a uh, blood or you pull blood from someone who has this uh, you'll the top layer will be creamy and if it's creamy then you know they have a lot of cholesterol or triglycerides uh, it's because they're suffering from type 1 hyperchylomicronemia uh, they might give you this in the presentation itself because uh, xanthomas are kept for this one right here these two uh, they use that for those two. Uh, so type two hypercholesteremia, cholesterol. Okay, that's a different word. Cholesterolemia, cholesterolemia. Okay. Eighty. Sorry. We're almost done, and I'm zoning out. <laughs> okay, pathogenesis absent or defective LDL receptors or defective ApoB one hundred. Okay, so you have absent or defective LDL receptors. That's this thing right here. Or defective ApoB100. You need ApoB100 to interact with LDL receptors. So either of those two, just like these two, uh, if there's a problem there, you're gonna have buildup of LDL, right? So um, blood type, there's two types, 2A and 2B. 2A, LDL and cholesterol, because Cholesterol is carried by HDL and LDL, so you have buildup of cholesterol and LDL in type A. In type B, LDL and cholesterol is there, but now you have VLDL too. There's a buildup of VLDL as well. Uh, clinical heterozygotes, uh, 1 in 500, have cholesterol more than 300 milligrams per deciliter. Homozygotes is very rare, but they have cholesterol more, which is more than seven hundred milligram per deciliter. Accelerated atherosclerosis uh, may have MI even before age twenty. Uh, if they have MI at age twenty, someone has heart problem or they're going into cardiac shock or something, you might think it's this, or you might think it's uh, what hypertrophy cardiomyopathy. Tendon Achilles Centoma, they'll give you this. And Corneal Arcus, they'll give you one of these two if they give you MI. And then you can diagnose that it's hypercholesteremia. So then they're going to ask you what it, would you find or what is the deficiency about. It could be either of those things. Uh, type 3, dis beta lipoproteinemia. Okay, so this is autosomal recessive, so it's ARAD, ARAD. Okay. Uh, 
this beta lipoproteinemia is ApoE deficiency and defect in type 3. ApoE is coming from HDL and it's required for uh, everything to get picked up by uh, hepatocytes. So it's going to interact with hepatocyte receptors for ApoE. Okay. Uh, it's found in everything almost that this thing gives out or not everything it's only found on chylomicron and hdo right so and okay yeah so you're gonna have it on vldo ido as well okay but if you have this and it doesn't get you know picked up then you're not gonna have a deal at all so you have Increase amounts of VLDL and chylomicrons. Okay. Premature atherosclerosis, tuberoeruptive, and palmar xanthomas. Here you had it in tendons and uh, buildup of stuff in your eye, but here you have it on your palms. So if you have it on your palms, then you know it's this beta lipoproteinemia. Oh. Palms P lipoproteinemia has two P's in it. Pump. So premature atherosclerosis in this as well, though. Uh, then you have type four hypertriglyceridemia, uh, AD, hepatic overproduction of VLDL, VLDL uh, triglyceride, hypertriglyceridemia, more than one thousand milligram per deciliter can cause acute pancreatitis related to insulin resistance. Hypertriglyceridemia, uh, glyceridemia, uh, more than 1,000 milligram per deciliter. That's a lot. It can cause acute pancreatitis. If you have high glycerides, triglycerides in your blood, uh, this is known to cause acute pancreatitis. So yeah, lower your TG. Related, it's related to insulin resistance. So you're type two one, uh, type two. That's it. You're done.